Memoirs of service afloat during their war between the states by Admiral Raphael Semmes of the late Confederate States Navy, author of Service Afloat and Ashore, during the Mexican War. Illustrated with steel engraved portraits and six engravings from original designs printed in chromo tints. To the memory of those sailors and soldiers of the southern states, WHO lost their lives in the war between the states in defense of the liberties which had been bequeathed to them by their fathers. This volume is respectfully and affectionately inscribed by the author. Preface A number of publications have appeared, first and last, concerning the author and his career, as was naturally to have been expected. The Alabama was the first steamship in the history of the world, the defective little Sumter accepted that was let loose against the commerce of a great commercial people. The destruction which she caused was enormous. She not only alarmed the enemy, but she alarmed all the other nations of the earth which had commerce afloat, as they could not be sure that a similar scourge, at some future time, might not be let loose against themselves. The Alabama, in consequence, became famous. It was the fame of steam. As a matter of course, she attracted the attention of the bookmakers, those cormorants ever on the lookout for a speculation. A number of ambitious literators entered the seductive field. But it was easier, as they soon found, to enter the field than to explore it, and these penny aligners all made miserable failures, comma, not even excepting the London house of Saunders, Otley and Co., to whom the author was induced to loan his journals, in the hope that something worthy of his career might be produced. To those who have chanced to see the log of the Sumter and Alabama, produced by that house, it will be unnecessary to say that the author had no hand in its preparation. He did not write a line for it, nor had he any interest whatever in the sale of it, as the loan of his journals had been entirely gratuitous. So far as his own career was concerned, the author would gladly have devolved the labor of the historian on other shoulders, if this had been possible. But it did not seem to be possible, after the experiments that had been made. With all the facilities afforded the London House referred to, a meagre and barren record was the result. The cause is sufficiently obvious. The cruise of a ship is a biography. The ship becomes a personification. She not only walks the waters like a thing of life, but she speaks in moving accents to those capable of interpreting her but her interpreter must be a seaman, and not a landsman. He must not only be a seaman, he must have made the identical cruise which he undertakes to describe. It will be seen, hence, that the career of the author was a sealed book to all but himself. A landsman could not even interpret his journals, written frequently in the hieroglyphics of the sea. A line, or a bear mark made by himself which to other eyes would be meaningless would for him be fraught with the inspiration of whole pages. Besides, the Alabama had an inside as well as an outside life. She was a microcosm. If it required a seaman to interpret her as to her outside life, much more did it require one to give an intelligible view of the little world that she carried in her bosom. No one but an eyewitness, and that witness himself a sailor could unveil to an outside world the domestic mysteries of the everyday life of Jack, and portray him in his natural colors, as he worked and as he played. The following pages may, therefore, be said to be the first attempt to give anything like a truthful picture of the career of the author upon the high seas, during the late war, to the public. In their preparation the writer has discarded the didactic style of the historian, and adopted that of memoir writing as better suited to his subject. This style gave him more latitude in the description of persons and events, and relieved him from some of the fetters of a mere writer of history. There are portions of the work, however, purely historical, and these have been treated with the gravity and dignity which became them. In short, the author has aimed to produce what the title of his book imports, an historical memoir of his services afloat during the war.
that his book will be generally read by the northern people he does not suppose. They are scarcely in a temper yet to read anything he might write. The wounds which he has inflicted upon them are too recent. Besides, men do not willingly read unpalatable truths of themselves. The people of America being sovereign, they are like other sovereigns, comma, they like those best who fool them most, by pandering to their vices and flattering their foibles. The author, not being a flatterer, cannot expect to be much of a favorite at the court of the demos. A word now as to the feeling with which the author has written. It has sometimes been said that a writer of history should be as phlegmatic and unimpassioned as the judge upon the bench. If the reader desires a dead history, in other words, a history devoid of the true spirit of history, the author assents to the remark. But if he desires a living, moving, breathing picture of events, a person am instead of a subject am, the picture must not be undertaken by one who does not feel something of that which he writes. Such a terrible war as that through which we have passed could not be comprehended by a stolid, phlegmatic writer, whose pulse did not beat quicker while he wrote. When all the higher and holier passions of the human heart are aroused in a struggle, when the barbarian is at your door with the torch of the incendiary in one hand, and the uplifted sword of diabolical revenge in the other comma feeling is an important element in the real drama that is passing before the eyes of the beholder. To attempt to describe such a drama with the cold words of philosophy, is simply ridiculous. If the acts be not described in words suited to portray their infamy, you have a lie instead of history. Nor does it follow that feeling necessarily overrides judgment. All passions blind us if we give free rein to them, but when they are held in check, they sharpen, instead of obscuring the intellect. In a well-balanced mind, feeling and judgment aid each other, and he will prove the most successful historian who has the two in a just equipoise. But though the author has given vent occasionally to a just indignation, he has not written in malice. He does not know the meaning of the word. He has simply written as a southern man might be supposed to think and feel, treading upon the toes of his enemies as tenderly as possible. If he has been occasionally plain spoken, it is because he has used the English language, which calls a rogue a rogue, notwithstanding his disguises. When the author has spoken of the Yankee and his grand moral ideas, he has spoken rather of a well-known type than of individual men. If the reader will bear these remarks in mind as he goes along, he will find them a key to some of the passages in the book. In describing natural phenomena, the author has ventured upon some new suggestions. He submits these with great diffidence. Meteorology is yet a new science, and many developments of principles remain to be made. Anchorage, near Mobile, Alabama. December, 1868. Chapter 1. A Brief Historical Retrospect. The disruption of the American Union by the War of 1861 was not an unforeseen event. Patrick Henry, and other patriots who struggled against the adoption of the federal constitution by the southern states, foretold it in burning words of prophecy, and when that instrument was adopted, when the great name and great eloquence of James Madison had borne down all opposition, Henry and his compatriots seemed particularly anxious that posterity should be informed of the manly struggle which they had made. Henry said, The voice of tradition, I trust, will inform posterity of our struggles for freedom. If our descendants be worthy of the name of Americans, they will preserve, and hand down to the latest posterity, the transactions of the present times, and though I confess my explanations are not worth the hearing, they will see I have done my utmost to preserve their liberty. The wish of these patriotic men has been gratified. The record of their noble deeds, and all but inspired eloquence, has come down to posterity, and some, at least, of their descendants, worthy of the name of Americans, will accord to them the foremost rank in the long list of patriots and sages who illustrated and adorned our early annals. But posterity, too, has a history to record and hand down. We, too, have struggled to preserve our liberties, and the liberties of those who are to come after us, and the history of that struggle must not perish. The one struggle is but the complement of the other, and history would be incomplete if either were omitted. 
events have vindicated the wisdom of Henry, and those who struggled with him against the adoption of the federal constitution. Events will equally vindicate the wisdom of Jefferson Davis, and other Confederate patriots, who endeavored to preserve that constitution, and hand it down, unimpaired, to their posterity. The wisdom of a movement is not always to be judged by its success. Principles are eternal, human events are transitory, and it sometimes takes more than one generation or one revolution to establish a principle. At first sight, it may appear that there is some discordance between Patrick Henry and Jefferson Davis, as the one struggled against the adoption of the Constitution, and the other to preserve it. But they were, in fact, both engaged in a similar struggle, the object of both being to preserve the sovereignty of their respective states. Henry did not object so much to the nature of the partnership, into which his state was about to enter, as to the nature of the partners with whom she was about to contract. He saw that the two sections were dissimilar, and that they had different and antagonistic interests, and he was unwilling to trust to the bona fides of the other contracting party. I am sure, said he, that the dangers of this system are real, when those who have no similar interests with the people of this country are to legislate for us, when our dearest interests are to be left in the hands of those whose advantage it will be to infringe them. The North, even at that early day, was in a majority in both houses of Congress, it would be for the advantage of that majority to infringe the rights of the South, and Henry, with much more knowledge of human nature than most of the southern statesmen of his era, refused to trust that majority. This was substantially the case with Jefferson Davis and those of us who followed his lead. We had verified the distrust of Henry. What had been prophecy with him, had become history with us. We had had experience of the fact, that our partner states of the North, who were in the majority, had trampled upon the rights of the southern minority and we desired, as the only remedy, to dissolve the partnership into which Henry had objected to entering, not so much because of any defect in the articles of co-partnership, as a for want of faith in our co-partners. This was the wisdom of Jefferson Davis and his compatriots, which, I say, will be vindicated by events. A final separation of these states must come, or the South will be permanently enslaved. We endeavored to bring about the separation, and we sacrificed our fortunes, and risked our lives to accomplish it. Like Patrick Henry, we have done our utmost to preserve our liberties, like him, we have failed, and like him, we desire that our record shall go down to such of our posterity as may be worthy of the name of Americans. The following memoirs are designed to commemorate a few of the less important events of our late struggle, but before I enter upon them, I deem it appropriate to give some reason for the faith that was in us, of the South, who undertook the struggle. The judgment which posterity will form upon our actions will depend, mainly, upon the answers which we may be able to give to two questions, first, had the South the right to dissolve the compact of government under which it had lived with the North? And, secondly, was there sufficient reason for such dissolution? I do not speak here of the right of revolution this is inherent in all peoples, whatever may be their form of government. The very term revolution implies a forcible disruption of government, war, and all the evils that follow in the drain of war. The thirteen original colonies, the germ from which have sprung these states, exercised the right of revolution when they withdrew their allegiance from the parent country. Not so with the southern states when they withdrew from their co-partnership with the northern states they exercised a higher right. They did not form a part of a consolidated government, as the colonies did of the British government. They were sovereign, equally with the northern states, from which they withdrew, and exercised, as they believed, a peaceful right, instead of a right of revolution. Had, then, the southern states the peaceful right to dissolve the compact of government under which they had lived with the North, a volume might be written in reply to this question, but I shall merely glance at it in these memoirs, referring the student to the history of the formation of the old Confederacy, prior to the adoption of the Constitution of the United States, to the journal and debates of the Convention of 1787, 
that formed this latter instrument, to the debates of the several state conventions which adopted it, to the Madison Papers, to the Federalist, and to the late very able work of Dr. Bledso, entitled Is Davis a Traitor? It will be sufficient for the purpose which I have in view, that of giving the reader a general outline of the course of reasoning, by which southern men justify their conduct in the late war, to state the leading features of the compact of government which was dissolved, and a few of its historical surroundings, about which there can be no dispute. The close of the War of Independence of 1776 found the thirteen original colonies, which had waged that war, sovereign and independent states. They had, for the purpose of carrying on that war, formed a league, or confederation, and the articles of this league were still obligatory upon them. Under these articles, a federal government had been established, charged with a few specific powers, such as conducting the foreign affairs of the Confederacy, the regulation of commerce, and c. At the formation of this government, it was intended that it should be perpetual, and was so declared. It lasted, notwithstanding, only a few years, for peace was declared in 1783, and the perpetual government ceased to exist in 1789. How did it cease to exist? By the secession of the states. Soon after the war, a convention of delegates met at Annapolis, in Maryland, sent thither by the several states, for the purpose of devising some more perfect means of regulating commerce. This was all the duty with which they were charged. Upon assembling, it was found that several of the states were not represented in this convention, in consequence of which, the convention adjourned without transacting any business, and recommended, in an address prepared by Alexander Hamilton, that a new convention should be called at Philadelphia, with enlarged powers. The convention, says Hamilton, are more naturally led to this conclusion, as in their reflections on the subject, they have been induced to think, that the power of regulating trade is of such comprehensive extent and will enter so far into the great system of the federal government, that to give it efficacy, and to obviate questions and doubts concerning its precise nature and limits, may require a corresponding adjustment in other parts of the federal system. That these are important defects in the system of the federal government is acknowledged by the acts of those states, which have concurred in the present meeting. That the defects upon closer examination, may be found greater and more numerous than even these acts imply, is at least, so far probable, from the embarrassments which characterize the present state of our national affairs, foreign and domestic, as may reasonably be supposed to merit a deliberate and candid discussion, in some mode which will unite the sentiments and counsels of all the states. The reader will observe that the government of the states, under the Articles of Confederation, is called a federal government, and that the object proposed to be accomplished by the meeting of the new convention at Philadelphia, was to amend the constitution of that government. Northern writers have sought to draw a distinction between the government formed under the Articles of Confederation, and that formed by the Constitution of the United States, calling the one a league, and the other a government. Here we see Alexander Hamilton calling the Confederation a government, a federal government, it was, indeed, both a league and a government, as it was formed by sovereign states, just as the government of the United States is both a league and a government, for the same reason. The fact that the laws of the Confederation, passed in pursuance of its league, or constitution, were to operate upon the states, and the laws of the United States were to operate upon the individual citizens of the states, without the intervention of state authority could make no difference. This did not make the latter more a government than the former. The difference was a mere matter of detail, a mere matter of machinery, nothing more. It did not imply more or less absolute sovereignty in the one case, than in the other. Whatever of sovereignty had been granted, had been granted by the states, in both instances. The new convention met in Philadelphia, on the 14th of May, 1787 with instructions to devise and discuss all such alterations, and further provisions as may be necessary to render the federal constitution adequate to the exigencies of the Union. We see, thus, 
that the very convention which framed the Constitution of the United States, equally called the Articles of Confederation a Constitution. It was, then, from a constitutional, federal government, that the states seceded when they adopted the present Constitution of the United States. A convention of the states assembled with powers only to amend the Constitution, instead of doing which, it abolished the old form of government altogether, and recommended a new one, and no one complained. As each state formally and deliberately adopted the new government, it has formally and deliberately seceded from the old one, and yet no one heard any talk of a breach of faith, and still less of treason. The new government was to go into operation when nine states should adopt it. But there were thirteen states, and if nine states only acceded to the new government, the old one would be broken up, as to the other four states, whether these would or not, and they would be left to provide for themselves. It was by no means the voluntary breaking up of a compact, by all the parties to it. It was broken up piecemeal, each state acting for itself, without asking the consent of the others, precisely as the southern states acted, with a view to the formation of a new southern confederacy. So far from the movement being unanimous, it was a long time before all the states came into the new government. Rhode Island, one of the northern states, which handed on the war against the southern states, retained her separate sovereignty for two years before she joined the new government, not uttering one word of complaint during all that time, that the old government, of which she had been a member, had been unduly broken up, and that she had been left to shift for herself. Why was this disruption of the old government regarded as a matter of course? Simply because it was a league, or treaty, between sovereign states, from which any one of the states had the right to withdraw at any time, without consulting the interest or advantage of the others. But, say the northern states, the Constitution of the United States is a very different thing from the Articles of Confederation. It was formed, not by the states, but by the people of the United States in the aggregate, and made all the states one people, one government. It is not a compact, or league between the states, but an instrument under which they have surrendered irrevocably their sovereignty. Under it, the federal government has become the paramount authority, and the states are subordinate to it. We will examine this doctrine, briefly, in another chapter. Chapter 2 The Nature of the American Compact The two principal expounders of the Constitution of the United States, in the North, have been Daniel Webster and Joseph Story, both from Massachusetts. Webster was, for a long time, a senator in Congress, and Story a justice of the Supreme Court of the United States. The latter has written an elaborate work on the Constitution, full of sophistry, and not always very reliable as to its facts. The great effort of both these men has been to prove, that the Constitution is not a compact between the states, but an instrument of government, formed by the people of the United States, as contradistinguished from the states. They both admit, that if the Constitution were a compact between the states, the states would have a right to withdraw from the compact, all agreements between states, in their sovereign capacity, being, necessarily, of no more binding force than treaties. These gentlemen are not always very consistent, for they frequently fall into the error of calling the Constitution a compact, when they are not arguing this particular question, in short, it is, and it is not a compact, by turns according to the use they intend to make of the argument. Mr. Webster's doctrine of the Constitution, chiefly relied on by northern men, is to be found in his speech of 1833, in reply to Mr. Calhoun. It is in that speech that he makes the admission, that if the Constitution of the United States is a compact between the states, the states have the right to withdraw from it at pleasure. He says, if a league between sovereign powers have no limitation as to the time of duration, and contains nothing making it perpetual, it subsists only during the good pleasure of the parties, although no violation be complained of. If in the opinion of either party it be violated, such party may say he will no longer fulfill its obligations, on his part, but will consider the whole league or compact as at an end, 
although it might be one of its stipulations that it should be perpetual. In his commentaries on the Constitution, Mr. Justice Story says, the obvious deductions which may be, and indeed have been drawn, from considering the Constitution a compact between states, are, that it operates as a mere treaty, or convention between them, and has an obligatory force no longer than suits their pleasure, or their consent continues. The plain principles of public law, thus announced by these distinguished jurists, cannot be controverted. If sovereign states make a compact, although the object of the compact be the formation of a new government for their common benefit, they have the right to withdraw from that compact at pleasure, even though, in the words of Mr. Webster, it might be one of its stipulations that it should be perpetual. There might, undoubtedly, be such a thing as state merger, that is, that two states, for instance, might agree that the sovereign existence of one of them should be merged in the other. In which case, the state parting with its sovereignty could never reclaim it by peaceable means. But where a state shows no intention of parting with its sovereignty, and, in connection with other states, all equally jealous of their sovereignty with herself, only delegates a part of it, never so large a part, if you please, to a common agent, for the benefit of the whole, there can have been no merger. This was eminently the case with regard to these United States. No one can read the journal and debates of the Philadelphia Convention, or those of the several state conventions to which the Constitution was submitted for adoption, without being struck with the scrupulous care with which all the states guarded their sovereignty. The northern states were quite as jealous, in this respect, as the southern states. Next to Massachusetts, New Hampshire has been, perhaps, the most fanatical and bitter of the former states, in the prosecution of the late war against the South. That state, in her constitution, adopted in 1792, three years after the federal constitution went into operation, inserted the following provision, among others, in her declaration of principles, the people of this commonwealth have the sole and exclusive right of governing themselves as a free, sovereign, and independent state, and do, and forever hereafter shall exercise and enjoy every power, jurisdiction, and right which is not, or may not hereafter be, by them, expressly delegated to the United States. Although it was quite clear that the states, when they adopted the Constitution of the United States, reserved, by implication, all the sovereign power, rights, and privileges that had not been granted away, as a power not given is necessarily withheld, yet so jealous were they of the new government they were forming, that several of them insisted, in their acts of ratification, that the constitution should be so amended as explicitly to declare this truth, and thus put it beyond cavil in the future. Massachusetts expressed herself as follows, in connection with her ratification of the constitution, as it is the opinion of this convention that certain amendments and alterations in said constitution would remove the fears, and quiet the apprehensions of the good people of the commonwealth, and more effectually guard against an undue administration of the federal government, the convention do, therefore, recommend that the following alteration and provisions be introduced in said constitution, first, that it be explicitly declared that all powers not delegated by the aforesaid constitution are reserved to the several states, to be by them exercised. Webster and Story had not yet arisen in Massachusetts, to teach the new doctrine that the constitution had been formed by the people of the United States, in contradistinction to the people of the states. Massachusetts did not speak in the name of any such people, but in her own name. She was not jealous of the remaining people of the United States, as fractional parts of a whole, of which she was herself a fraction, but she was jealous of them as states, as so many foreign peoples, with whom she was contracting. The powers not delegated were to be reserved to those delegating them, to wit, the several states, that is to say, to each and every one of the states. Virginia fought long and sturdily against adopting the Constitution at all. Henry, Mason, Tyler, and a host of other giants raised their powerful voices against it, warning their people, in thunder tones, that they were rushing upon destruction. 
Tyler even went so far as to say that British tyranny would have been more tolerable. So distasteful to her was the foul embrace that was tendered her, that she not only recommended an amendment of the Constitution, similar to that which was recommended by Massachusetts, making explicit reservation of her sovereignty, but she annexed a condition to her ratification, to the effect that she retained the right to withdraw the powers which she had granted, whenever the same shall be perverted to her injury or oppression. North Carolina urged the following amendment, the same, substantially, as that urged by Virginia and Massachusetts, that each state in the Union shall respectively, not aggregately, retain every power, jurisdiction, and right which is not by this Constitution delegated to the Congress of the United States, or to the departments of the federal government. Pennsylvania guarded her sovereignty by insisting upon the following amendment, all the rights of sovereignty which are not, by the said Constitution, expressly and plainly vested in the Congress, shall be deemed to remain with, and shall be exercised by the several states in the Union. The result of this jealousy on the part of the states was the adoption of the Tenth Amendment to the Constitution of the United States as follows. The powers not delegated to the United States, by the Constitution, nor prohibited by it to the states, are reserved to the states, or to the people. It is thus clear beyond doubt, that the states not only had no intention of merging their sovereignty in the new government they were forming, but that they took special pains to notify each other, as well as their common agent, of the fact. The language which I have quoted, as used by the states, in urging the amendments to the Constitution proposed by them, was the common language of that day. The new government was a federal or confederate government, in the Federalist, it is frequently called a confederation which had been created by the states for their common use and benefit, each state taking special pains, as we have seen, to declare that it retained all the sovereignty which it had not expressly granted away. And yet, in face of these facts, the doctrine has been boldly declared, in our day, that the Constitution was formed by the people of the United States in the aggregate, as one nation, and that it has a force and vitality independent of the states, which the states are incompetent to destroy. The perversion is one not so much of doctrine as of history. It is an issue of fact which we are to try. It is admitted, that if the fact be as stated by our northern brethren, the conclusion follows, it is, indeed, quite plain, that if the states did not create the federal constitution, they cannot destroy it. But it is admitted, on the other hand, by both Webster and Story, as we have seen, that if they did create it, they may destroy it, nay, that any one of them may destroy it as to herself, that is, may withdraw from the compact at pleasure, with or without reason. It is fortunate for us of the South that the issue is so plain, as that it may be tried by the record. Sophistry will sometimes overly reason and blind men's judgment for generations, but sophistry, with all its ingenuity, cannot hide a fact. The speeches of Webster and the commentaries of Story have been unable to hide the fact of which I speak, it stands emblazoned on every page of our constitutional history. Every step that was taken toward the formation of the Constitution of the United States, from its inception to its adoption, was taken by the states, and not by the people of the United States in the aggregate. There was no such people known as the people of the United States, in the aggregate, at the time of the formation of the Constitution. If there is any such people now, it was formed by the Constitution. But this is not the question. The question now is, who formed the Constitution, not what was formed by it. If it was formed by the states, admit our adversaries, it may be broken by the states. The delegates who met at Annapolis were sent thither by the states, and not by the people of the United States. The Convention of 1787, which formed the Constitution, was equally composed of members sent to Philadelphia by the states. James Madison was chosen by the people of Virginia, and not by the people of New York, and Alexander Hamilton was chosen by the people of New York, and not by the people of Virginia. Every article, section, and paragraph of the Constitution was voted for, or against, by states, the little state of Delaware, 
not much larger than a single county of New York, offsetting the vote of that great state. And when the Constitution was formed, to whom was it submitted for ratification? Was there any convention of the people of the United States in the aggregate, as one nation, called for the purpose of considering it? Did not each state, on the contrary, call its own convention? And did not some of the states accept it, and some of them refuse to accept it? It was provided that when nine states should accept it, it should go into operation, was it pretended that the vote of these nine states was to bind the others? Is it not a fact, on the contrary, that the vote of eleven states did not bind the other two? Where was that great constituency, composed of the people of the United States in the aggregate, as one nation, all this time? But, say those who are opposed to us in this argument, look at the instrument itself, and you will see that it was framed by the people of the United States, and not by the states. Does not its preamble read thus, we, the people of the United States, in order to form a more perfect union, and see, do ordain and establish this constitution for the United States of America? Perhaps there has never been a greater literary and historical fraud practiced upon any people, than has been attempted in the use to which these words have been put. And, perhaps, no equal number of reading and intelligent men has ever before submitted so blindly and docilely to be imposed upon by literary quackery and the legend domain of words, as our fellow citizens of the North have in accepting Webster's and Story's version of the preamble of the Constitution. A brief history of the manner, in which the words, we, the people, and see, came to be adopted by the convention which framed the constitution, will sufficiently expose the baldness of the cheat. The only wonder is, that such men as Webster and Story should have risked their reputations with posterity, on a construction which may so easily be shown to be a falsification of the facts of history. Mr. Webster, in his celebrated speech in the Senate, in 1833, in reply to Mr. Calhoun, made this bold declaration, the Constitution itself, in its very front, declares, that it was ordained and established by the people of the United States in the aggregate. From that day to this, this declaration of Mr. Webster has been the chief foundation on which all the constitutional lawyers of the North have built their arguments against the rights of the states as sovereign co-partners. If the preamble of the Constitution stood alone, without the lights of contemporaneous history to reveal its true character, there might be some force in Mr. Webster's position, but, unfortunately for him and his followers, he has misstated a fact. It is not true as every reader of constitutional history must know, that the Constitution of the United States was ordained by the people of the United States in the aggregate, nor did the preamble to the Constitution mean to assert that it was true. The great names of Webster, and Story have been lent to a palpable falsification of history, and as a result of that falsification, a great war has ensued, which has sacrificed its hecatomb of victims, and desolated and nearly destroyed an entire people. The poet did not say, without reason, that words are things. Now let us strip off the disguises worn by these word mongers, and see where the truth really lies. Probably some of my readers will learn, for the first time, the reasons which induced the framers of the constitution to adopt the phraseology, we, the people, and see, in the formation of their preamble to that instrument. In the original draft of the Constitution, the states, by name, were mentioned, as had been done in the Articles of Confederation. The states had formed the old Confederation, the states were equally forming the new Confederation, hence the Convention naturally followed in their preamble the form which had been set them in the old Constitution, or Articles. This preamble, purporting that the work of forming the new government was being done by the states, remained at the head of the instrument during all the deliberations of the convention, and no one member ever objected to it. It expressed a fact which no one thought of denying. It is thus a fact beyond question, not only that the constitution was framed by the states, but that the convention so proclaimed in front of the instrument. Having been framed by the states, was it afterward adopted, or ordained and established, to use the words of Mr. Webster? 
by the people of the United States, in the aggregate, and was this the reason why the words were changed? There were in the convention several members in favor of submitting the instrument to the people of the United States in the aggregate, and thereby accomplishing their favorite object of establishing a consolidated government, Alexander Hamilton and Gouverne Morris among the number. On the journal of the convention, the following record is found, Gouverne Morris moved that the reference of the plan, I. E. of the Constitution, be made to one general convention chosen and authorized by the people, to consider, amend, and establish the same. Thus the question, as to who should ordain and establish the constitution, whether it should be the people in the aggregate, or the people of the states, was clearly presented to the convention. How did the convention vote on this proposition? The reader will perhaps be surprised to learn, that the question was not even brought to a vote, for want of a second? and yet this is the fact recorded by the convention. The reader who has read Mr. Madison's articles in the Federalist, and his speeches before the Virginia Convention, in favor of the ratification of the Constitution, will perhaps be surprised to learn that he, too, made a somewhat similar motion. He was not in favor, it is true, of referring the instrument for adoption to a general convention of the whole people, alone but he was in favor of referring it to such a convention, in connection with conventions to be called by the states, thus securing a joint or double ratification, by the people of the United States in the aggregate, and by the states, the effect of which would have been to make the new government a still more complex affair, and to muddle still further the brains of Mr. Webster and Mr. Justice Story. But this motion failed also, and the Constitution was referred to the states for adoption. But now a new question arose, which was, whether the Constitution was to be ordained and established by the legislatures of the states, or by the people of the states in convention. All were agreed, as we have seen, that the instrument should be referred to the states. This had been settled, but there were differences of opinion as to how the states should act upon it. Some were in favor of permitting each of the states to choose, for itself how it would ratify it, others were in favor of referring it to the legislatures, and others, again, to the people of the states in convention. It was finally decided that it should be referred to conventions of the people, in the different states. This being done, their work was completed, and it only remained to refer the rough draft of the instrument to the committee on style, to prune and polish it a little, to lop off a word here, and change or add a word there the better to conform the language to the sense, and to the proprieties of grammar and rhetoric. The preamble, as it stood, at once presented a difficulty. All the thirteen states were named in it as adopting the instrument, but it had been provided, in the course of its deliberations by the convention, that the new government should go into effect if nine states adopted it. Who could tell which these nine states would be? It was plainly impossible to enumerate all the states for all of them might not adopt it, or any particular number of them, as adopting the instrument. Further, it having been determined, as we have seen, that the Constitution should be adopted by the people of the several states, as contradistinguished from the legislatures of the states, the phraseology of the preamble must be made to express this idea also. To meet these two new demands upon the phraseology of the instrument, the Committee on Style adopted the expression, we, the people of the United States, meaning, as every one must see, we, the people of the several states united by this instrument. And this is the foundation that the northern advocates of a consolidated government build upon, when they declare that the people of the United States in the aggregate, as one nation, adopted the Constitution, and thus gave the fundamental law to the states instead of the states giving it to the federal government. It is well known that this phrase, we, the people, and see, became a subject of discussion in the Virginia Ratifying Convention. Patrick Henry, with the prevision of a prophet, was, as we have seen, bitterly opposed to the adoption of the Constitution. He was its enemy ultrance. Not having been a member of the Convention, of 1787, that framed the instrument, 
and being unacquainted with the circumstances above detailed, relative to the change which had been made in the phraseology of its preamble, he attacked the constitution on the very ground since assumed by Webster and Story, to wit, that the instrument itself proclaimed that it had been ordained and established by the people of the United States in the aggregate, instead of the people of the states. Mr. Madison replied to Henry on this occasion. Madison had been in the convention, knew, of course, all about the change of phraseology in question, and this was his reply, the parties to it, the constitution, were the people, but not the people as composing one great society, but the people as composing thirteen sovereignties. If it were a consolidated government, continued he, the assent of a majority of the people would be sufficient to establish it. But it was to be binding on the people of a state only by their own separate consent. There was, of course, nothing more to be said, and the Virginia Convention adopted the Constitution. Madison has been called the father of the Constitution. Next to him, Alexander Hamilton bore the most conspicuous part in procuring it to be adopted by the people. Hamilton, as is well known, did not believe much in republics, and least of all did he believe in federal republics. His great object was to establish a consolidated republic, if we must have a republic at all. He labored zealously for this purpose, but failed. The states, without an exception, were in favor of the federal form, and no one knew better than Hamilton the kind of government which had been established. Now let us hear what Hamilton, an unwilling, but an honest witness, says on this subject. Of the eighty-five articles in the Federalist, Hamilton wrote no less than fifty. Having failed to procure the establishment of a consolidated government, his next great object was, to procure the adoption by the states of the present constitution, and to this task, accordingly, he now addressed his great intellect and powerful energies. In turning over the pages of the Federalist, we can scarcely go amiss in quoting Hamilton, to the point that the Constitution is a compact between the states, and not an emanation from the people of the United States in the aggregate. Let us take up the final article, for instance, the 85th. In this article we find the following expressions, the compacts which are to embrace thirteen distinct states in a common bond of amity and union must necessarily be compromises of as many dissimilar interests and inclinations. Again, the moment an alteration is made in the present plan, it becomes, to the purpose of adoption, a new one, and must undergo a new decision of each state. To its complete establishment throughout the Union, it will, therefore, require the concurrence of thirteen states. And again, every constitution for the United States must, inevitably, consist of a great variety of particulars, in which thirteen independent states are to be accommodated in their interests, or opinions of interests. Hence the necessity of molding and arranging all the particulars which are to compose the whole in such a manner as to satisfy all the parties to the compact. Thus, we do not hear Hamilton, any more than Madison, talking of a people of the United States in the aggregate as having anything to do with the formation of the new charter of government. He speaks only of states, and of compacts made or to be made by states. In view of the great importance of the question, whether it was the people of the United States in the aggregate who ordained and established the Constitution, or the states comma for this, indeed, is the whole gist of the controversy between the North and South comma I have dwelt somewhat at length on the subject, and had recourse to contemporaneous history, but this was scarcely necessary. The Constitution itself settles the whole controversy. The seventh article of that instrument reads as follows, The ratification of the conventions of nine states shall be sufficient for the establishment of the Constitution between the states so ratifying the same. How is it possible to reconcile this short, explicit, and unambiguous provision with the theory I am combating? The preamble, as explained by the Northern Consolidationists, and this article, cannot possibly stand together. It is not possible that the people of the United States in the aggregate, as one nation, ordained and established the Constitution, and that the states ordained and established it at the same time 
for there was but one set of conventions called, and these conventions were called by the states, and acted in the names of the states. Mr. Madison did, indeed, endeavor to have the ratification made in both modes, but his motion in the convention to this effect failed, as we have seen. Further, how could the Constitution be binding only between the states that ratified it, if it was not ratified, that is, not ordained and established by them at all, but by the people of the United States in the aggregate? As remarked by Mr. Madison, in the Virginia Convention, a ratification by the people, in the sense in which this term is used by the Northern Consolidationists, would have bound all the people, and there would have been no option left the dissenting states. But the seventh article says that they shall have an option, and that the instrument is to be binding only between such of them as ratify it. With all due deference, then, to others who have written upon this vexed question, and who have differed from me in opinion, I must insist that the proof is conclusive that the Constitution is a compact between the states, and this being so, we have the admission of both Mr. Webster and Justice Story that any one of the states may withdraw from it at pleasure. Chapter 3 From the foundation of the federal government down to 1830, both the North and the South held the Constitution to be a compact between the states. One of the great difficulties in arguing the question of the relative power of the states and of the federal government, consists in the fact that the present generation has grown up under the shadow of the great federal monster, and has been blinded by its giant proportions. They see around them all the paraphernalia and power of a great government, its splendid capital, its armies, its fleets, its chief magistrate, its legislature, and its judiciary and they find it difficult to realize the fact, that all this grandeur is not self-created, but the offspring of the states. When our late troubles were culminating, men were heard frequently to exclaim, with plaintive energy, what? Have we no government capable of preserving itself? Is our government a mere rope of sand, that may be destroyed at the will of the states? These men seemed to think that there was but one government to be preserved and that that was the government of the United States. Less than a century had elapsed since the adoption of the Constitution, and the generation now on the theatre of events had seemingly forgotten, that the magnificent structure, which they contemplated with so much admiration, was but a creature of the states, that it had been made by them for their convenience, and necessarily held the tenure of its life at sufferance. They lost sight of the fact that the state governments, who were the creators of the federal government, were the governments to be preserved, if there should be any antagonism between them and the federal government, and that their services, as well as their sympathies, belonged to the former in preference to the latter. What with the teachings of Webster and Story, and a host of satellites, the dazzling splendor of the federal government, and the overshadowing and corrupting influences of its power. Nearly a whole generation in the North had grown up in ignorance of the true nature of the institutions, under which they lived. This change in the education of the people had taken place since about the year 1830, for, up to that time, both of the great political parties of the country, the Whigs as well as the Democrats, had been state rights in doctrine. A very common error has prevailed on this subject. It has been said, that the North and the South have always been widely separated in their views of the Constitution, that the men of the North have always been consolidationists, whilst the men of the South have been secessionists. Nothing can be farther from the truth. Whilst the North and the South, from the very commencement of the government, have been at sword's points, on many questions of mere construction and policy, comma, the North claiming that more ample powers had been granted the federal government, than the South was willing to concede, comma, there never was any material difference between them down to the year 1830, as to the true nature of their government. They all held it to be a federal compact, and the northern people were as jealous of the rights of their states under it, as the southern people. In proof of this, I have only to refer to a few of the well-known facts of our political history. Thomas Jefferson penned the famous Kentucky Resolutions of 98 and 99. The first of those resolutions is in these words, resolved, 
that the several states comprising the United States of America are not united on the principles of unlimited submission to their general government, but that by a compact, under the style and title of the Constitution of the United States, and of amendments thereto, they constitute a general government for special purposes, and that whensoever the general government assumes undelegated powers, its acts are unauthoritative, void and of no force, that to this compact each state acceded as a state, and is an integral party, its co-states forming, as to itself, the other party, that the government created by this compact was not made the exclusive or final judge of the extent of the powers delegated to itself, since that would have made its discretion, not the constitution, the measure of its powers, but that, as in all cases of compact among persons having no common judge, each party has an equal right to judge for itself, as well of infractions, as of the mode and measure of redress. It is unnecessary to quote the other resolution, as the above contains all that is sufficient for my purpose, which is to show that Mr. Jefferson was a secessionist, and that with this record he went before the American people as a candidate for the presidency, with the following results, in 1800 he beat his opponent, John Adams, who represented the consolidationists of that day, by a majority of eight votes in the Electoral College. In 1804, being a candidate for re-election, he beat his opponent by the overwhelming majority of 162, to 14 votes. In the northern states alone, Mr. Jefferson received 85 votes, whilst in the same states his opponent received but nine. This was a pretty considerable endorsement of secession by the northern states. In 1808, Mr. Madison, who penned the Virginia Resolutions of 98, similar in tenor to the Kentucky Resolutions, became a candidate for the presidency, and beat his opponent by a vote of 122 to 47, the northern majority, though somewhat diminished, being still 50 to 39 votes. Mr. Madison was re-elected in 1812, and in 1816, James Monroe was elected president by a vote of 183 to his opponent's 34, and more than one half of these 183 votes came from the northern states. In 1820, Mr. Monroe was re-elected over John Quincy Adams, of Massachusetts, by a majority of 231 votes to 13. Besides Monroe and Adams, Crawford and Jackson were also candidates, but these two latter received only 11 votes between them. This last election is especially remarkable, as showing that there was no opposition to Jefferson's doctrine of state rights, since all the candidates were of that creed. The opposition had been so often defeated, and rooted in former elections, that they had not strength enough left to put a candidate in the field. John Quincy Adams succeeded Mr. Monroe, and his state rights doctrines are well known. He expressed them as follows, the indissoluble link of union between the people of the several states of this confederated nation, is, after all, not in the right, but in the heart. If the day should ever come, may heaven avert it, when the affections of the people of these states shall be alienated from each other, when the fraternal spirit shall give way to cold indifference or collision of interests shall fester into hatred, the bands of political association will not long hold together parties, no longer attracted by the magnetism of conciliated interests, and kindly sympathies, and far better will it be for the people of the disunited states to part in friendship with each other, than to be held together by constraint. Then will be the time for reverting to the precedents, which occurred at the formation, and adoption of the constitution to form again a more perfect union, by dissolving that which could no longer bind, and to leave the separated parts to be reunited by the law of political gravitation to the center. General Jackson succeeded Mr. Adams in 1828, and was re-elected in 1832. It was during his administration that the heresy was first promulgated by Mr. Webster, that the Constitution was not a compact between the states but an instrument of government, ordained, and established, by the people of the United States, in the aggregate, as one nation. With respect to the New England states in particular, there is other and more pointed evidence, 
that they agreed with Mr. Jefferson, and the South down to the year 1830, on this question of state rights, than is implied in the presidential elections above quoted. Massachusetts, the leader of these states in intellect, and in energy, impatient of control herself, has always sought to control others. This was, perhaps, but natural. All mankind are prone to consult their own interests. Selfishness, unfortunately, is one of the vices of our nature, which few are found capable of struggling against effectually. The New England people were largely imbued with the Puritan element. Their religious doctrines gave them a gloomy asceticism of character, and an intolerance of other men's opinions quite remarkable. In their earlier history as colonists, there is much in the way of uncharitableness and persecution, which a liberal mind could wish to see blotted out. True to these characteristics, which I may almost call instincts, the New England states have always been the most refractory states of the Union. As long as they were in a minority, and hopeless of the control of the government, they stood strictly on their state rights, in resisting such measures as were unpalatable to them even to the extremity of threatening secession, and it was only when they saw that the tables were turned, and that it was possible for them to seize the reins of the government, that they abandoned their state rights doctrines, and became consolidationists. One of the first causes of the dissatisfaction of the New England states with the general government was the purchase of Louisiana, by Mr. Jefferson, in 1803. It arose out of their jealousy of the balance of power between the states. The advantages to result to the United States from the purchase of this territory were patent to every one. It completed the continuity of our territory, from the headwaters of the Mississippi, to the sea, and unlocked the mouths of that great river. But Massachusetts saw in the purchase, nothing more than the creation of additional southern states, to contest, with her, the future control of the government. She could see no authority for it in the Constitution, and she threatened, that if it were consummated, she would secede from the Union. Her legislature passed the following resolution on the subject, resolved, that the annexation of Louisiana to the Union, transcends the constitutional power of the government of the United States. It formed a new confederacy, to which the states, not the people of the United States, in the aggregate, united by the former compact, are not bound to adhere. This purchase of Louisiana rankled, for a long time, in the breast of New England. It was made, as we have seen, in 1803, and in 1811 the subject again came up for consideration, this time, in the shape of a bill before Congress for the admission of Louisiana as a state. One of the most able and influential members of Congress of that day from Massachusetts was Mr. Josiah Quincy. In a speech on this bill, that gentleman uttered the following declaration, If this bill passes, it is my deliberate opinion that it is virtually a dissolution of the Union, that it will free the states from their moral obligation, and as it will be the right of all, so it will be the duty of some definitely to prepare for separation, amicably if they can, violently if they must. Time passed on, and the difficulties which led to our War of 1812, with Great Britain began to rise above the political horizon. Great Britain began to impress seamen from New England merchant ships, and even went so far, at last, as to take some enlisted men from on board the United States ship of war Chesapeake. Massachusetts was furious, she insisted that war should be declared forthwith against Great Britain. The southern states, which had comparatively little interest in this matter, except so far as the federal honor was concerned, came generously to the rescue of the shipping states, and war was declared. But the first burst of her passion having spent itself, Massachusetts found that she had been indiscreet, her shipping began to suffer more than she had anticipated, and she began now to cry aloud as one in pain. She denounced the war, and the administration which was carrying it on and not content with this, in connection with other New England states, she organized a convention, at Hartford, in Connecticut, with a view to adopt some ulterior measures. We find the following among the records of that convention, events may prove, that the causes of our calamities are deep, and permanent. 
they may be found to proceed not merely from blindness of prejudice, pride of opinion, violence of party spirit, or the confusion of the times, but they may be traced to implacable combinations, of individuals, or of states, to monopolize office, and to trample, without remorse, upon the rights and interests of the commercial sections of the Union. Whenever it shall appear, that these causes are radical, and permanent, a separation by equitable arrangement, will be preferable to an alliance, by constraint, among nominal friends but real enemies, inflamed by mutual hatred, and jealousy, and inviting, by intestine divisions, contempt and aggressions from abroad. Having recorded this opinion of what should be the policy of the New England states, in the category mentioned, the Journal of the Convention goes on to declare what it considers the right of the states, in the premises, that acts of Congress, in violation of the Constitution, are absolutely void, is an indisputable position. It does not, however, consist with the respect, from a Confederate state toward the general government, to fly to open resistance, upon every infraction of the Constitution. The mode, and the energy of the opposition should always conform to the nature of the violation, the intention of the authors, the extent of the evil inflicted, the determination manifested to persist in it, and the danger of delay. But in case of deliberate, dangerous, and palpable infractions of the Constitution, affecting the sovereignty of the state, and liberties of the people, it is not only the right, but the duty, of each state to interpose its authority for their protection, in the manner best calculated to secure that end. When emergencies occur, which are either beyond the reach of judicial tribunals, or too pressing to admit of the delay incident to their forms, states, which have no common umpire, must be their own judges, and execute their own decisions. These proceedings took place in January, 1815. A deputation was appointed to lay the complaints of New England before the federal government, and there is no predicting what might have occurred, if the delegates had not found, that peace had been declared, when they arrived at Washington. It thus appears, that from 1803-4 to 1815, New England was constantly in the habit of speaking of the dissolution of the Union, her leading men deducing this right from the nature of the compact between the states. It is curious and instructive, and will well repay the perusal, to read the journal of the Hartford Convention, so replete is it with sound constitutional doctrine. It abounds in such expressions as these, the constitutional compact, it must be the duty of the state to watch over the rights reserved, as of the United States to exercise the powers which were delegated, the right of conscription is not delegated to Congress by the Constitution and the exercise of it would not be less dangerous to their liberties, than hostile to the sovereignty of the states. The odium which has justly fallen upon the Hartford Convention, has not been because of its doctrines, for these were as sound, as we have seen, as the Virginia and Kentucky resolutions of 98 and 99, but because it was a secret conclave, gotten together, in a time of war, when the country was hard pressed by a foreign enemy, the war having, in fact, been undertaken for the benefit of the very shipping states which were threatening to dissolve the Union on account of it. Mr. John Quincy Adams, the sixth President of the United States, himself, as is well known, a Massachusetts man, speaking of this dissatisfaction of the New England states with the federal government, says, that their object was, and had been, for several years a dissolution of the Union and the establishment of a separate confederation, he knew from unequivocal evidence, although not provable in a court of law, and that in case of a civil war, the aid of Great Britain, to effect that purpose, would be assuredly resorted to, as it would be indispensably necessary to their design. See Mr. Adams' letter of December 30, 1828, in reply to Harrison Gray Otis and others. We have thus seen that for forty years, or from the foundation of the federal government, to 1830, there was no material difference of opinion between the sections, as to the nature of the league or compact of government which they had formed. There was this difference between the sections, however. The South, during this entire period of forty years, 
had substantially controlled the government, not by force, it is true, of her own majorities, but with the aid of a few of the northern states. She was the dominant or ruling power in the government. During all this time, she conscientiously adhered to her convictions, and respected the rights of the minority, though she might have wielded her power, if she had been so inclined, to her own advantage. Constitutions are made for the protection of minorities, and she scrupulously adhered to this idea. Minorities naturally cling to the guarantees and defenses provided for them in the fundamental law, it is only when they become strong, when they throw off their pupillage, and become majorities, that their principles and their virtues are really tested. It is in politics, as in religion, the weaker party is always the tolerant party. Did the North follow this example set her by the South? No. The moment she became strong enough, she recanted all the doctrines under which she had sought shelter, tore the constitution into fragments, scattered it to the winds, and finally, when the South threw herself on the defensive, as Massachusetts had threatened to do, in 1803 and 1815, she subjugated her. What was the powerful motive which thus induced the North to overthrow the government which it had labored so assiduously with the South to establish, and which it had construed in common with the South, for the period of forty years? It was the motive which generally influences human conduct, it was the same motive which Patrick Henry had so clearly foreseen, when he warned the people of Virginia against entering into the Federal Compact, telling them, that interested majorities never had in the history of the world, and never would respect the rights of minorities. The great American system, as it has been called, had in the meantime arisen, championed by no less a personage than Henry Clay of Kentucky. In 1824, and again in 1828, oppressive tariffs had been enacted for the protection of New England manufacturers. The North was manufacturing, the South non-manufacturing. The effect of these tariffs was to shut out all foreign competition, and compel the southern consumer to pay two prices for all the textile fabrics he consumed, from the clothing of his negroes to his own broadcloth coats. So oppressive, unjust, and unconstitutional were these acts considered, that South Carolina nullified them in 1830. Immediately all New England was arrayed against South Carolina. An entire and rapid change took place in the political creed of that section. New England orators and jurists rose up to proclaim that the Constitution was not a compact between the states. Webster thundered in the Senate, and Story wrote his commentaries on the Constitution. These giants had a Herculean task before them, nothing less than the falsifying of the whole political history of the country, for the previous forty years but their barren and inhospitable section of the country had been touched by the enchanter's wand, and its rocky hills, and sterile fields, incapable of yielding even a scanty subsistence to its numerous population, were to become glad with the music of the spindle and the shuttle, and the giants undertook the task. How well they have accomplished it, the reader will see, in the course of these pages, when, toward the conclusion of my narrative, he will be called upon to view the fragments of the grand old constitution, which has been shattered, and which will lie in such mournful profusion round him, the monuments at once of the folly and crimes of a people, who have broken up a government, a free government, which might else have endured for centuries. Chapter 4 Was secession treason? A few more words, and we shall be in a condition to answer the question which stands at the head of this chapter. Being a legal question, it will depend entirely upon the constitutional right the southern states may have had to withdraw from the Union, without reference to considerations of expediency, or of moral right, these latter will be more appropriately considered, when we come to speak of the causes which impelled the southern states to the step. I have combated many of the arguments presented by the other side, but a few others remain to be noticed. It has been said, that, Admitting that the Constitution was a federal compact, yet the states did in fact cede away a part of their sovereignty, and from this the inference has been deduced, that they no longer remained sovereign for the purpose of recalling the part, which had been ceded away. 
This is a question which arises wholly under the laws of nations. It is admitted, that the states were independent sovereignties, before they formed the constitution. We have only, therefore, to consult the international code, to ascertain to what extent the granting away of a portion of their sovereignty affected the remainder. Vattel, treating of this identical point, speaks as follows. Several sovereign and independent states may unite themselves together by a perpetual confederacy, without ceasing to be, each individually, a perfect state. They will, together, constitute a federal republic, their joint deliberations will not impair the sovereignty of each member, though they may, in certain respects, put some restraint upon the exercise of it, in virtue of voluntary engagements. That was just what the American states did. When they formed the federal constitution, they put some voluntary restraint upon their sovereignty, for the furtherance of a common object. If they are restrained, by the constitution, from doing certain things, the restraint was self-imposed, for it was they who ordained, and established the instrument, and not a common superior. They, each, agreed that they would forbear to do certain things if their co-partners would forbear to do the same things. As plain as this seems, no less an authority than that of Mr. Webster has denied it, for, in his celebrated argument against Mr. Calhoun, already referred to, he triumphantly exclaimed, that the states were not sovereign, because they were restrained of a portion of their liberty by the constitution. See how he perverts the whole tenor of the instrument, in his endeavor to build up those manufactories of which we spoke in the last chapter. He says, however men may think this ought to be, the fact is, that the people of the United States have chosen to impose control on state sovereignty. There are those, doubtless, who wish that they had been left without restraint, but the Constitution has ordered the matter differently. To make war, for instance is an exercise of sovereignty, but, the constitution declares that no state shall declare war. To coin money is another act of sovereign power, but no state is at liberty to coin money. Again, the constitution says, that no sovereign state shall be so sovereign, as to make a treaty. These prohibitions, it must be confessed, are a control on the state sovereignty of South Carolina, as well as of the other states which does not arise from her feelings of honorable justice. Here we see, plainly, the germ of the monstrous heresy that has riven the states asunder, in our day. The people of the United States, a common superior, ordained and established the Constitution, says Mr. Webster, and imposed restraints upon the states. However some might wish they had been left without restraint, the Constitution has ordained it differently and the ostrich stomach of the North received, and digested this monstrous perversion of the plainest historical truth, in order that the spindle might wear on, and the shuttle dance from side to side of the loom. Following the idea of Mr. Webster, that the people of the United States gave constitutional law to the states, instead of receiving it from them, northern writers frequently ask, in what part of the Constitution, is the doctrine of secession found? In no part. It was not necessary to put it there. The states who formed the instrument, delegated certain powers to the federal government, retaining all others. Did they part, with the right of secession? Could they have parted with it, without consenting to a merger of their sovereignty? And so far from doing this, we have seen with what jealous care they protested against even the implication of such a merger, in the Tenth Amendment to the Constitution. If the power was not parted with, by explicit grant, did it not remain to them, even before the Tenth Amendment was adopted, and still more, if possible, after it was adopted? To make it still more apparent, that the common understanding among the fathers of the Constitution was, that this right of secession was reserved, it is only necessary to refer to what took place, during the transition from the old to the new government. The thirteen original states seceded, as we have seen, from the Articles of Confederation, not unanimously, or altogether, but one by one, each state acting for itself, without consulting the interests, or inclinations of the others. 
One of the provisions of those articles was as follows, Every state shall abide by the determination of the United States, in Congress assembled, in all questions, which, by this confederation, are submitted to them, and the articles of this confederation shall be inviolably observed by every state, and the union shall be perpetual, nor shall any alteration, at any time hereafter, be made in any of them, unless such alteration be agreed to, in a Congress of the United States, and be afterward confirmed by the legislature of every state. Now, it is a pertinent, and instructive fact, that no similar provision of perpetuity was engrafted in the new constitution. There must have been a motive for this, it could not have been a mere accidental omission, and the motive probably was, that the convention of 1787 were ashamed to attempt, a second time, to bind sovereign states, by a rope of sand, which they, themselves, were in the act of pulling asunder. It was in accordance with this understanding, that both New York and Virginia, in their ratifications of the new constitution, expressly reserved to themselves the right of secession, and no objection was made to such conditional ratifications. The reservations made by these states in a, as a matter of course, to the benefit of all the states, as they were all to go into the new union, on precisely the same footing. In the extract from Mr. Webster's speech, which has been given above, it is alleged among other things, that the states are not sovereign, because they cannot make treaties, and this disability also has been urged as an argument against secession. The disability, like others, was self-imposed, and, as any one may see, was intended to be binding on the states only so long as the contract which they were then forming should endure. The Confederate states respected this obligation while they remained in the Federal Union. They scrupulously forbore from contracting with each other until they had resumed, each for itself, their original sovereignty, they were then not only free to contract with each other, but to do and perform all the other acts enumerated by Mr. Webster. The act of declaring war included, even though this war should be against their late confederates. The truth is, the more we sift these arguments of our late enemies, the less real merit there appears in them. The facts of history are too stubborn, and refuse to be bent to conform to the new doctrines. We see it emblazoned on every page of American history for forty years, that the Constitution was a compact between the states, that the federal government was created, by, and for the benefit of the states, and possessed and could possess no other power than such as was conferred upon it by the states, that the states reserved to themselves all the powers not granted, and that they took especial pains to guard their sovereignty, in terms, by an amendment to the Constitution, lest, by possibility, their intentions in the formation of the new government, should be misconstrued. In the course of time this government is perverted from its original design. Instead of remaining the faithful and impartial agent of all the states, a faction obtains control of it, in the interests of some of them, and turns it, as an engine of oppression, against the others. These latter, after long and patient suffering, after having exhausted all their means of defense, within the Union, withdraw from the agent the powers which they had conferred upon him, form a new confederacy, and desire to be let alone. And what is the consequence? They are denounced as rebels and traitors, armies are equipped, and fleets provided, and a war of subjugation is waged against them. What says the reader? Does he see rebellion and treason lurking in the conduct of these states? Are they, indeed, in his opinion, in face of the record which he has inspected, so bereft of their sovereignty, as to be incapable of defending themselves? except with halters around the necks of their citizens? Let us examine this latter question of halters for a moment. The states existed before the federal government, the citizens of the states owed allegiance to their respective states, and to none others. By what process was any portion of this allegiance transferred to the federal government, and to what extent was it transferred? It was transferred by the states, themselves, when they entered into the federal compact and not by the individual citizens, for these had no power to make such a transfer. 
although it be admitted, that a citizen of any one of the states may have had the right to expatriate himself entirely, and this was not so clear a doctrine at that day, and transfer his allegiance to another government, yet it is quite certain, that he could not, ex maramotu, divide his allegiance. His allegiance then was transferred to the federal government, by his state, whether he would or not. Take the case of Patrick Henry, for example. He resisted the adoption of the federal constitution, by the state of Virginia, with all the energies of an ardent nature, solemnly believing that his state was committing suicide. And yet, when Virginia did adopt that constitution, he became, by virtue of that act, a citizen of the United States, and owed allegiance to the federal government. He had been born in the hallowed old commonwealth. In the days of his boyhood he had played on the banks of the Appomattox, and fished in its waters. As he grew to man's estate, all his cherished hopes and aspirations clustered around his beloved state. The bones of his ancestors were interred in her soil, his loves, his joys, his sorrows were all centered there. In short, he felt the inspiration of patriotism, that noble sentiment which nerves men to do, and dare, unto the death for their native soil. Will it be said, can it be said, without revolting all the best feelings of the human heart, that if Patrick Henry had lived to see a war of subjugation waged against his native state, he would have been a traitor for striking in her defence? Was this one of the results which our ancestors designed, when they framed the federal compact? It would be uncharitable to accuse them of such folly, and stupidity, nay of such cruelty. If this doctrine be true, that secession is treason, then our ancestors framed a government, which could not fail to make traitors of their descendants, in case of a conflict between the states, and that government, let them act as they would. It was frequently argued in the Federalist, and elsewhere, by those who were persuading the states to adopt the federal constitution, that the state would have a sufficient guarantee of protection, in the love, and affection of its citizens, that the citizen would naturally cling to his state, and side with her against the federal government, that, in fact, it was rather to be apprehended that the federal government would be too weak, and the states too strong, for this reason, instead of the converse of the proposition being true. It was not doubted, in that day, that the primary and paramount allegiance of the citizen was due to his state, and, that, in case of a conflict between her and the federal government, his state would have the right to withdraw his allegiance, from that government. If it was she who transferred it, and if she had the right to transfer it, it follows beyond question, that she would have the right to withdraw it. It was not a case for the voluntary action of the citizen, either way, he could not, of his own free will, either give his allegiance to the federal government, or take it away. If this be true, observe in what a dilemma he has been placed on the hypothesis that secession is treason. If he adheres to the federal government, after his state has withdrawn his allegiance from that government, and takes up arms against his state, he becomes a traitor to his state. If he adheres to his state, and takes up arms against the federal government, he becomes a traitor to that government. He is thus a traitor either way, and there is no helping himself. Is this consistent with the supposed wisdom of the political fathers, those practical, common sense men, who formed the federal constitution? The mutations of governments, like all human events, are constantly going on. No government stands still, any more than the individuals of which it is composed. The only difference is, that the changes are not quite so obvious to the generation which views them. The framers of the constitution did not dare to hope that they had formed a government, that was to last forever. Nay, many of them had serious misgivings as to the result of the experiment they were making. Is it possible, then, that those men so legislated, as to render it morally certain, that if their experiment should fail, their descendants must become either slaves or traitors? If the doctrine that secession is treason be true, it matters not how grievously a state might be oppressed, by the federal government, she has been deprived of the power of lawful resistance, and must regain her liberty, if at all, like other enslaved states, at the hazard of war, 
and rebellion. Was this the sort of experiment in government, that our forefathers supposed they were making? Every reader of history knows that it was not. Chapter 5 Another Brief Historical Retrospect In the previous chapters, I have given a brief outline of the history and formation of the Federal Constitution, proving, by abundant reference to the Fathers, and to the instrument itself, that it was the intention of the former to draft, and that they did draft, a Federal Compact of Government, which compact was ordained, and established, by the states, in their sovereign capacity, and not by the people of the United States, in the aggregate, as one nation. It resulted from this statement of the question, that the states had the legal, and constitutional right to withdraw from the compact, at pleasure, without reference to any cause of quarrel. Accordingly, nothing has yet been said about the causes which impelled the southern states to a separation, except indeed incidentally, when the tariff system was alluded to, as the motive which had induced Massachusetts and the other northern states, to change their state rights doctrine. It was stated in the opening chapter, that the judgment which posterity will form, upon the great conflict between the sections, will depend, mainly, upon the answers which we may be able to give to two questions, first, had the South the right to dissolve the compact of government, under which it had lived with the North? And secondly, was there sufficient ground for this dissolution? Having answered the first question, imperfectly, I fear, but yet as fully, as was consistent, with the design of these pages, I propose now to consider, very briefly, the second. I would gladly have left all this preliminary work to other, and able appends, but I do not consider that the memoirs of any actor in the late war, who, like myself, was an officer in the old service, and who withdrew from that service, because of the breaking out of the war, or rather because of the secession of his state, would be complete without, at least, a brief reference to the reasons, which controlled his judgment. The American Constitution died of a disease, that was inherent in it. It was framed on false principles, inasmuch as the attempt was made, through its means, of binding together, in a republican form of government, two dissimilar peoples, with widely dissimilar interests. Monarchial governments may accomplish this, since they are founded on force, but republican governments never. Austria, and Russia, pinned together, in our day, with their bayonets, many dissimilar peoples, but if a republic should make the attempt, that moment it must, of necessity, cease to be a republic, since the very foundation of such a government is the consent of the governed. The secession of the southern states was a mere corollary of the American proposition of government, and the northern states stultified themselves, the moment they attempted to resist it. The consent of the southern states being wanted, there should have been an end of the question. If the northern states were not satisfied to let them go, but entertained, on the contrary, a desire to restrain them by force, this was a proof, that those states had become tired of the republican form, and desired to change it. But they should have been honest about it, they should have avowed their intentions from the beginning, and not have waged the war, as so many republics, endeavouring to coerce other republics, into a forced union with them. To have been logical, they should have obliterated the state boundaries, and have declared all the states, as well the northern states, as the southern, so many counties of a consolidated government. But even then, they could not have made war upon any considerable number of those counties, without violating the fundamental American idea of a government, the consent of the governed. The right of self-government was vindicated in the Declaration of Independence, in favor of three millions of the subjects of Great Britain. In the states of the Southern Confederacy, there were eight millions. The American Republic, as has been said, was a failure, because of the antagonism of the two peoples, attempted to be bound together, in the same government. If there is to be but a single government in these states, in the future, it cannot be a republic. De Tocqueville saw this, thirty years ago. In his Democracy in America he described these states, as more like hostile nations, than rival parties, under one government. 
this distinguished Frenchman saw, as with the eye of intuition, the canker which lay at the heart of the federal compact. He saw looming up, in the dim distance, the ominous, and hideous form of that unbridled, and antagonistic majority, which has since rent the country in twain, a majority based on the views, and interests of one section, arrayed against the views, and interests of the other section. The majority, said he, in that country, exercises a prodigious, actual authority, and a moral influence which is scarcely less preponderant, no obstacles exist, which can impede, or so much as retard its progress, on which can induce it to heed the complaints of those whom it crushes upon its path. This state of things is fatal, in itself, and dangerous for the future. If the free institutions of America are ever destroyed, that event may be attributed to the unlimited authority of the majority. Anarchy will then be the result, but it will have been brought about by despotism. Precisely so, liberty is always destroyed by the multitude, in the name of liberty. Majorities within the limits of constitutional restraints are harmless, but the moment they lose sight of these restraints, the many headed monster becomes more tyrannical than the tyrant with a single head, numbers harden its conscience, and embolden it, in the perpetration of crime. And when this majority, in a free government, becomes a faction, or, in other words, represents certain classes and interests to the detriment of other classes, and interests, farewell to public liberty, the people must either become enslaved, or there must be a disruption of the government. This result would follow, even if the people lived under a consolidated government, and were homogeneous, much more, then, must it follow, when the government is federal in form, and the states are, in the words of de Tocqueville, more like hostile nations, than rival parties, under one government. These states are, and indeed always have been rival nations. The dissimilarity between the people of the northern, and the people of the southern states has always been remarked upon, by observant foreigners, and it has not escaped the attention of our own historians. Indeed it could not be otherwise, for the origin of the two sections has been diverse. Virginia and Massachusetts were the two original germs, from which the great majority of the American populations has sprung, and no two peoples, speaking the same language, and coming from the same country could have been more dissimilar, in education, taste, and habits, and even in natural instincts, than were the adventurers who settled these two colonies. Those who sought a new field of adventure for themselves, and affluence for their posterity, in the more congenial climate of the Chesapeake, were the gay, and dashing cavaliers, who, as a class, afterward adhered to the fortunes of the Charleses whilst the first settlers of Massachusetts were composed of the same materials, that formed the praise God bare bones parliament of Cromwell. These two peoples, seem to have had an instinctive repugnance, the one to the other. To use a botanical phrase, the Puritan was a seedling of the English race, which had been unknown to it before. It had few, or none of the characteristics of the original stock. Gloomy, saturnine, and fanatical, in disposition, it seemed to repel all the more kindly, and generous impulses of our nature, and to take a pleasure in pulling down everything, that other men had built up, not so much, as its subsequent history would seem to show, because the work was faulty, as because it had been done by other hands than their own. They hated tyranny, for instance, but it was only because they were not, themselves, the tyrants, they hated religious intolerance, but it was only when not practiced by themselves. Natural affinities attracted like unto like. The cavalier sought refuge with the cavalier, and the Puritan with the Puritan, for a century, and more. When the fortunes of the Charleses waned, the cavaliers fled to Virginia, when the fortunes of Cromwell waned, the Puritans fled to Massachusetts. Trade occasionally drew the two peoples together, but they were repelled at all other points. Thus these germs grew, step by step, into two distinct nations. A different civilization was naturally developed in each. The two countries were different in climate, and physical features, 
the climate of the one being cold and inhospitable, and its soil rugged, and sterile, whilst the climate of the other was soft, and genial, and its soil generous, and fruitful. As a result of these differences of climate, and soil, the pursuits of the two peoples became different, the one being driven to the ocean, and to the mechanic arts, for subsistence, and the other betaking itself to agriculture. Another important element soon presented itself, to widen the social, and economical breach, which had taken place between the two peoples, African slavery. All the colonies, at first, became slaveholding, but it was soon found, that slave labor was unprofitable in the north, where the soil was so niggard, in its productions, and where, besides, the white man could labor. One, by one, the northern states got rid of their slaves, as soon as they made this discovery. In the south, the case was different. The superior fertility of the soil, and the greater geniality of the climate enabled the planter to employ the African to advantage, and thus slave labor was engrafted on our system of civilization, as one of its permanent features. The effect was, as before remarked, a still greater divergence between the two peoples. The wealth of the South soon began to outstrip that of the North. Education and refinement followed wealth. Whilst the civilization of the North was coarse, and practical, that of the South was more intellectual, and refined. This is said in no spirit of disparagement of our Northern brethren, it was the natural, and inevitable result of the different situations of the two peoples. In the North, almost every young man was under the necessity, during our colonial existence, of laboring with his own hands, for the means of subsistence. There was neither the requisite leisure, nor the requisite wealth to bring about a very refined system of civilization. The life of a southern planter on the other hand with his large estates, and hundreds of vassals, with his profuse hospitality, and luxurious style of living, resembled more that of the feudatories of the Middle Ages, than that of any modern gentleman out of the southern states. It is not my object to express a preference for either of these modes of civilization, each, no doubt, had its advantages, and disadvantages, but to glance at them, merely, for the purpose of showing the dissimilarity of the two peoples, their uncongeniality, and want of adaptation, socially, the one to the other. With social institutions as wide asunder as the poles, and with their every material interest antagonistic, the separation of the two peoples, sooner or later, was a logical sequence. As had been anticipated by Patrick Henry, and others, the moment the new government went into operation, parties began to be formed, on sectional interests and sectional prejudices. The North wanted protection for her shipping, in the way of discriminating tonnage dues, and the South was opposed to such protection. The North wanted a bank, to facilitate their commercial operations, the South was opposed to it. The North wanted protection for their manufactures the South was opposed to it. There was no warrant, of course, for any of these schemes of protection in the federal constitution, they were, on the contrary, subversive of the original design of that instrument. The South has been called aggressive. She was thrown on the defensive, in the first Congress, and has remained so, from that day to this. She never had the means to be aggressive, having been always in a minority in both branches of the legislature. It is not consistent with the scope of these memoirs, to enter, at large, into the political disputes which culminated in secession. They are many, and various, and would fill volumes. It will be sufficient to sketch the history of one or two of the more important of them. The American system, of which Mr. Clay, of Kentucky, became the champion, and to which allusion has already been made, became the chief instrument of oppression of the southern states, through a long series of years. I prefer to let a late distinguished senator, from the state of Missouri, Mr. Benton, tell this tale of spoliation. On the slavery question, Mr. Benton was with the North, he cannot, therefore, be accused of being a witness unduly favorable to the South. In a speech in the Senate, in 1828, he declared himself, as follows. I feel for the sad changes, 
which have taken place in the South, during the last fifty years. Before the Revolution, it was the seat of wealth, as well as hospitality. Money, and all it commanded, abounded there. But how is it now? All this is reversed. Wealth has fled from the South, and settled in regions north of the Potomac, and this in the face of the fact, that the South, in four staples alone, has exported produce, since the Revolution, to the value of eight hundred millions of dollars, and the North has exported comparatively nothing. Such an export would indicate unparalleled wealth, but what is the fact? In the place of wealth, a universal pressure for money was felt, not enough for current expenses, the price of all property down, the country drooping, and languishing, towns and cities decaying, and the frugal habits of the people pushed to the verge of universal self-denial, for the preservation of their family estates. Such a result is a strange, and wonderful phenomenon. It calls upon statesmen to inquire into the cause. Under federal legislation, the exports of the South have been the basis of the federal revenue. Virginia, the two Carolinas, and Georgia, may be said to defray three-fourths, of the annual expense of supporting the federal government, and of this great sum, annually furnished by them, nothing, or next to nothing is returned to them, in the shape of government expenditures. That expenditure flows in an opposite direction, it flows northwardly, in one uniform, uninterrupted, and perennial stream. This is the reason why wealth disappears from the south and rises up in the north. Federal legislation does all this. It does it by the simple process of eternally taking from the south, and returning nothing to it. If it returns to the south the whole, or even a good part, of what it exacted, the four states south of the Potomac might stand the action of the system, but the south must be exhausted of its money, and its property, by a course of legislation, which is forever taking away, and never returning anything. Every new tariff increases the force of this action. No tariff has ever yet included Virginia, the two Carolinas, and Georgia, except to increase the burdens imposed upon them. This picture is not overdrawn, it is the literal truth. Before the war the northern states, and especially the New England states, exported next to nothing, and yet they blossomed as the rose. The picturesque hills of New England were dotted with costly mansions, erected with money, of which the southern planters had been despoiled, by means of the tariffs of which Mr. Benton spoke. Her harbors frowned with fortifications, constructed by the same means. Every cove and inlet had its lighthouse, for the benefit of New England shipping three-fourths of the expense of erecting which had been paid by the south, and even the cod, and mackerel fisheries of New England were bounted, on the bold pretext, that they were nurseries for manning the navy. The south resisted this wholesale robbery, to the best of her ability. Some few of the more generous of the northern representatives in Congress came to her aid, but still she was overborne, and the curious reader, who will take the pains to consult the statutes at large, of the American Congress, will find on an average, a tariff for every five years recorded on their pages, the cormorants increasing in rapacity, the more they devoured. No wonder that Mr. Lincoln when asked, why not let the South go? Replied, let the South go. Where then shall we get our revenue? This system of spoliation was commenced in 1816. The doctrine of protection was not, at first, boldly avowed. A heavy debt had been contracted during the War of 1812, with Great Britain, just then terminated. It became necessary to raise revenue to pay this debt, as well as to defray the current expenses of the government, and for these laudable purposes, the tariff of 1816 was enacted. The North had not yet become the overshadowing power, which it has become in our day. It was comparatively modest, and only asked, that, in adjusting the duties under the tariff, such incidental protection, as might not be inconsistent with the main object of the bill, to wit, the raising of revenue, should be given to northern manufactures. It was claimed that these manufactures had sprung up, swas bonte, during the war, and had materially aided the country in prosecuting the war, and that they would languish, 
and die, unless protected, in this incidental manner. This seemed but just and reasonable, and some of the ablest of our southern men gave their assent to the proposition, among others, Mr. Calhoun of South Carolina, and Mr. Clay of Kentucky. The latter, in particular, then a young member of the House of Representatives, espoused the northern side of the controversy, and subsequently became known, as we have seen, as the father of the system. Much undeserved obloquy has been thrown upon Mr. Clay, for this supposed abandonment of his section. The most that he claimed, was that temporary protection, of a few years duration only, should be given to these infant manufacturers, until they should become self-sustaining. In later life, when he saw the extent to which the measure was pushed, he did, indeed recoil from it, as Mr. Calhoun, with keener intellect, had done, years before. The wedge, being thus entered, was driven home by the insatiable North. In less than twenty years, or during the early part of General Jackson's administration, the public debt was paid off, and it became necessary to reduce the tariffs, to prevent a plethora in the public treasury, but the North, by this time, had waxed fat, and like the ox in the scriptures, began to kick. From incidental protection, it advanced, boldly, to the doctrine of protection, for the sake of protection thus avowing the unjust doctrine, that it was right to rob one section, for the benefit of the other, the pretense being the general good. The general welfare clause of the Constitution as well as the expression we, the people, in the preamble, being invoked to cover the enormity. Under the wholesale system of spoliation, which was now practiced, the South was becoming poorer, and poorer. Whilst her abundant cotton crops supplied all the exchanges of the country, and put in motion, throughout the North, every species of manufacturing industry, from the cut nail, which the planter put in the weatherboarding of his house, to the coach in which his wife, and daughters took an airing, it was found, that, from year to year, mortgages were increasing on her plantations, and that the planter was fast becoming little better, than the overseer of the northern manufacturer, and the northern merchant. A statesman of England once declared, that not so much as a hobnail should be manufactured, in America. The colonial dependence, and vassalage meant to be proclaimed by this expression, was now strictly true, as between the North, and the South. The South was compelled to purchase her hobnails, in the North, being excluded by the Northern tariffs, from all other markets. South Carolina, taking the alarm at this state of things, resorted as we have seen, to nullification, in 1832. The quarrel was compromised in 1833, by the passage of a more moderate tariff, but the North still growing, in strength, and wealth, disregarded the compromise, in 1842, and enacted a more oppressive tariff than ever. From this time onward, no attempt was made to conciliate the South, by the practice of forbearance, and justice, and the latter sank, hopelessly, into the condition of a tributary province to her more powerful rival. All this was done under a federal compact, formed by sovereign states, for their common benefit. Thus was the prophecy of Patrick Henry verified, when he said, But I am sure, that the dangers of this system, the federal constitution, are real, when those who have no similar interest with the people of this country, the South, are to legislate for us, when our dearest rights are to be left, in the hands of those, whose advantage it will be to infringe them and thus also, was verified the declaration of Charles Coatsworth Pinckney, of South Carolina, if they, the southern states, are to form so considerable a minority, and the regulation of trade is to be given to the general government, they will be nothing more than overseers of the northern states. Chapter 6. The Question of Slavery, as IT Affected Secession. Great pains have been taken, by the North to make it appear to the world, that the war was a sort of moral, and religious crusade against slavery. Such was not the fact. The people of the North were, indeed, opposed to slavery, but merely because they thought it stood in the way of their struggle for empire. I think it safe to affirm, that if the question had stood upon moral, 
and religious grounds alone, the institution would never have been interfered with. The Republican Party, which finally brought on the war, took its rise, as is well known, on the question of extending slavery to the territories, those in Shoate states, which were finally to decide the vexed question of the balance of power, between the two sections. It did not propose to disturb the institution in the states, in fact, the institution could do no harm there, for the states, in which it existed, were already in a hopeless minority. The fat, southern goose could not resist being plucked, as things stood, but it was feared that if slavery was permitted to go into the territories, the goose might become strong enough to resist being plucked. If proof were wanted of this, we have it, in the resolution passed by the Federal Congress, after the first battle of Manassas, in the first year of the war, as follows, resolved, that the war is not waged on our part, in any spirit of oppression, or for any purpose of conquest, or for interfering with the rights, or established institutions of these states, but to defend, and maintain the supremacy of the Constitution, and to preserve the Union, with all the dignity and rights of the several states unimpaired. In 1820, in the admission of Missouri into the Union, the North and the South had entered into a compromise, which provided, that slavery should not be carried into any of the territories, north of a given geographical line. This compromise was clearly violative of the rights of the South, for the territories were common property, which had been acquired, by the blood, and treasure, of the North and the South alike, and no discrimination could justly be made between the sections, as to emigration to those territories, but discrimination would be made, if the Northern man could emigrate to all of them, and the Southern man to those of them only that lay south of the given line. By the passage of the Kansas-Nebraska Bill, introduced into the House of Representatives, in 1854 by Mr. Stephen A. Douglas, this unjust compromise was repealed, the repealing clause declaring, that the Missouri Compromise being inconsistent with the principles of non-intervention, by Congress, with slavery in the states, and territories, as recognized by the legislation of 1850, commonly called the Compromise Measures, is hereby declared inoperative, and void, it being the true intent, and meaning of this act, not to legislate slavery into any territory, or state, nor to exclude it therefrom, but to leave the people thereof perfectly free to form, and regulate their domestic institutions, subject only to the Constitution of the United States. Nothing would seem more just, than the passage of this act, which removed the restriction which had been put upon a portion of the states, threw open the territories to immigration from all the states, alike, and left the question of local government, the question of slavery included, to be decided by the inhabitants of the territories themselves. But this act of justice, which Mr. Douglas had had the address and ability to cause to be passed, was highly distasteful to the northern people. It was not consistent with their views of empire that there should be any more southern slave states admitted into the Union. The Republican Party, which, up to that time, had made but little headway, now suddenly sprang into importance, and at the next elections in the North, swept everything before it. The Northern Democratic members of Congress who had voted for the hated measure, were beaten by overwhelming majorities, and Republicans sent in their places, and the Republican Convention which assembled at Chicago in 1860, to nominate a candidate for the presidency adopted as one of the planks of its platform to use a slang political phrase of the day, the principle that slavery should thereafter be excluded from the territories, not only from the territories north of the geographical line, of the Missouri Compromise, but from all the territories. The gauntlet of defiance was thus boldly thrown at the feet of the southern states. From 1816 to 1860, these states had been plundered by tariffs which had enriched the North, and now they were told without any circumlocution, that they should no longer have any share in the territories. I have said that this controversy, on the subject of slavery, did not rest, in the North, on any question of morals or religion. The end aimed at, in restricting slavery to the states, was purely political, but this end was to be accomplished by means, 
and the northern leaders had the sagacity to see, that it was all important to mix up the controversy, as a means, with moral, and religious questions. Hence they enlisted the clergy in their crusade against the south, the pulpit becoming a rostrum, from which to inflame the northern mind against the UN godly slaveholder, religious papers were established, which fulminated their weekly diatribes against the institution, magazine literature, fiction, lectures, by paid itinerants, were all employed, with powerful effect, in a community where every man sets himself up as a teacher, and considers himself responsible for the morals of his neighbor. The contumely and insult thus heaped upon the South were, of themselves, almost past endurance, to say nothing of the wrongs, under which she suffered. The sectional animosity which was engendered by these means, in the North, soon became intense, and hurried on the catastrophe with railroad speed. Whilst the dispute about slavery in the territories was drawing to a focus, another, and if possible, a still more exciting question, had been occupying the public mind, the rendition of fugitive slaves to their owners. Our ancestors, in the Convention of 1787, foreseeing the difficulty that was likely to arise on this subject, insisted that the following positive provision, for their protection, should be inserted in the Constitution, no person held to service, or labor, in one state, under the laws thereof, escaping into another, shall, in consequence of any law, or regulation therein, be discharged from such service, or labor, but shall be delivered up, on claim of the party to whom such service, or labor may be due. In 1793, a law, called the Fugitive Slave Law, had been passed, for the purpose of carrying out this provision of the Constitution. This law was re-enacted, with some alterations, the better to secure the object in question, in 1850. Neither of those laws was ever properly executed in the North. It soon became unsafe, indeed, for a southern man to venture into the North, in pursuit of his fugitive slave. Mr. Webster sought, in vain, in the latter part of his life, when he seemed to be actuated by a sense of returning justice to the South, to induce his countrymen to execute those laws and he lost much of his popularity, in consequence. The laws were not only positively disobeyed, but they were formally nullified by the legislatures of fourteen of the northern states, and penalties were annexed to any attempt to execute them. Mr. Webster, in speaking on this subject, says, these states passed acts defeating the law of Congress, as far as it was in their power to defeat it. Those of them to whom I refer, not all, but several, nullified the law of 1793. They said in effect, we will not execute it. No runaway slave shall be restored. Thus the law became a dead letter. But here was the constitution, and compact still binding, here was the stipulation, as solemn as words could form it, and which every member of Congress, every officer of the general government, every officer of the state government, from governors down to constables, is sworn to support. It has been said in the states of New York, Massachusetts, and Ohio, over and over again, that the law shall not be executed. That was the language in conventions, in Worcester, Massachusetts, in Syracuse, New York, and elsewhere. And for this they pledged their lives, their fortunes, and their sacred honors. Now, gentlemen, these proceedings, I say it upon my professional reputation, are distinctly too reasonable. And the act of taking Shadrick, a fugitive slave, from the public authorities, in Boston, and sending him off, was an act of clear reason. Great outcry was raised against South Carolina when she nullified the tariff law of 1830, passed in clear violation of the spirit of the Constitution. Here we see fourteen states nullifying an act, passed to carry out an express provision of the same instrument, about which there was not, and could not be any dispute. Let us again put Mr. Webster on the witness stand, and hear what he says, was the effect of this wholesale nullification by the northern states of this provision of the Constitution. I do not hesitate, says he, to say, and repeat, that if the northern states refuse willfully, 
and deliberately to carry into effect that part of the Constitution, which respects the restoration of fugitive slaves, the South would be no longer bound to keep the compact. A bargain broken on one side is broken on all sides. That was spoken like Daniel Webster, the able jurist, and just man, and not like the Daniel Webster, whom I have before quoted, in these pages, as the casuist, and the sophist. The reader cannot fail to see what a full recantation we have here, of Mr. Webster's heresy, of 1833, when he contended that the Constitution had been ordained and established, by the people of the United States, in the aggregate, as one nation. Mr. Webster now calls the states, the parties to the instrument, and claims that the infraction of it, by some of the states, releases the others from their obligations under it. It is then, after all, it seems, a federal compact, and if it be such, we have the authority of Mr. Webster, himself, for saying that the states may withdraw from it, at pleasure, without waiting for an infringement of it, by their co-states. But the southern states did not desire to withdraw from it, without reason. They were sincerely attached to the Union, and were willing to suffer, and endure much rather than that it should be destroyed. They had stood, shoulder to shoulder, with the North in two wars against the mother country, and had freely spent their wealth, and shed their blood in defense of the common rights. They had rushed to the defense of New England, in the War of the Revolution, and had equally responded to her call in 1812, in defense of her shipping interest. Mr. Madison relied much upon these ties, as a common bond of union. When Patrick Henry and other Southern patriots were warning their people against the new alliance, proposed to them in the Federal Constitution, he spoke the following fervid language in reply to them, in one of the numbers of the Federalist. Hearken not to the unnatural voice, which tells you, that the people of America, knit together, as they are, by so many natural cords of affection, can no longer live together as members of the same family, can no longer continue mutual guardians of their mutual happiness. No, my countrymen, shut your ears against this unhallowed language. Shut your hearts against the poison which it conveys. The kindred blood which flows in the veins of American citizens, the mingled blood which they have shed in defense of their sacred rights, consecrate their union, and excite horror at the idea of their becoming aliens, rivals, enemies. Much of this feeling still lingered in the bosoms of Southern men. They were slow to awaken from this stream of delusion. A rude and rough hand had been necessary to disenchant them. But they were compelled, in spite of themselves, to realize the fact at last, that they had been deceived, and betrayed into the federal compact, that they might be made slaves. Like an unhappy bride, upon whose brow the orange wreath had been placed, by hands that promised tenderness, and protection, the South had been rudely scorned, and repelled, and forced, in tears, and bitter lamentation, to retract the faith which she had plighted. To carry still further our simile, like the deceived, and betrayed bride, the least show of relenting, and tenderness was sufficient to induce the South to forgive, and to endeavor to forget. The history of our unhappy connection with the North is full of compromises, and apparent reconciliations, prominent among which was the Compromise of 1833, growing out of the nullification of South Carolina, on the tariff question, and the Compromise of 1850, in which it was promised, that Congress should not interfere with the question of slavery, either in the states, or territories. The South, like the too credulous bride, accepted these evidences of returning tenderness, in good faith, the North, like the coarse and brutal husband, whose selfishness was superior to his sense of justice, withdrew them, almost as soon as made. The obnoxious laws which had been modified, or repealed, under these compromises, were re-enacted with additional provocations, and restrictions. So loath was the South to abandon the Union, that she made strenuous efforts to remain in it, even after Mr. Lincoln had been elected president, in 1860. In this election, the dreaded sectional line against which President Washington had warned his countrymen, in his farewell address, 
had at last been drawn, in it, the fire bell of the night, which had so disturbed the last days of Jefferson, had been sounded. The had, at last, arisen a united north, against a united south. Mr. Lincoln had been placed by the Chicago Convention on a platform so purely sectional, that no southern state voted, or could vote for him. His election was purely geographical, it was tantamount to a denial of the co-equality of the southern states, with the northern states, in the Union, since it drove the former out of the common territories. This had not been a mere party squabble, the questions involved had been federal, and fundamental notwithstanding which, some of the southern states were not without hope, that the north might be induced to revoke its verdict. Mr. Crittenden, of Kentucky, introduced into the Senate, a series of resolutions, which he hoped would have the effect of restoring harmony, the chief feature of which was, the restoration of the Missouri Compromise, giving the southern states access to the territories south of a geographical line. Although this compromise was a partial abandonment of the rights of the South, many of the ablest, and most influential statesmen of that section, gave in their adhesion to it, among others, Mr. Jefferson Davis. The measure failed. Various other resolutions, looking to pacification, were introduced into both houses of Congress, but they failed, in like manner. The border slave states aroused to a sense of their danger for by this time, several of the Gulf states had seceded, called a convention in the city of Washington, to endeavor to allay the storm. A full representation attended, composed of men, venerable for their years, and renowned for their patriotic services, but their labors ended also in failure, Congress scarcely deigned to notice them. In both houses of Congress the Northern faction, which had so recently triumphed in the election of their president, was arrayed in a solid phalanx of hostility to the South, and could not be moved an inch. The Puritan leaven had at last leavened the whole loaf, and the descendants of those immigrants who had come over to America, in the Mayflower, feeling that they had the power to crush a race of men, who had dared to differ with them in opinion, and to have interests separate and apart from them, were resolved to use that power in a way to do no discredit to their ancestry. Rebels, when in a minority, they had become tyrants, now that they were in a majority. Nothing remained to the South, but to raise the gantlet which had been thrown at her feet. The federal government which had been established by our ancestors had failed of its object. Instead of binding the states together, in peace, and amity, it had, in the hands of one portion of the states, become an engine of oppression of the other portion. It so happened, that the slavery question was the issue which finally tore them asunder, but, as the reader has seen, this question was a mere means, to an end. The end was empire, and we were about to repeat, in this hemisphere, the drama which had so often been enacted in the other, of a more powerful nation crushing out a weaker. The war of the American sections was but the prototype of many other wars, which had occurred among the human race. It had its origin in the unregenerated nature of man, who is only an intellectual wild beast, whose rapacity has never yet been restrained, by a sense of justice. The American people thought, when they framed the Constitution, that they were to be an exception to mankind, in general. History had instructed them that all other peoples, who had gone before them, had torn up paper governments, when paper was the only bulwark that protected such governments, but then they were the American people, and no such fate could await them. The events which I have recorded, and am about to record, have taught them, that they are no better, and perhaps they are no worse, than other people. It is to be hoped that they will profit by their dear bought experience, and that when they shall have come to their senses, and undertake to lay the foundation of a new government, they will, if they design to essay another republic, eliminate all discordant materials. The experiment of trusting to human honesty having failed, they must next trust to human interests, the great regulator, as all philosophy teaches, of human nature. They must listen rather to the philosophy of Patrick Henry, than to that of James Madison, and never attempt again to bind up in one sheaf with a wither of straw, 
materials so discordant as were the people of the North, and the people of the South. Chapter 7 The formation of the Confederate government, and the resignation of officers of the Federal Army and Navy. As I am not writing a history of the war, but only of a very small portion of the war, it cannot be expected that I will follow events in a connected train. I have detained the reader, so far, as to give him a continuous, though hasty glance, of the causes of the war, but having brought him down to the final rupture of the sections, I must leave him to supply for himself many a link, here and there, in the broken chain, as we proceed. Let him imagine then that the southern states have seceded, the gallant little state of South Carolina setting her larger, and more powerful sisters, the example, on the 20th of December, 1860, and that they have met at Montgomery, in Alabama, by their delegates in Congress, to form a new confederacy, that a provisional government has been formed and that Mr. Jefferson Davis has been elected president, and Mr. Alexander H. Stevens vice president. The time had now come for the officers of the old army, and navy to make their election, as to which of the two governments they would give their adhesion. There were no such questions then, as rebellion, and treason in the public mind. This was a federal afterthought, when that government began to get the better of us in the war. The Puritan, if he had been whipped, would have been a capital secessionist, and as meek, and humble as we could have desired. He would have been the first to make a perpetual alliance with us, and to offer us inducements to give him the benefits of our trade. After the first drubbing we gave him, at Manassas, he was disposed to be quite reasonable, and the Federal Congress passed the conciliatory resolution I have quoted in a previous chapter, intimating to us, that if we would come back, slavery should be secure in the states, and our rights and dignity remain unimpaired. But as he gained strength, he gained courage, and as the war progressed, and it became evident that we should be beaten, he began to talk of traitors, and treason. As a general rule, the officers both of the army, and the navy sided with their respective states, especially those of them who were cultivated, and knew something of the form of government, under which they had been living. But even the profession of arms is not free from sordid natures and many of these had found their way into both branches of the public service. Men were found capable of drawing their swords against their own firesides, as it were, and surrendering their neighbors, and friends to the vengeance of a government, which paid them for their fealty. Some, with cunning duplicity, even encouraged their former messmates, and companions who occupied places above them, to resign, and afterward held back themselves. Some were mere soldiers, and sailors of fortune, and seemed devoid of all sensibility on the subject, looking only to rank and pay. They were open to the highest bidder, and the federal government was in a condition to make the highest bids. Some of the southern men of this latter class remained with the north, because they could not obtain the positions they desired in the south, and afterward, as is the fashion with renegades became more bitter against their own people than even the northern men. Civil war is a terrible crucible through which to pass character, the dross drops away from the pure metal at the first touch of the fire. It must be admitted, indeed, that there was some little nerve required, on the part of an officer of the regular army, or navy, to elect to go with his state. His profession was his only fortune, he depended upon it, for the means of subsisting himself and family. If he remained where he was, a competency for life, and promotion, and honors probably awaited him, if he went with the South, a dark, and uncertain future was before him, he could not possibly better his condition, and if the South failed, he would have thrown away the labor of a lifetime. The struggle was hard in other respects. All professions are clannish. Men naturally cling together, who have been bred to a common pursuit and this remark is particularly applicable to the army, and the navy. West Point, and Annapolis were powerful bonds to knit together the hearts of young men. Friendships were the formed, which it was difficult to sever, especially when strengthened by years of after association, in common toils, common pleasures, and common dangers. Naval officers, in particular, who had been rocked together in the same storm, 
and had escaped perhaps from the same shipwreck, found it very difficult to draw their swords against each other. The flag, too, had a charm which it was difficult to resist. It had long been the emblem of the principle that all just governments are founded on the consent of the governed, vindicated against our British ancestors, in the War of the Revolution, and it was difficult to realize the fact that it no longer represented this principle, but had become the emblem of its opposite, that of coercing unwilling states, to remain under a government, which they deemed unjust and oppressive. Sentiment had almost as much to do with the matter, as principle, for the clustered around the old flag, a great many hallowed memories, of sacrifices made, and victories won. The cadet at West Point had marched and countermarched under its folds, dreaming of future battlefields, and future honors to be gained in upholding and defending it, and the midshipman, as he gazed upon it, in some foreign port, flying proudly from the gaff end of his ship, had drunk in new inspiration to do and to dare, for his country. Many bearded men were affected almost to tears, as they saw this once hallowed emblem hauled down from the flag staves, of southern forts, and arsenals. They were in the condition of one who had been forced, in spite of himself, to realize the perfidy of a friend, and to be obliged to give him up, as no longer worthy of his confidence or affection. General Robert T. Lee has so happily expressed all these various emotions, in a couple of letters, which he wrote, contemporaneously, with his resignation from the Federal Army, that I give them to the reader. One of these letters is addressed to General Winfield Scott, and the other to General Lee's sister. Arlington, Va, April 20, 1861. General Colon since my interview with you on the 18th instant, I have felt that I ought not longer to retain my commission in the army. I therefore tender my resignation, which I request you will recommend for acceptance. It would have been presented at once, but for the struggle which it has cost me to separate myself from a service, to which I have devoted all the best years of my life, and all the ability I possessed. During the whole of that time, more than a quarter of a century, I have experienced nothing but kindness from my superiors, and the most cordial friendship from my comrades. To no one, General, have I been as much indebted as yourself, for uniform kindness and consideration, and it has always been my ardent desire to merit your approbation. I shall carry to the grave the most grateful recollection of your kind consideration, and your name and fame will always be dear to me. Save in defense of my native state, I never desire to draw my sword. Be pleased to accept my most earnest wishes for the continuance of your happiness and prosperity, and believe me most truly yours. R. E. Lee. Lieutenant General Winfield Scott. Commanding United States Army. Arlington, Va, April 20, 1861. My dear sister Colon I am grieved at my inability to see you I have been waiting for a more convenient season, which has brought to many before me deep and lasting regrets. Now we are in a state of war which will yield to nothing. The whole South is in a state of revolution, into which Virginia after a long struggle, has been drawn, and though I recognize no necessity for this state of things, and would have forborne and pleaded to the end, for redress of grievances, real or supposed, yet in my own person I had to meet the question, whether I should take part against my native state. With all my devotion to the Union, and the feeling of loyalty, and duty of an American citizen, I have not been able to make up my mind to raise my hand against my relatives, my children, my home. I have therefore resigned my commission in the army, and save in defense of my native state with the sincere hope that my services may never be needed, I hope I may never be called on to draw my sword. I know you will blame me, but you must think as kindly of me as you can, and believe that I have endeavored to do what I thought right. To show you the feeling and struggle it has cost me, I send a copy of my letter to General Scott, which accompanied my letter of resignation. I have no time for more. May God guard and protect you, and yours and shower upon you every blessing is the prayer of your devoted brother. R. E. Lee. 
In the winter of 1860, I was stationed in the city of Washington, as the secretary of the Lighthouse Board, being then a commander in the United States Navy, and was an observer of many of the events I have described. I had long abandoned all hope of reconciliation between the sections. The public mind, north and south, was in an angry mood, and the day of compromises was evidently at an end. I had made up my mind to retire from the federal service, at the proper moment, and was only waiting for that moment to arrive. Although I had been born in the state of Maryland, and was reared on the banks of the Potomac, I had been, for many years, a resident citizen of Alabama, having removed to this state, in the year 1841, and settled with my family, on the west bank of the Perdido, removing thence, in a few years, to Mobile. My intention of retiring from the Federal Navy, and taking service with the South, in the coming struggle, had been made known to the delegation in the Federal Congress from Alabama, early in the session of 1861. I did not doubt that Maryland would follow the lead of her more southern sisters, as the cause of quarrel was common with all the southern states, but whether she did or not, could make no difference with me now, since my allegiance, and my services had become due to another state. The month of February, 1861, found me still at the city of Washington. The following extract from a letter written by me to a southern member of the Federal Congress temporarily absent from his post, will show the state of mind in which I was looking upon passing events. I am still at my post at the Lighthouse Board, performing my routine duties, but listening with an aching ear and beating heart, for the first sounds of the great disruption which is at hand. On the fourteenth of that month, whilst sitting quietly with my family, after the labours of the day, a messenger brought me the following telegram. Montgomery, February 14, 1861. Sir Colon on behalf of the Committee on Naval Affairs, I beg leave to request that you will repair to this place, at your earliest convenience. Your obedient servant. C. M. Conrad, Chairman. Commander Raphael Semmes, Washington, D. C. Here was the sound for which I had been so anxiously listening. Secession was now indeed a reality and the time had come for me to arouse myself to action. The telegram threw my small family circle into great commotion. My wife, with the instincts of a woman, a wife, and a mother, seemed to realize, as by intuition, all the dangers and difficulties that lay before me. She had been hoping without hope, that I would not be subjected to the bitter ordeal, but the die was now cast, and with a few tears and many prayers she nerved herself for the sacrifices, and trials that she knew were before her. Her children were to be withdrawn from school, her comfortable home broken up, and she was to return, penniless, to her people, to abide with them the fortunes of a bloody, and a doubtful war. The heroism of woman! How infinitely it surpasses that of man! With all her gentleness, and tenderness, and natural timidity, in nine cases in ten, she has more nerve than the other sex, in times of great emergency. With a bleeding and bursting heart, she is capable of putting on the composure, and lovely serenity of an angel, binding up the wounds of a husband or son, and when he is restored to health and vigor, buckling on his sword anew, and returning him to the battlefield. Glorious women of the South! What an ordeal you have passed through! and how heroically you have stood the trying test. You lost the liberty which your husbands, sires, and sons struggled for, but only for a period. The blood which you will have infused into the veins of future generations will yet rise up to vindicate you, and call you blessed. The telegram reached me about four o'clock, p. m., and I responded to it, on the same evening as follows. Washington, February 14, 1861. Honorable C. M. Conrad, Chairman of the Committee on Naval Affairs, Congress of the Confederate States colon dispatch received, I will be with you immediately. Respectfully, and C. R. Sems. The next morning, I repaired, as usual, to the office of the Lighthouse Board, 
in the Treasury Building, General John A. Dix being then the Secretary of the Treasury, and ex officio President of the Board, and wrote the following resignation of my commission, as a commander in the United States Navy. Washington, D. C., February 15, 1861. Sir Colon I respectfully tender through you, to the President of the United States, this, the resignation of the commission which I have the honor to hold as a commander in the Navy of the United States. In severing my connection with the Government of the United States, and with the department over which you preside, I pray you to accept my thanks for the kindness which has characterized your official deportment towards me. I have the honor to be very respectfully your obedient servant. Raphael Semmes. Commander U.S. Navy. Honorable Isaac C. Secretary of the Navy. Washington, D. C. On the same day, I received the following acceptance of my resignation. Navy Department, February 15, 1861. Sir Colon your resignation as a commander in the Navy of the United States, tendered in your letter of this date, is hereby accepted. I am respectfully your obedient servant. I too see. Raphael Semmes, Esquire, Late Commander. U.S. Navy, Washington. A few days previously to my resignation, by the death of a lamented member of the Lighthouse Board, I had been promoted from the Secretaryship, to a membership of that board, and it now became necessary for me to inform the board officially, of my being no longer a member of it which I did in the following communication. Washington, D. C., February 16, 1861. Sir Colon I have the honor to inform you, that I have resigned my commission, as a commander in the Navy of the United States, and that, as a consequence, I am no longer a member of the Lighthouse Board. In severing thus my connection with the board, at which I have had the honor to hold a seat, since the 17th of November, 1858, I desire to say to the members, individually, and collectively, that I shall carry with me to my home in the South, a grateful recollection of the amenities, and courtesies which have characterized, on their part, our official intercourse. I am very respectfully your obedient servant. Raphael Semmes. Commander T. A. Jenkins, U. S. N. Secretary Lighthouse Board, Washington. I left in the Lighthouse Board, a South Carolinian, and a Virginian, both of whom were too loyal to their places, to follow the lead of their states. The South Carolinian has been rewarded with the commission of a Rear Admiral, and the Virginian with that of a Commodore. The presence of these gentlemen in the Board may account for the fact, that my letter was not even honored with an acknowledgement of its receipt. I have said that there was no talk at this time, about traitors, and treason. The reader will observe how openly, and as a matter of course, all these transactions were conducted. The seceded states had been several months in getting their conventions together, and repealing, with all due form, and ceremony, the ordinances by which the federal constitution had been accepted. Senators and members of the House of Representatives of the Federal Congress had withdrawn from their seats, under circumstances unusually solemn, and impressive, which had attracted the attention of the whole country. Mr. Jefferson Davis, in particular, had taken leave of a full Senate, with crowded galleries, in a speech of great dignity and power, in the course of which he said, We will invoke the God of our fathers, who delivered them from the power of the lion to protect us from the ravages of the bear, and thus putting our trust in God, and in our own firm hearts, and strong arms, we will vindicate the right as best we may. As the resignation of each officer of the army, and navy went in, it was well understood what his object was, and yet we have seen, that up to this period, the government accepted them all, and permitted the officers to depart to their respective states. It was not known, as yet, to what extent the disintegration might go, and it was not safe therefore to talk of treason. The wayward sisters might decide to go in a body, in which event it would not have been policy to attempt to prevent them, or to discuss questions of treason with them. 
The Secretary of the Navy did not think of arresting me, for telegraphing to the Congress of the Confederate States, that I would be with it, immediately, nor did he, though he knew my purpose of drawing my sword against the Federal Government, if necessary, refuse to accept my resignation. Nay, President Buchanan had decided that he had no power under the Federal Constitution, to coerce a state, though, like a weak old man as he had now become. He involved himself afterward in the inconsistency of attempting to hold possession of the ceded places within the limits of the states which had withdrawn from the Union. It could not but follow, logically, from the premise, that there was no power in the Federal Constitution to coerce a state, that the state had the right to secede, for clearly anyone may do that which no one has the right to prevent him from doing. It was under such circumstances as these, that I dissolved my connection with the federal government, and returned to the condition of a private citizen, with no more obligation resting upon me, than upon any other citizen. The federal government, itself, had formally released me from the contract of service I had entered into with it, and, as a matter of course, from the binding obligation of any oath I had taken in connection with that contract. All this was done, as the reader has seen, before I moved a step from the city of Washington, and yet a subsequent Secretary of the Navy, Mr. Gideon Wells, has had the hardihood and indecency of accusing me of having been a deserter from the service. He has deliberately put this false accusation on record, in a public document, in face of the facts I have stated, all of which were recorded upon the rolls of his office. I do not speak here of the claptrap he has used about treason to the flag, and the other stale nonsense which he has uttered in connection with my name, for this was common enough among his countrymen, and was perhaps to have been expected from men smarting under the castigation I had given them, but of the more definite and explicit charge, of deserting from the service, when the service, itself, as he well knew, had released me from all my obligations to it. Another charge, with as little foundation, has been made against myself, and other officers of the army and navy, who resigned their commissions, and came south. It has been said that we were in the condition of elevs of the federal government, inasmuch as we had received our education at the military schools, and that we were guilty of ingratitude to that government, when we withdrew from its service. This slander has no doubt had its effect, with the ignorant masses but it can scarcely have been entertained by anyone who has a just conception of the nature of our federal system of government. It loses sight of the fact, that the states are the creators, and the federal government the creature, that not only the military schools, but the federal government itself belongs to the states. Whence came the fund for the establishment of these schools? From the states. In what proportion did the states contribute it? Mr. Benton has answered this question, as the reader has seen, when he was discussing the effect of the tariffs under which the South had so long been depleted. He has told us, that four states alone, Virginia, the two Carolinas and Georgia, defrayed three-fourths of the expenses of the general government, and taking the whole South into view, this proportion had even increased since his day, up to the breaking out of the war. Of every appropriation, then, that was made by Congress for the support of the military schools, three-fourths of the money belonged to the southern states. Did these states send three-fourths of the students to those schools? Of course not, this would have been something like justice to them. But justice to the southern states was no part of the scheme of the federal government. With the exception of a few cadets, and midshipmen at large, whom the president was authorized to appoint, the intention being that he should appoint the sons of deceased officers of the army and navy, but the fact being that he generally gave the appointment to his political friends, the appointments to these schools were made from the several states, in proportion to population, and as a matter of course, the north got the lion's share. But supposing the states to have been equally represented in those schools, what would have been the result? Why? simply that the South not only educated her own boys, but educated three-fourths of the northern boys, to boot. Virginia, for instance, at the same time that she sent young Robert E. Lee to West Point, to be educated, 
put in the public treasury not only money enough to pay for his education, and maintenance, but for the education and maintenance of three Massachusetts boys. How ungrateful of Lee, afterward, being thus a charity scholar of the North, to draw his sword against her. Chapter 8 Author proceeds to Montgomery, and reports to the new government, and is dispatched northward, on a special mission. On the evening of the 16th of February, the day after I had resigned my commission, I took a sorrowful leave of my family, and departed for Montgomery, by the way of Fredericksburg and Richmond. Virginia and North Carolina had not yet seceded, and anxious debates were going on, on the all-absorbing question, in each town and village in these two states, through which I passed. It was easy to see, that the great majority of the people were with the extreme South, in this her hour of need, but there were some time servers and trimmers, who still talked of conciliation, and of guarantees. They inquired eagerly after news from Washington, at all the stations at which the train stopped, and seemed disappointed when they found we had nothing more to tell them, than they had already learned through the telegraph. On the evening of the 18th, I entered the level tract of pine lands between West Point, and Montgomery. The air had become soft, and balmy, though I had left a region of frosts, and snow, only two days before. The pine woods were on fire as we passed through them, the flames now and then running up a lightwood tree, and throwing a weird and fitful glare upon the passing train. The scene was peculiarly southern, and reminded me that I was drawing near my home, and my people, and I mechanically repeated to myself the words of the poet. Breathes there a man with soul so dead? Who never to himself hath said. This is my own, my native land. And my heart, which up to that moment, had felt as though a heavy weight were pressing upon it, began to give more vigorous speeds, and send a more inspiring current through my veins. Under this happy influence I sank, as the night advanced, and the train thundered on, into the first sound sleep which had visited my weary eyelids, since I had resigned my commission, and read at the foot of the letter accepting my resignation, my name inscribed as plain Esquire this night ride, through the burning pine woods of Alabama, afterward stood as a great gulf in my memory, forming an impassable barrier, as it were, between my past, and my future life. It had cost me pain to cross the gulf, but once crossed, I never turned to look back. When I washed and dressed for breakfast, in Montgomery, the next morning, I had put off the old man, and put on the new. The labors, and associations of a lifetime had been inscribed in a volume, which had been closed, and a new book, whose pages were as yet all blank, had been opened. My first duty was to put myself in communication with Mr. Conrad, the chairman of the Committee of Naval Affairs. Several naval officers had preceded me to the seat of the new government, and others were arriving. It was agreed that there should be a special meeting on the next day, in joint session, of the two committees, on military and naval affairs. The Confederate Congress was in session in the state capital, and about noon, I repaired thither to witness the spectacle. They did me the honor to admit me to the floor, and upon casting my eyes over the August assembly, I recognized a number of familiar faces. General Howell Cobb of Georgia was the president, Toombs, Crawford, and other distinguished men were there from the same state. Curry, McRae, Robert H. Smith and other able men were there from Alabama. In short the Congress was full of the best talent of the South. It was by far the best Congress that ever assembled under the new government. It was a convention as well as a Congress, since it was charged with the establishment of a provisional government. Everyone realized the greatness of the crisis that was upon us, and hence the very best men in the community had been selected to meet the emergency. The harmony of the body was equal to its ability, for, in the course of a few weeks, it had put the complicated machinery of a government in motion, and was already taking active measures for defense, in case the federal power should decide upon making war upon us. Mr. Davis, the provisional president, had preceded me to the capital, only a few days, and my next step was to call upon him. 
I had known him in the city of Washington. He received me kindly, and almost the first question which he asked me, was whether I had disembarrassed myself of my federal commission. I replied to him that I had done so, as a matter of course, before leaving Washington, and that my allegiance henceforth belonged to the new government, and to the southern people. He seemed gratified at this declaration, and entered into a free, and frank conversation with me, on the subject of the want of preparation for defense, in which he found our states, and the great labor that lay before us, to prepare for emergencies. Congress, he said, has not yet had time to organize a navy, but he designed to make immediate use of me, if I had no objection. I told him that my services were at his command, in any capacity he thought fit to employ them. He then explained to me his plan of sending me back to the city of Washington, and thence into the northern states, to gather together, with as much haste as possible, such persons, and materials of war as might be of most pressing necessity. The persons alluded to, were to be mechanics skilled in the manufacture, and use of ordnance, and rifle machinery, the preparation of fixed ammunition, percussion caps, and c. So exclusively had the manufacture of all these articles for the use of the United States, been confined to the North, under the best government the world ever saw, that we had not even percussion caps enough to enable us to fight a battle, or the machines with which to make them, although we had captured all the forts, and arsenals within our limits, except Fort Sumter and Fort McRae. The President was as calm and unmoved as I had ever seen him and was living in a very simple, and unpretending style at the Exchange Hotel. He had not yet selected all his cabinet, nor indeed had he so much as a private secretary at his command, as the letter of instructions which he afterward presented me, for my guidance, was written with his own hand. This letter was very full, and precise, frequently descending into detail, and manifesting an acquaintance with bureau duties, scarcely to have been expected from one who had occupied his exalted positions. On the next day, I attended the joint session of the two committees above named. These committees were composed, as was to have been expected, of some of the best men of the Congress. Conrad, Crawford, Curry, and the brilliant young Bartow of Georgia were present among others whose names I do not now recall. But few naval officers of any rank had as yet withdrawn from the old service, Rousseau, Tatnall, Ingram, and Randolph were all the captains, and Farrand, Brent, Semmes, and Hartstone were all the commanders. Of these there were present before the committees, besides myself, Rousseau, Ingram, and Randolph, Major William H. Chase, late of the engineers of the Federal Army, was also present. Randolph commanded the Navy Yard at Pensacola, and chased the military defenses. We discussed the military and naval resources of the country, and devised such means of defense as were within our reach, which were not many, to enable us to meet the most pressing exigencies of our situation, and separated after a session of several hours. I can do no more, of course than briefly glance at these things, as I am not writing, as before remarked, the history of the war. The next morning I called again on the President, received my instructions, and departed northward on the mission which had been assigned me. I will be brief in the description of this mission also. I stopped a day at Richmond, and examined the state arsenal, in charge of Captain Dimock, and the tree Degger Iron Works having been especially enjoined to report upon the present, and future capacity of these works for the casting of cannon, shot, shells, and sea. The establishment had already turned its attention in this direction, and I was gratified to find that it was capable of almost indefinite enlargement, and that it could be made a most valuable auxiliary to us. The reader will see how confidently we already reckoned upon the support of Virginia. Reaching Washington again, I visited the arsenal, and inspected such of its machinery as I thought worth my notice, particularly an improved percussion cap machine which I found in operation. I also held conferences with some mechanics, whom I desired to induce to go south. 
Whilst I was in Washington Mr. Abraham Lincoln, the newly elected President of the United States, arrived, for the purpose of being inaugurated. Being purely a sectional president, and feeling probably that he had no just right to rule over the South, he had come into the city by night, and in disguise, afraid to trust himself among a people of whom he claimed to be chief magistrate. Poor old General Winfield Scott was then verging toward senility, and second childhood, and had contributed no little, perhaps, to Mr. Lincoln's alarm. He had been gathering together troops for some days, in the federal capital, for the purpose of inaugurating, amid bayonets, a president of the United States. It had been the boast of the American people, heretofore, that their presidents did not need guards, but trusted wholly for their security, to the love, and confidence of their constituents, but the reign of peace, and goodwill was at an end, and the reign of the bayonet was to ensue. The rumbling of artillery through the streets of Washington, and the ring of grounded arms on the pavements, had sounded the death knell of liberty in these states for generations. Swarms of visitors from far and near, in the north and west, had flocked to Washington, to see their president inaugurated, and were proud of this spectacle of arms, too stupid to see its fearful significance. The auspicious day, the 4th of March, at length arrived, and whilst the glorious pageant is being prepared, whilst the windows and the house tops along Pennsylvania Avenue are being thronged with a motley population of men and women, come to see the show, whilst the president-elect, in a hollow square of bayonets, is marching toward the Capitol, the writer of these pages, having again taken leave of his family, was hurrying away from the desecration of a capital, which had been ceded by a too credulous Maryland, and Virginia, and which had been laid out by Washington. As I left the Baltimore depot, extra trains were still pouring their thousands into the streets of Washington. I arrived in New York, the next day, and during the next three weeks, visited the West Point Academy, whither I went to see a son, who was a cadet at the institution and who afterward became a major of light artillery, in the Confederate service, and made a tour through the principal workshops of New York, Connecticut, and Massachusetts. I found the people everywhere, not only willing, but anxious to contract with me. I purchased large quantities of percussion caps in the city of New York, and sent them by express without any disguise, to Montgomery. I made contracts for batteries of light artillery, powder, and other munitions, and succeeded in getting large quantities of the powder shipped. It was agreed between the contractors and myself, that when I should have occasion to use the telegraph, certain other words were to be substituted, for those of military import, to avoid suspicion. I made a contract, conditioned upon the approval of my government, for the removal to the southern states, of a complete set of machinery for rifling cannon with the requisite skilled workmen to put it in operation. Some of these men, who would thus have sold body, and soul to me, for a sufficient consideration, occupied high social positions, and were men of wealth. I dined with them, at their comfortable residences near their factories, where the music of boring out cannon, accompanied the clatter of the dishes, and the popping of champagne corks, and I had more than one business interview with gentlemen who occupied the most costly suites of apartments at the Astor House in New York City. Many of these gentlemen, being unable to carry out their contracts with the Confederate States because of the prompt breaking out of the war, afterward obtained lucrative contracts from the federal government, and became, in consequence, intensely loyal. It would be a quasi-breach of honor to disclose their names, as they dealt with me pretty much as conspirators against their government are wont to deal with the enemies of their government, secretly, and with an implied confidence that I would keep their secret. It is accordingly safe. In the meantime, the great revolution was progressing. Abraham Lincoln had delivered his inaugural address, with triple rows of bayonets between him, and the people to whom he was speaking, in which address he had puzzled his hearers, and was no doubt puzzled himself as to what he really meant. He was like President Buchanan, now he saw it, and now he didn't. He would not coerce the states, 
but he would hold on to the ceded places within their limits, and collect the public revenue. Texas, and Arkansas went out whilst I was in New York. The bulletin boards at the different newspaper offices were daily thronged by an unwashed multitude, in search of some new excitement. The northern public was evidently puzzled. It had at first rather treated secession as a joke. They did not think it possible that the southern people could be in earnest, in dissolving their connection with a people, so eminently proper as themselves, but they now began to waver in this opinion. Still they forbore any decided demonstration. Like sensible men they preferred waiting until they could see how large a bull they were required to take by the horns. Toward the latter part of my stay in New York I received the following letter from the Honorable Stephen R. Mallory, who had been appointed Secretary of the Navy, which branch of the public service had been organized since I had left Montgomery. Confederate States of America. Navy Department, Montgomery, Alabama, March 13, 1861. Commander Raphael Semmes. Sir Colon with the sanction of the President, I am constrained to impose upon you duties connected with this department, in addition to the important trusts with which you are charged, but I do so, upon the express understanding, that they are not to interfere with the performance of your special duties. I have received reliable information, that two, or more steamers, of a class desired for immediate service, may be purchased at, or near New York steamers of speed, light draft, and strength sufficient for at least one heavy gun. When I say to you, that they are designed to navigate the waters, and enter the bays, and inlets of the coast, from Charleston to the St. Mary's, and from Key West, to the Rio Grande, for coast defense, that their speed should be sufficient to give them, at all times, the ability to engage, or evade an engagement, and that eight or ten inch guns, with perhaps two thirty twos, or if not, two of smaller caliber should constitute their battery, your judgment will need no further guide. Be pleased, should your other important engagements permit, to make inquiries, in such manner as may not excite special attention, and give me such details as to cost, character, and see, as you may deem important. Under these instructions I made diligent search in the waters of New York, for such steamers as were wanted, but none could be found. The river, and Long Island sound boats were mere shells, entirely unfit for the purposes of war, and it was difficult to find any of the seagoing steamers, which combined the requisite lightness of draught, with the other qualities desired. March was now drawing to a close, the war cloud was assuming darker, and more portentous hues, and it soon became evident that my usefulness in the North was about to end. Men were becoming more shy of making engagements with me, and the federal government was becoming more watchful. The New York, and Savannah steamers were still running, curiously enough carrying the federal flag at the peak, and the Confederate flag at the fore, and in the last days of March, I embarked on board one of them, arriving in Montgomery on the 4th of April, just eight days before fire was opened upon Fort Sumter. During the short interval that elapsed between my arrival, and my going afloat, I was put in charge of the Lighthouse Bureau, the Confederate Congress having, upon my recommendation, established a bureau, with a single naval officer at its head, instead of the complicated machinery of a board, which existed in the old government. I had barely time to appoint the necessary clerks and open a set of books, before Fort Sumter was fired upon, and the toxin of war was sounded. Chapter 9 The Commissioning of the Sumter, the first Confederate States ship of war. Fort Sumter surrendered on the 13th of April. The next day was a gala day in Montgomery. We had driven an insolent enemy from one of the strongest positions in the South, and the people were all agog to hear the news. A large Confederate flag was displayed from a balcony of the War Office, and the Honorable L.P. Walker, the Secretary of War, announced in a brief speech, to the assembled multitude below, amid repeated cheering, and the waving of hats, and handkerchiefs, the welcome tidings. The Union men, who have become so numerous since the war, had, 
if any of them were in the city, slunk to their holes, and corners, and the air was redolent, alone, of southern patriotism, and southern enthusiasm. The driving of the enemy from Charleston Harbor, decided the fate of Virginia, which had been trembling in the balance for some days. The grand old state could no longer resist her generous impulses. Under a proclamation of President Lincoln the martial hosts of an enraged and vindictive North were assembling, to make war upon her sisters, and this was enough, her ordinance of secession was passed, by a very gratifying majority. Patrick Henry had become a prophet, and the beautiful, and touching apostrophe of James Madison to the kindred blood, and the mingled blood of the American people, which was given to the reader a few pages back had proved to be the mere chimera of an excited imagination. The effect of the surrender of Sumter in the North was beyond conception. A prominent leader of the public press of that section had said of the American flag, Tear down that flaunting lie. Half-mast the starry flag. Insult no sunny sky. With hate's polluted drag. Instantly, and as if by the touch of a magician's wand, the polluted rag became the rallying cry of the whole northern people, and of none more so, than of the very men who had thus denounced it. But there was method in this madness, the rag had only been polluted whilst it was the emblem of good faith between the north, and the south, whilst, in other words, it prevented the mad fanatics of the north from violating that slave property, which their ancestors had promised to our ancestors, in the solemn league and covenant of the constitution, should forever remain inviolate. But now that the rag, instead of being an obstacle, might be made the means of accomplishing their designs, it was no longer necessary to pull it down. The moment it was fired upon, it became, in their eyes, a new flag, and the symbol of a new faith. It was no longer to represent the federative principle, or to protect the rights of states. It was henceforth to wave over yelling, and maddened majorities, whose will was to be both constitution, and law. Strange that the thinking portion of the northern people did not see this, strange that the hitherto conservative Democratic Party did not see it. Or was it that the whole north had been wearing a mask, and that the mask was now no longer available, or desirable, to hide their treachery? Perhaps the future historian, in calmer moments when the waves of passion engendered by the late storm shall have sunk to rest, will be better able to answer this question. For the present it is sufficient to record the fact, mortifying, it must be confessed, to poor human nature, that our quondam friends, without so many as half a dozen exceptions in a whole nation, I speak, of course, of prominent men, went over to the common enemy. The very men who had stood, shoulder to shoulder, with us, in resisting northern aggression, who had encouraged us with pen, and voice, to resist, if need be, unto the death, who promised in case of secession, to stand between us, and the march of northern armies of invasion, instantly, and without even the salvo to their consciences of circumlocution, changed their political faith of a lifetime, and became, if not straight out republicans, at least blatant war democrats. The reader cannot be at a loss to account for this change. It was caused by the purest, and most refined selfishness. Next to the love of wealth, the love of office may be said to be the distinguishing passion of the American people. In the hands of a skillful office seeker, patriotism is a mere word with which to delude the ignorant masses, and not a sentiment, or a creed, to be really entertained. Our allies in the North were very patriotic whilst there were still hopes of preserving the Union, and along with it the prospect of office, by the aid of the Southern people, but the moment the Southern states went out, and it became evident that they would be politically dead, unless they recanted their political faith, it was seen that they had no intention of becoming martyrs. Their motto, on the contrary, became sauve qui pot, and the D, L take the hindmost, and the banks of the new political Jordan were at once crowded with a multitude anxious to be dipped in its regenerating waters. As the tidings of these doings in the north were flashed to us, over the wires, in Montgomery, it became evident to me, that the Lighthouse Bureau was no longer to be thought of. It had become necessary for every man, 
who could wield a sword, to draw it in defense of his country, thus threatened by the swarming hordes of the north, and to leave the things of peace to the future. I had already passed the prime of life, and was going gently down that declivity, at whose base we all arrive, sooner or later, but I thanked God, that I had still a few years before me, and vigor enough of constitution left, to strike in defense of the right. I at once sought an interview with the Secretary of the Navy, and explained to him my desire to go afloat. We had, as yet, nothing that could be called a navy, not a ship indeed, if we except a few river steamers, that had been hastily armed by some of the states, and turned over, by them, to the Navy Department. The naval officers, who had come south, had brought with them nothing but their poverty, and their swords, all of them who had been in command of ships, at the secession of their respective states, having, from a sense of honor, delivered them back to the federal government. If a sense of justice had presided at the separation of the states, a large portion of the ships of the navy would have been turned over to the south, and this failing to be done, it may be questionable whether the southern naval officers, in command, would not have been justified in bringing their ships with them which it would have been easy for them to do. But, on the other hand, they had been personally entrusted with their commands, by the federal government, and it would have been treason to a military principle, if not to those great principles which guide revolutions, to deliver those commands to a different government. Perhaps they decided correctly, at all events, a military, or naval man, cannot go very far astray, who abides by the point of honor. Shortly before the war cloud had arisen so ominously above the political horizon, I had written a letter to a distinguished member of the Federal Congress from the South, in reply to one from himself, giving him my views as to the naval policy of our section, in case things should come to a crisis. I make no apology to the reader for presenting him with the following extract from that letter, bearing upon the subject, which we have now in hand. You ask me to explain what I mean by an irregular naval force. I mean a well-organized system of private armed ships, called privateers. If you are warred upon at all, it will be by a commercial people, whose ability to do you harm will consist chiefly in ships, and shipping. It is at ships and shipping, therefore, that you must strike, and the most effectual way to do this, is, by means of the irregular force of which I speak. Private cupidity will always furnish the means for this description of warfare, and all that will be required of you will be to put it under sufficient legal restraints, to prevent it from degenerating into piracy, and becoming an abuse. Even New England ships, and New England capital would be at your service, in abundance. The system of privateering would be analogous to the militia system on the land. You could have a large irregular sea force to act in aid of the regular naval force, so long as the war lasted, and which could be disbanded, without further care or expense, at the end of the war. Wealth is necessary to the conduct of all modern wars, and I naturally turned my eyes, as indicated in the above letter, to the enemy's chief source of wealth. The ingenuity, enterprise, and natural adaptation of the northern people to the sea, and seafaring pursuits had enabled them, aided by the vast resources, which they had filched, under pretense of legislation, from the south, to build up, in the course of a very few years, a commercial marine that was second only to that of Great Britain, in magnitude and importance. The first decked vessel that had been built in the United States, was built by one Adrian Block, a Dutch skipper, on the banks of the Hudson, in 1614, and in 1860, or in less than two centuries and a half, the Great Republic was competing with England, the history of whose maritime enterprise extended back a thousand years, for the carrying trade of the world. This trade, if it permitted to continue, would be a powerful means of sustaining the credit of the enemy, and enabling him to carry on the war. Hence it became an object of the first necessity with the Confederate States, to strike at his commerce, I enlarged upon this necessity, in the interview A I was now holding with Mr. Mallory, and I was gratified to find that that able officer agreed with me fully in opinion.
a board of naval officers was already in session at New Orleans, charged with the duty of procuring, as speedily as possible, some light and fast steamers to be let loose against the enemy's commercial marine, but their reports up to this time, had been but little satisfactory. They had examined a number of vessels, and found some defects in all of them. The secretary, speaking of the discouragement presented by these reports, handed me one of them, which he had received that morning, from the board. I read it, and found that it described a small propeller steamer, of 500 tons burden, seagoing, with a low pressure engine, sound, and capable of being so strengthened as to be enabled to carry an ordinary battery of four, or five guns. Her speed was reported to be between nine, and ten knots, but unfortunately, said the board, she carries but five days fuel, and has no accommodations for the crew of a ship of war. She was, accordingly, condemned. When I had finished reading the report, I turned to the secretary, and said, Give me that ship, I think I can make her answer the purpose. My request was at once acceded to, the secretary telegraphed to the board, to receive the ship, and the clerks of the department were set at work, to hunt up the necessary officers, to accompany me, and make out the proper orders. And this is the way in which the Confederate States Steamer Sumter, which was to have the honor of being the first ship of war to throw the new Confederate flag to the breeze, was commissioned. I had accepted a stone which had been rejected of the builders, and which, though, it did not afterward become the chief cornerstone of the temple, I endeavored to work into the building which the Confederates were then rearing, to remind their posterity that they had struggled, as Patrick Henry and his contemporaries had struggled before them, in defense of their liberties. The next day, the chief clerk of the Navy Department handed me the following order. Confederate States of America. Navy Department, Montgomery, April 18, 1861. Sir Colon you are hereby detached from duty as Chief of the Lighthouse Bureau, and will proceed to New Orleans, and take command of the steamer Sumter, named in honor of our recent victory over Fort Sumter. The following officers have been ordered to report to you, for duty, Lieutenants John M. Kell, R. T. Chapman, John M. Strubling, and William E. Evans, Paymaster Henry Myers, Surgeon Francis L. Galt. Midshipman, William A. Hicks, Richard F. Armstrong, Albert G. Hudgens, John F. Holden, and Joseph D. Wilson. I am respectfully your obedient servant. S. R. Mallory, Secretary of the Navy. Commander Raphael Semmes. The reader will observe that I am addressed as a commander, the rank which I held in the old service. The Navy Department, in consultation with the President, had adopted the rule of accepting all the officers who chose to come to us from the old navy, as the federal navy began now to be called, without increase of rank, and in arranging them on the navy list, their old relative rank was also preserved. This rule had two good effects, it did not tempt any officer to come to us, moved by the hope of immediate promotion, and it put us all on an equal footing, in the future race for honors. I had been living in Montgomery as a bachelor, at the house of Mr. William Knox, an old friend, my family having gone to spend some time with a beloved brother, in Maryland, until I could see, by the light of events, what final disposition to make of it. It did not occupy me long, therefore, to make my preparations for departure, in obedience to my orders. I took a respectful, and affectionate leave of the officers of the government, with whom I had been associated, and embarked on the afternoon of the same day on which I had received my orders, on board the steamer Southern Republic for Mobile. At Mobile I fell in with Lieutenant Chapman, one of the officers who had been detailed to report to me, and he, being a minute man like myself, took a hasty leave of a young wife, and we continued our journey together. I found Mobile like the rest of the Confederacy, in a great state of excitement. Always one of the truest of southern cities, it was boiling over with enthusiasm, the young merchants had dropped their day books and ledgers, and were forming, and drilling companies, by night and by day, 
whilst the older ones were discussing questions of finance, and anxiously casting about them, to see how the Confederate treasury could be supported. The battle house, at which I stopped for a few hours, previous to taking the steamer for New Orleans, was thronged with young men in military costume, and all seemed going as merrily as a marriage bell. Alas! My poor young countrymen, how many of you had disappeared from the scene, when I next returned among you, near the close of the war, and how many poor mothers there were, weeping for the sons that were not. But your gallant and glorious record exclamation mark that, at least, remains, and must remain forever, for you have inscribed your name so high on the scroll of fame, that the slanderous breath of an ungenerous foe can never reach them. I arrived in New Orleans, on Monday, the 22d of April, and at once put myself in communication with the commanding naval officer, the venerable Lawrence Russo, since gone to his long home, full of years, and full of honors. Like a true son of the South he had obeyed the first call of his fatherland, the state of Louisiana, and torn off the seal from the commission of a federal captain, which he had honored for forty years. I will not say, peace to his ashes, for the spirit of a Christian gentleman, which animated his frame during life, has doubtless received its appropriate reward, nor will I say aught of his name, or fame, for these are embalmed in the memories of his countrymen. He was my friend, and in that name friend I pronounce his eulogy. On the same day of my arrival, in company with Lieutenant Chapman, I inspected, and took possession of my new ship. I found her only a dismantled packet ship, full of upper cabins, and other top hamper, furniture, and crockery, but as unlike a ship of war as possible. Still, I was pleased with her general appearance. Her lines were easy, and graceful, and she had a sort of saucy air about her, which seemed to say, that she was not averse to the service on which she was about to be employed. Chapter 10 The Preparation of the Sumter for C. S.H.E. drops down between the forts Jackson, and St. Philip, receives her sailing orders, list of officers. A great change was apparent in New Orleans since I had last visited it. The levee in front of the city was no longer a great mart of commerce, piled with cotton bales, and supplies going back to the planter, densely packed with steamers, and thronged with a busy multitude. The long lines of shipping above the city had been greatly thinned, and a general air of desolation hung over the river front. It seemed as though a pestilence brooded over the doomed city, and that its inhabitants had fled before the fell destroyer. The Sumter lay on the opposite side of the river, at Algiers, and I crossed over every morning to superintend her refitment. I was sometimes detained at the ferry house, waiting for the ferry boat, and on these occasions, Casting my eyes up and down the late busy river, it was not unfrequent to see it without so much as a skiff in motion on its bosom. But this first simoon of the desert which had swept over the city, as a foretaste of what was to come, had by no means discouraged its patriotic inhabitants. The activity of commerce had ceased, it is true, but another description of activity had taken its place. War now occupied the thoughts of the multitude and the sound of the drum, and the tramp of armed men were heard in the streets. The balconies were crowded with lovely women in gay attire, to witness the military processions, and the Confederate flag in miniature was pinned on almost every bosom. The enthusiasm of the Frenchman had been most easily and gracefully blended with the stern determination of the southern man of English descent, the consequence of which was, that there was more demonstrative patriotism in New Orleans than in any other of our southern cities. Nor was this patriotism demonstrative only, it was deep and real, and was afterwards sealed with some of the best Creole blood of the land, poured out, freely, on many a desperate battlefield. Alas! Poor Louisiana! Once the seat of wealth, and of a gay and refined hospitality, thy manorial residences are deserted, and in decay, or have been leveled by the torch of the incendiary thy fruitful fields, that were cultivated by the contented labourer, who whistled his merriment to his lazy plough, have been given to the jungle, thy fair daughters have been insulted, by the coarse, and rude vandal, 
and even thy liberties have been given in charge of thy freedmen, and all this, because thou wouldst thyself be free. I now took my ship actively in hand, and set gangs of mechanics at work to remove her upper cabins, and other top hamper, preparatory to making the necessary alterations. These latter were considerable, and I soon found that I had a tedious job on my hands. It was no longer the case, as it had been in former years, when I had had occasion to fit out a ship, that I could go into a navy yard, with well provided workshops, and skilled workmen ready with all the requisite materials at hand to execute my orders. Everything had to be improvised, from the manufacture of a water tank, to the kids, and cans of the berth deck messes, and from a gun carriage to a friction primer. I had not only to devise all the alterations but to make plans, and drawings of them, before they could be comprehended. The main deck was strengthened, by the addition of heavy beams to enable it to support the battery, a berth deck was laid for the accommodation of the crew, the engine, which was partly above the waterline, was protected by a system of woodwork, and iron bars, the ship's rig was altered so as to convert her into a bar cantine, with square sails on her fore and main masts. The officers' quarters, including my own cabin, were rearranged, new suits of sails were made, and new boats constructed, hammocks and bedding were procured for the crew, and guns, gun carriages, and ammunition ordered. Too long, tedious months were consumed in making these various alterations, and additions. My battery was to consist of an 8 inch shell gun, to be pivoted amidships, and of four light 32 pounders, of 13 CWT, each, in broadside. The Secretary of the Navy, who was as anxious as myself that I should get to sea immediately, had given me all the assistance in his power, readily acceding to my requests, and promptly filling, or causing to be filled, all my requisitions. With the secession of Virginia we had become possessed of a valuable depot of naval supplies, in the Norfolk Navy Yard. It was filled with guns, shot, shell, cordage, and everything that was useful in the equipment of a ship, but it was far away from New Orleans, and such was the confusion along the different lines of railroad, that it was difficult to procure transportation. Commander Terry Sinclair the active ordnance officer of the yard, had early dispatched my guns, by railroad, but weeks elapsed without my being able to hear anything of them. I was finally obliged to send a lieutenant in search of them, who picked them up, one by one, as they had been thrown out on the roadside, to make room for other freight. My gun carriages I was obliged to have constructed myself and I was fortunate enough to obtain the services of a very ingenious mechanic to assist me in this part of my duties, Mr. Roy, a former employee of the Custom House, within whose ample walls he had established his workshop. He contrived most ingeniously, and constructed out of railroad iron, one of the best carriages, or rather, slide and circle, for a pivot gun, which I have ever seen. The large foundry of Leeds and Company took the contract for casting my shot, and shells, and executed it to my satisfaction. Whilst all these various operations are going on, we may conveniently look around us upon passing events, or at least upon such of them as have a bearing upon naval operations. President Davis, a few days after the secession of Virginia, and when war had become imminent, issued a proclamation for the purpose of raising that irregular naval force, of which I have spoken in a previous page. Parties were invited to apply for letters of mark and reprisal, with a view to the fitting out of privateers, to prey upon the enemy's commerce. Under this proclamation several privateers, generally light draft river steamers, with one or two small guns each, were hastily prepared, in New Orleans and had already brought in some prizes captured off the mouths of the Mississippi. Even this small demonstration seemed to surprise, as well as alarm the northern government, for President Lincoln now issued a proclamation declaring the molestation of federal vessels, on the high seas, by Confederate cruisers, piracy. He had also issued a proclamation declaring the ports of the Confederacy in a state of blockade. The mouths of the Mississippi were to be sealed on the 25th of May.
the European governments, as soon as it became evident, that the two sections were really at war, took measures accordingly. Great Britain took the lead, and declared a strict neutrality between the combatants. It was of the essence of such a declaration, that it should put both belligerents on the same footing. This was apparently done, and the cruisers of both sections were prohibited, alike, from taking their prizes into British ports. I shall have something to say of the unequal operation of this declaration of neutrality, in a future part of these memoirs, for the present it is only necessary to state, that it acknowledged us to be in possession of belligerent rights. This was a point gained certainly, but it was no more than was to have been expected. Indeed, Great Britain could do nothing less. In recognizing the war which had broken out between the sections, as a war, and not as a mere insurrection, she had only followed the lead of Mr. Lincoln himself. Efforts had been made it is true, both by Mr. Lincoln, and his Secretary of State, to convince the European governments that the job which they had on their hands was a small affair, a mere family quarrel, of no great significance. But the truth would not be suppressed, and when, at last, it became necessary to declare the Confederate ports in a state of blockade, and to send ships of war thither, to enforce the declaration, the sly little game which they had been playing was all up with them. A blockade was an act of war, which came under the cognizance of the laws of nations. It concerned neutrals, as well as belligerents, and foreign nations were bound to take notice of it. It followed that there could not be a blockade without a war, and it equally followed, that there could not be a war without at least two belligerent parties to it. It will thus be seen, that the declaration of neutrality of Great Britain was a logical sequence of Mr. Lincoln's, and Mr. Seward's own act. And yet with sullen, and singular inconsistency, the northern government has objected, from that day to this, to this mere routine act of Great Britain. So much was this act considered, as a matter of course, at the time, that all the other powers of the earth, of sufficient dignity to act in the premises, at all, followed the example set them by Great Britain, and issued similar declarations, and the four years of bloody war that followed justified the wisdom of their acts. We may now return to the equipment of the Sumter. A rendezvous vous had been opened, and a crew had been shipped for her, which was temporarily berthed on board the receiving ship, Star of the West, a transport steamer of the enemy, which had been gallantly captured by some Texans, and turned over to the Navy. New Orleans was full of seamen, discharged from ships that had been laid up, and more men were offering themselves for service, than I could receive. I had the advantage, therefore, of picking my crew, an advantage which no one but a seaman can fully appreciate. My lieutenants, surgeon, paymaster, and marine officer had all arrived, and, with the consent of the Navy Department, I had appointed my engineers, one chief, and three assistants, boatswain, carpenter, and sailmaker. My provisions had been purchased, and were ready to be put on board, and my funds had already arrived, but we were still waiting on the mechanics, who, though doing their best, had not yet been able to turn the ship over to us. From the following letter to the Secretary of the Navy, enclosing a requisition for funds, it will be seen that my demands upon the department were quite moderate, and that I expected to make the Sumter pay her own expenses, as soon as she should get to sea. New Orleans, May 14, 1861. Sir Colon I have the honor to enclose, herewith, a requisition for the sum of ten thousand dollars, which I request may be remitted to the paymaster of the Sumter, in specie, for use during my contemplated cruise. I may find it necessary to coal several times, and to supply my crew with fresh provisions, and see, before I have the opportunity of replenishing my military chest from the enemy. The ammunition remained to be provided, and on the 20th of May, I dispatched Lieutenant Chapman to the Baton Rouge Arsenal, which had been captured a short time before, for the purpose of procuring it, under the following letter of instructions. New Orleans, May 20, 1861. Sir Colon you will proceed to Baton Rouge, 
and put yourself in communication with the commander of the CS arsenal, at that point, for the purpose of receiving the ammunition, arms, shot, shell, and C, that may be required for the supply of the C. S. Steamer Sumter, now fitting for sea at this port. It is presumed that the proper orders, which had been requested, have been, on will be dispatched from Montgomery, authorizing the issue of all such articles, as we may need. Should this not be the case, with regard to any of the articles, it is hoped that the ordnance officer in charge will not hesitate to deliver them, as it is highly important that the Sumter should not be detained, because of any oversight, or informality, in the orders of the War Department. Be pleased to present the accompanying requisition to Captain Booth, the superintendent, and ask that it may be filled. The gunner will be directed to report to you, to accompany you to Baton Rouge, on this service. The reader will thus perceive that many difficulties lay in the way of equipping the Sumter, that I was obliged to pick up one material here, and another there, as I could best find it and that I was not altogether free from the routine of the circumlocution office, as my requisitions had frequently to pass through many hands, before they could be complied with. About this time, we met with a sad accident in the loss of one of our midshipmen, by drowning. He, with other young officers of the Sumter, had been stationed, temporarily, on board the receiving ship, in charge of the Sumter's crew whilst the latter ship was still in the hands of the mechanics. The following letter of condolence to the father of the young gentleman will sufficiently explain the circumstances of the disaster. New Orleans, May 18, 1861. Sir Colon it becomes my melancholy duty to inform you, of the death, by drowning, yesterday, of your son, midshipman John F. Holden, of the sea. S. Steamer Sumter. Your son was temporarily attached to the receiving ship, late Star of the West, at this place, whilst the Sumter was being prepared for sea, and whilst engaged in carrying out an anchor, in a boat belonging to that ship, met his melancholy fate, along with three of the crew, by the swamping of the boat, in which he was embarked. I offer you, my dear sir, my heartfelt condolence on this sad bereavement. You have lost a cherished son, and the government a valuable and promising young officer. W. B. Holden, Esquire, Lewisburg, Tennessee. War had begun, thus early, to demand of us our sacrifices. Tennessee had not yet seceded, and yet this ardent southern youth had withdrawn from the Naval Academy, and cast his lot with his section. A few extracts from my journal will now, perhaps, give the reader a better idea of the progress of my preparations for sea, and of passing events, than any other form of narrative. May 27 th. News received this morning of the appearance, at Parsale to yesterday, of the U. S. Steamer Brooklyn, and of the establishment of the blockade. Work is progressing satisfactorily, and I expect to be ready for sea, by Sunday next. News of skirmishing in Virginia, and of fresh arrivals of northern troops, at Washington, en route for that state. The federal government has crossed the Potomac, in force, and thus inaugurated a bloody, and a bitter war, by the invasion of our territory. So be it, we but accept the gantlet, which has been flung in our faces. The future will tell a tale not unworthy of the South, and her glorious cause. Monday. May 30th. My patience is sorely tried by the mechanics. The water tanks for the Sumter are not yet completed. The carriage for the 8 inch gun was finished, today, and we are busy laying down the circles for it, and cutting the holes for the fighting bolts. The carriages for the 32 pounders are promised us, by Saturday next, and also the copper tanks for the magazine. Our ammunition, and small arms arrived yesterday, from Baton Rouge. Besides the Brooklyn, at the passes, we learn, today, that the Niagara, and Minnesota, two of the enemy's fastest, and heaviest steamships have arrived, to assist in enforcing the blockade, and to lie in wait for some ships expected to arrive, laden with arms and ammunition, for the Confederacy.
May 31 SD. The tanks are at last finished, and they have all been delivered, today. Leeds and company have done an excellent job, and I shall be enabled to carry three months water for my crew. We shall now get on, rapidly, with our preparations. Saturday, June 1st, finds us not yet ready for sea. The tanks have all been taken on board, and stowed, the gun carriages for the 32s will be finished on Monday. The circles for the 8-inch gun have been laid down, and the fighting bolts are ready for placing. On Monday I shall throw the crew on board, and by Thursday next, I shall, without doubt be ready for sea. We are losing a great deal of precious time. The enemy's flag is being flaunted in our faces, at all our ports by his ships of war, and his vessels of commerce are passing, and repassing, on the ocean, in defiance or in contempt of our power, and, as yet, we have not struck a blow. At length on the 3d of June, I was enabled to put the Sumter, formally, in commission. On that day her colors were hoisted, for the first time, the ensign having been presented to me, by some patriotic ladies of New Orleans, the crew was transferred to her, from the receiving ship, and the officers were ordered to mess on board. The ship was now hauled off and anchored in the stream, but we were delayed too long and tedious weeks yet, before we were finally ready. During these two weeks we made a trial trip up the river, some ten or twelve miles. Some of the principal citizens were invited on board, and a bright, and beautiful afternoon was pleasantly spent, in testing the qualities of the ship, the range of her guns and the working of the gun carriages, the whole ending by a collation, in partaking of which my guests were kind enough to wish me a career full of blazing honours. I was somewhat disappointed in the speed of my ship, as we did not succeed in getting more than nine knots out of her. There was another great disadvantage. With all the space I could allot to my coal bunkers, she could be made to carry no more than about eight days fuel. We had masts, and sails, it is true, but these could be of but little use, when the coal was exhausted, as the propeller would remain a drag in the water, there being no means of hoisting it. It was with such drawbacks, that I was to take the sea, alone, against a vindictive and relentless enemy, whose navy already swarmed on our coasts, and whose means of increasing it were inexhaustible. But the sailor has a saying, that luck is a lord, and we trusted to luck. On the 18th of June, after all the vexatious delays that have been described, I got up my anchor, and dropped down to the barracks, below the city a short distance, to receive my powder on board, which, for safety, had been placed in the state magazine. At 10.30 p.m. of the same day, we got up steam, and by the soft and brilliant light of a moon near her full, threw ourselves into the broad and swift current of the father of waters, and ran rapidly down to the anchorage, between Fort Jackson, and Fort St. Philip, where we came to at 4 a.m. in the course of the day, Captain Brand, an ex-officer of the old navy, and now second in command of the forts, came on board to make us the ceremonial visit, and I subsequently paid my respects to Major Duncan, the officer in chief command, an ex-officer of the old army. These gentlemen were both busy, as I found upon inspecting the forts, in perfecting their batteries, and drilling their men, for the hot work that was evidently before them. As was unfortunately the case with our people, generally, at this period, they were overconfident. They kindly supplied some few deficiencies, that still remained in our gunner's department, and I received from them a howitzer, which I mounted on my taffer to guard against boat attacks, by night. I remained three days at my anchors between the forts, for the purpose of stationing, and drilling my crew, before venturing into the presence of the enemy, and I will take advantage of this lull to bring up some matters connected with the ship, which we have hitherto overlooked. On the 7th of June, the Secretary of the Navy, the government having, in the meantime, removed to Richmond, sent me my sailing orders and in my letter of the 14th of the same month, acknowledging their receipt, I had said to him, I have an excellent set of men on board, though they are nearly all green, and will require some little practice, 
and drilling, at the guns, to enable them to handle them creditably. Should I be fortunate enough to reach the high seas, you may rely upon my implicit obedience of your instructions, to do the enemy's commerce the greatest injury, in the shortest time. Here was a model of a letter of instruction, it meant burn, sink, and destroy, always, of course, within the limits prescribed by the laws of nations, and with due attention to the laws of humanity, in the treatment of prisoners. The reader will see, as we progress, that I gave the implicit obedience which had been promised, to these instructions, and that if greater results were not accomplished, it was the fault of the Sumter, and not of her commander. In the same letter that brought me my sailing orders, the secretary had suggested to me the propriety of adopting some means of communicating with him, by cipher, so that, my dispatches, if captured by the enemy, would be unintelligible to him. The following letter in reply to this suggestion, will explain how this was arranged, I have the honor to enclose here with a copy of Reed's English Dictionary, a duplicate of which I retain for the purpose mentioned in your letter of instructions, of the seventh instant. I have not been able to find in the city of New Orleans, Cobb's miniature lexicon, suggested by you, or any other suitable dictionary, with but a single column on a page. This need make no difference, however. In my communications to the department, should I have occasion to refer to a word in the copy sent, I will designate the first column on the page, A and the second column, B. Thus, if I wish to use the word prisoner, my reference to it would be as follows, 323, B, 15, the first number referring to the page, the letter to the column, and the second number to the number of the word from the top of the column. By means of this simple, and cheap device, I was enabled, at all times, to keep my dispatches out of the hands of the enemy or, in other words, prevent him from interpreting them, when I had anything of importance to communicate. Before leaving New Orleans, I had, in obedience to a general order of the service, transmitted to the Navy Department, a muster roll of the officers, and men, serving on board the Sumter. Her crew, as reported by this roll, consisted of 92 persons, exclusive of officers. Twenty of these ninety-two persons were marines, a larger guard than was usual for so small a ship. The officers were as follows. Commander. Raphael Semmes. Lieutenant. John M. Kell, Robert T. Chapman, John M. Strubling, William E. Evans. Paymaster. Henry Myers. Surgeon. Francis L. Galt. First Lieutenant of Marines. B. Howell. Midshipman. William A. Hicks, Albert G. Hudgens, Richard F. Armstrong, Joseph D. Wilson. Engineers. Miles J. Freeman, William P. Brooks, Matthew O'Brien, Simeon W. Cummings. Boson. Benjamin P. McCarsky. Gunner. Thomas C. Cuddy. Sailmaker. W. P. Beaufort. Carpenter. William Robinson. Captains Clark. W. Breedlove Smith. Commissions had been forwarded to all the officers entitled to receive them, and acting appointments had been given by me to their warrant officers. It will thus be seen, how formally all these details had been attended to. These commissions were to be our warrants for what we were to do, on the high seas. And now the poor boon will be permitted to human nature, that before we launch our frail bark, on the wild sea of adventure, before us, we should turn our thoughts, homeward, for a moment. And is he gone question mark on sudden solitude? How oft that fearful question will intrude! Twas but an instant past, and here he stood. And now exclamation mark without the portal's porch she rushed. And then at length her tears in freedom gushed. Big, bright, and fast unknown to her they fell. But still her lips refused to send farewell. For in that word, that fatal word, power. We promise, hope, believe, the breathes despair. Such was the agony of many a fair bosom, 
as the officers of the Sumter had torn themselves from the embraces of their families, in those scenes of leave-taking, which more than any other, try the sailor's heart. Several of them were married men, and it was long years before they returned to the homes which they had made sad by their absence. Chapter 11 After long waiting and watching, the Sumter runs the blockade of the Mississippi, in open daylight, pursued by the Brooklyn. Whilst we were lying at our anchors between the forts, as described in the last chapter, Governor Moore of Louisiana, who had done good service to the Confederacy, by seizing the forts, and arsenals in his state, in advance of secession, and the Honorable John Slidell, lately returned from his seat in the Federal Senate, and other distinguished gentlemen came down, on a visit of inspection to the forts. I went on shore to call on them, and brought them on board the Sumter to lunch with me. My ship was, by this time, in excellent order, and my crew well accustomed to their stations, under the judicious management of my first lieutenant, and I took pleasure in showing these gentlemen how much a little discipline could accomplish, in the course of a few weeks. Discipline exclamation mark what a power it is everywhere, and under all circumstances, and how much the want of it lost us, as the war progressed. What a pity the officers of our army did not have their respective commands, encircled by wooden walls, with but a single monarch to walk the people deck. Just at nightfall, on the evening of the 21st of June, I received the following dispatch from the commanding officer of the forts. Captain Colon I am desired by the commanding officer to state, that the ivy, this was a small tender of the forts, and letter of mark, reports that the Powhatan has left, in pursuit of two ships, and that he has a telegram from Parsale, to the effect, that a boat from the Brooklyn had put into the river and was making for the telegraph station, where she was expected to arrive within a few minutes. The Powhatan was blockading the southwest pass, and it was barely possible that I might get to sea, through this pass, if a pilot could be at once procured and so I immediately ordered steam to be raised, and getting up my anchor, steamed down to the head of the passes, where the river branches into its three principal outlets. Arriving here, at half past ten p.m., I dispatched a boat to the lighthouse, for a pilot, but the keeper knew nothing of the pilots, and was unwilling to come on board, himself, though requested. The night wore away, and nothing could be done. The telescope revealed to us, the next morning, that the Powhatan had returned to her station. From the sullen, and unsatisfactory message, which had been returned to me, by the keeper of the lighthouse, I began to suspect that there was something wrong, about the pilots, and it being quite necessary that I should have one constantly, on board, to enable me to take advantage of any temporary absence of the enemy's cruisers without having to hunt up one for the emergency, I dispatched the ivy, to the pilot's station, at the southwest pass, in search of one. This active little cruiser returned in the course of a few hours, and reported that none of the pilots were willing to come on board of me. I received, about the same time, a telegraphic dispatch from the southwest pass, forwarded to me through Major Duncan which read as follows, applied to the captain of the pilots association for a pilot for the Sumter. He requested me to state, that there are no pilots on duty now. So ho! Sits the wind in that quarter, thought I, I will soon set this matter right. I, at once, sent Lieutenant Strubling on board the IV, and directed him to proceed to the pilots association, and deliver, and see executed the following written order. C.S. Steamer Sumter, head of the passes. June 22, 1861. Sir Colon this is to command you to repair on board this ship, with three or four of the most experienced pilots of the bar. I am surprised to learn, that an unwillingness has been expressed, by some of the pilots of your association, to come on board the Sumter, and my purpose is to test the fact of such disloyalty to the Confederate States. If any man disobeys this summons I will not only have his branch taken from him, but I will send an armed force, and arrest, and bring him on board. This order had the desired effect, and in the course of the afternoon, 
Lieutenant Stribling returned, bringing with him, the captain of the association, and several of the pilots. I directed them to be brought into my cabin, and when they were assembled, demanded to know the reason of their late behavior. Some stammering excuses were offered, which I cut short, by informing them that one of them must remain on board constantly, and that they might determine for themselves, who should take the first week's service, to be relieved at the end of the week, by another, and so on, as long as I should find it necessary. One of their number being designated, I dismissed the rest. The reader will see how many faithful auxiliaries, Admiral Farragut afterward found, in the Pilots Association of the Mouths of the Mississippi, when he made his famous ascent of the river, and captured its great seaport. Nor was this defection confined to New Orleans. The pilots along our whole southern coast were, with few exceptions, northern men, and as a rule they went over to the enemy, though pretending, in the beginning of our troubles, to be good secessionists. The same remark may be applied to our steamboat men, of northern birth, as a class. Many of them had become domiciled in the south, and were supposed to be good southern men, until the crucial test of self-interest was applied to them, when they, too, deserted us, and took service with the enemy. The object of the Brooklyn's boat, which, as we have seen, pulled into the telegraph station at Parsale just before we got underway from between the forts, was to cut the wires, and break up the station, to prevent intelligence being given me of the movements of the blockading fleet. I now resorted to a little retaliation. I dispatched an officer to the different lighthouses, to stave the oil casks, and bring away the lighting apparatus, to prevent the enemy's shipping from using the lights. They were of great convenience, not only to the ships employed on the blockade, but to the enemy's transport, and other ships, bound to and from the coast of Texas. They could be of no use to our own blockade runners, as the passes of the Mississippi, by reason of their long, and tortuous, and frequently shifting channels, were absolutely closed to them. The last letter addressed by me to the Secretary of the Navy, before escaping through the blockade, as hereinafter described, was the following. C.S. Steamer Sumter, Head of the Passes. June 30, 1861. Sir Colon I have the honor to inform the department that I am still at my anchors at the head of the passes the enemy closely investing both of the practical outlets. At Parsale there are three ships, the Brooklyn, and another propeller, and a large side wheel steamer, and at the southwest pass, there is the Powhatan, lying within half a mile of the bar, and not stirring an inch from her anchors, night or day. I am only surprised that the Brooklyn does not come up to this anchorage, which she might easily do, as there is water enough, and no military precautions, whatever, have been taken to hold the position, and thus effectually seal all the passes of the river, by her presence alone, which would enable the enemy to withdraw the remainder of his blockading force, for use elsewhere. With the assistance of the Jackson, Lieutenant Guathme, and the McRae, Lieutenant Huger, neither of which has, as yet, however, dropped down, I could probably hold my position here, until an opportunity offers of my getting to sea. I shall watch, diligently, for such an opportunity, and have no doubt, that sooner or later, it will present itself. I found, upon dropping down to this point, that the lights at Parsale and South Pass had been strangely overlooked, and that they were still being nightly exhibited. I caused them both to be extinguished, so that if bad weather should set in, a gale from the southeast, for instance, the blockading ships, having nothing to hold on to, will be obliged to make an offing. At present the worst feature of the blockade of Parsale is, that the Brooklyn has the speed of me, so that even if I should run the bar, I could not hope to escape her, unless I surprised her, which with her close watch of the bar, at anchor nearby both night and day, it will be exceedingly difficult to do. I should be quite willing to try speed with the Powhatan, if I could hope to run the gantlet of her guns, without being crippled. But here again, unfortunately, with all the boys, and other marks removed, 
the bar which he is watching is a perfectly blind bar, except by daylight. In the meantime, I am drilling my green crew, to a proper use of the great guns, and small arms. With the exception of a diarrhea, which is prevailing, to some extent, brought on by too free use of the river water, in the excessive heats which prevail, the crew continues healthy. Nothing in fact surprised me more, during the nine days I lay at the head of the passes, than that the enemy did not attack me with some of his light draft, but heavily armed steamers, or by his boats, by night. Here was the Sumter, a small ship, with a crew, all told, of a little over a hundred men, anchored only ten, or twelve miles from the enemy, without a gun, or an obstruction between her and him, and yet no offensive movement was made against her. The enemy watched me closely, day by day, and bent all his energies toward preventing my escape, but did not seem to think of the simple expedient of endeavoring to capture me, with a superior force. In nightly expectation of an assault, I directed the engineer to keep the water in his boilers, as near the steam point as possible, without actually generating the vapor, and send a patrol of boats some distance down the southwest pass, the boats being relieved every four hours, and returning to the ship, at the first streaks of dawn. After I went to sea, the enemy did come in, and take possession of my anchorage until he was driven away by Commodore Hollins, in a little nondescript ram, which, by the way, was the first ram experiment of the war. The reader may imagine the tedium, and discomforts of our position, if he will reflect that it is the month of June, and that at this season of the year, the sun comes down upon the broad, and frequently calm surface of the father of waters, with an African glow, and that clouds of that troublesome little insect the mosquito tormented us by night and by day. There was no sleeping at all without the mosquito bar, and I had accordingly had a supplely sent down for all the crew. Rather than stand the assaults of these little picadors, much longer, I believe my crew would have run the gantlet of the whole Federal Navy. My diary will now perhaps give the reader, his clearest conception of the condition of things on board the Sumter, for the remaining few days that she is to continue at her anchors. Tuesday, June 25 th. A sharp thunderstorm at half past 3 a. m., jarring and shaking the ship with its crashes. The very floodgates of the heavens seem open, and the rain is descending on our decks like a cataract. Clearing toward 10 o'clock. Both blockading ships still at their anchors. The British steam sloop Jason touched at the Southwest Pass, yesterday, and communicated with the Powhatan. We learn by the newspapers, today, that the enemy has taken possession of Ship Island, and established a blockade of the sound. The anaconda is drawing his folds around us. We are filling some shell, and cartridges today, and drilling the crew at the battery. Wednesday, June 26 th. Cloudy, with occasional rain squalls, which have tempered the excessive heats. The ivy returned from the city today and brought me eighty barrels of coal. Sent the pilot, in the lighthouse keeper's boat, to sound the S. E. Bar, an unused and unwatched outlet to the eastward of the South Pass, in the hope that we may find sufficient water over it, to permit the egress of the ship. The Federal ships are keeping close watch, as usual, at both the passes, neither of them having stirred from her anchor, since we have been at the head of the passes. Thursday, June 27 th. Weather sultry, and atmosphere charged with moisture. Pilot returned this afternoon, and reports ten and a half feet water on the S. E. Bar. Unfortunately the Sumter draws twelve feet, so we must abandon this hope. Saturday, June 29 th. A mistake induced us to expend a little coal, today, uselessly. The pilot having gone aloft, to take his usual morning's survey of the situation, reported that the Brooklyn was nowhere to be seen. Great excitement immediately ensued, on the decks, and the officer of the watch hurried into my cabin with the information. I ordered steam to be gotten up with all dispatch, and when, in the course of a very few minutes, it was reported ready, 
for we always kept our fires banked, the anchor was tripped, and the ship was under way, ploughing her way through the turbid waters, toward Parsail. When we had steamed about four miles down the pass, the Brooklyn was seen riding very quietly at her anchors, in her usual berth near the bar. Explanation, the Sumter had dragged her anchor during the night, and the alteration in her position had brought a clump of trees between her, and the enemy's ship, which had prevented the pilot from seeing the latter. With disappointed hopes we had nothing to do, but to return to our anchors, and watch and wait. In half an hour more, the sailors were lounging idly about the decks, under well-spread awnings, the jest, and banter went round, as usual, and save the low hissing and singing of the steam, which was still escaping, there was nothing to remind the beholder of our recent disappointment. Such is the school of philosophy in which the seaman is reared. Our patience, however, was soon to be rewarded. Early on the next morning, which was the 30th of June, the steamer, Empire Parish, came down from the city, and coming alongside of us, put on board some fresh provisions for the crew, and about 100 barrels of coal, which my thoughtful, and attentive friend, Commodore Russo, had sent down to me. Having done this, the steamer shoved off, and proceeded on her trip, down Parsail to the pilot's station, and lighthouse. It was a bright Sunday morning, and we were thinking of nothing but the usual muster, and how we should get through another idle day. In the course of two or three hours, the steamer returned, and when she had come near us, she was seen to cast off a boat, which she had been towing, containing a single boatman, one of the fishermen, or oystermen so common in these waters. The boatman pulled rapidly under our stern, and hailing the officer of the deck, told him, that the Brooklyn had gone off in chase of a sail, and was no longer in sight. The crew, who had been cleaning themselves, for Sunday muster, at once stowed away their bags, the swinging booms were gotten alongside, the boats run up, and, in ten minutes, the steam was again hissing, as if impatient of control. The men ran round the capstan, in double quick, in their eagerness to get up the anchor, and in a few minutes more, the ship's head swung off gracefully with the current, and, the propeller being started, she bounded off like a thing of life, on this new race, which was to decide whether we should continue to stagnate in midsummer, in the marshes of the Mississippi, or reach those glad waters of the dark blue sea, which form as delightful a picture in the imagination of the sailor, as in that of the poet. Whilst we were heaving up our anchor, I had noticed the pilot, standing near me, pale, and apparently nervous, and agitated, but, as yet, he had said not a word. When we were fairly under way, however, and it seemed probable, at last, that we should attempt the blockade, the fellow's courage fairly broke down, and he protested to me that he knew nothing of the bar of Parsail and durst not attempt to run me over. I am, said he, US. W. Bar pilot, and know nothing of the other passes. What, said I, did you not know that I was lying at the head of the passes, for the very purpose of taking any one of the outlets through which an opportunity of escape might present itself, and yet you dare tell me, that you know but one of them, and have been deceiving me. The fellow stammered out something in excuse, but I was too impatient to listen to him, and, turning to the first lieutenant, ordered him to hoist the jack at the fore, as a signal for a pilot. I had, in fact, resolved to attempt the passage of the bar, from my own slight acquaintance with it, when I had been a lighthouse inspector, rather than forego the opportunity of escape, and caused the jack to be hoisted, rather as a matter of course, than because I hoped for any good result from it. The Brooklyn had not chased out of sight, as reported, she had only chased to the westward, some seven or eight miles, and had been hidden from the boatman, by one of the spurs of the delta. She had probably, all the while, had her telescopes on the Sumter, and as soon as she saw the black smoke issuing from her chimney, and the ship moving rapidly toward the pass, she abandoned her chase, and commenced to retrace her steps. We had nearly equal distances to run to the bar but I had the advantage of a four-knot current. 
several of my officers now collected around me, and we were discussing the chances of escape. What think you of our prospect, said I, turning to one of my lieutenants, who had served a short time before, on board the Brooklyn, and knew well her qualities. Prospect, sir. Not the least in the world, there is no possible chance of our escaping that ship. Even if we get over the bar ahead of her, she must overhaul us, in a very short time. The Brooklyn is good for fourteen knots an hour, sir. That was the report, said I, on her trial trip, but you know how all such reports are exaggerated, ten to one, she has no better speed, if so good, as the Sumter. You will see, sir, replied my lieutenant, we made a passage in her, only a few months ago, from Tampica to Pensacola, and averaged about thirteen knots the whole distance. Here the conversation dropped, for an officer now came to report to me that a boat had just shoved off from the pilot's station, evidently with a pilot in her. Casting my eyes in the given direction, I saw a whaleboat approaching us, pulled by four stout blacks, who were bending like good fellows to their long ashen oars, and in the stern sheets was seated, sure enough, the welcome pilot, swaying his body to, and fro, as his boat leapt under the oft-repeated strokes of the oars, as though he would hasten her already great speed. But more beautiful still was another object which presented itself. In the balcony of the pilot's house, which had been built in the very marsh, on the margin of the river, there stood a beautiful woman, the pilot's young wife, waving him on to his duty, with her handkerchief. We could have tossed a biscuit from the sumter to the shore, and I uncovered my head gallantly to my fair countrywoman. A few moments more, and a towline had been thrown to the boat, and the gallant young fellow stood on the horse block beside me. As we swept past the lighthouse wharf, almost close enough to touch it, there were other petticoats fluttering in the breeze, the owners of which were also waving handkerchiefs of encouragement to the sumter. I could see my sailor's eyes brighten at these spectacles, for the sailor's heart is capacious enough to love the whole sex, and I now felt sure of their nerves, in case it should become necessary to tax them. Half a mile or so, from the lighthouse, and the bar is reached. There was a Bremen ship lying aground on the bar, and there was just room, and no more, for us to pass her. She had run out a kedge and had a warp attached to it that was lying across the passageway. The crew considerately slackened the line, as we approached, and in another bound the sumter was outside the bar, and the confederate flag was upon the high seas. We now slackened our speed, for an instant, only an instant, for my officers and men all had their wits about them, and worked like good fellows, to haul the pilot's boat alongside, that he might return to the shore. As the gallant young fellow grasped my hand, and shook it warmly, as he descended from the horse block, he said, Now, Captain, you are all clear, give her a H, L, L, and let her go. We had now nothing to do, but turn our attention to the enemy. The Brooklyn, as we cleared the bar, was about three and a half, or four miles distant, we were therefore just out of reach of her guns, with nothing to spare. Thick volumes of smoke could be seen pouring from the chimneys of both ships, the firemen, and engineers of each evidently doing their best. I called a lieutenant, and directed him to heave their log. He reported our speed to be nine, and a half knots. Loath to believe that we could be making so little way, through the yet turbid waters, which were rushing past us with great apparent velocity, I directed the officer to repeat the experiment but the same result followed, though he had paid out the line with a free hand. I now sent for the engineer, and, upon inquiry, found that he was doing his very best, though, said he, there is a little drawback, just now, in the foaming of our boilers, arising from the suddenness with which we got up steam, when this subsides, we may be able to add half and not more. The Brooklyn soon loosed, and set her sails, bracing them sharp up on the starboard tack. I loosed and set mine, also. The enemy's ship was a little on my weather quarter, say a couple of points, and had thus slightly the weather gauge of me. As I knew I could lay nearer the wind than she, 
being able to brace my yards sharper, and had besides, the advantage of larger fore and aft sails, comparatively, stay sails, try sails, and a very large spanker, I resolved at once to hold my wind, so closely, as to compel her to furl her sails, though this would carry me a little athwart her bows, and bring me perhaps a little nearer to her, for the next half hour, or so. A rain squall now came up, and enveloped the two ships, hiding each from the other. As the rain blew off to leeward, and the Brooklyn reappeared, she seemed fearfully near to us, and I began to fear I should realize the foreboding of my lieutenant. I could not but admire the majesty of her appearance, with her broad flaring bows, and clean, and beautiful run, and her masts, and yards, as taunt and square as those of an old-time sailing frigate. The stars and stripes of a large ensign flew out from time to time, from under the lee of her spanker, and we could see an apparently anxious crowd of officers on her quarter-deck, many of them with telescopes directed toward us. She had, evidently, I thought, gained upon us, and I expected every moment to hear the whiz of a shot, but still she did not fire. I now ordered my paymaster to get his public chest, and papers ready for throwing overboard, if it should become necessary. At this crisis the engineer came up from below, bringing the welcome intelligence that the foaming of his boilers had ceased, and that his engine was working beautifully, giving the propeller several additional turns per minute. The breeze, too, favored me, for it had freshened considerably, and what was still more to the purpose. I began to perceive that I was eating the Brooklyn out of the wind, in other words, that she was falling more and more to leeward. I knew, of course, that as soon as she fell into my wake, she would be compelled to furl her sails. This she did in half an hour or so afterward, and I at once began to breathe more freely, for I could still hold on to my own canvas. I have witnessed many beautiful sights at sea but the most beautiful of them all was when the Brooklyn let fly all her sheets, and halyards, at once, and clued up, and furled, in men of war style, all her sails, from courses to royals. We now began to gain quite perceptibly on our pursuer, and at half past three, the chase was abandoned, the baffled Brooklyn retracing her steps to parsail, and the Sumter bounding away on her course seaward. We fired no gun of triumph in the face of the enemy, my powder was too precious for that, but I sent the crew aloft, to man the rigging, and three such cheers were given for the confederate flag, that little bit of striped bunting, that had waved from the Sumter's peak during the exciting chase, as could proceed only from the throats of American seamen, in the act of defying a tyrant, those cheers were but a repetition of many such cheers that had been given by our ancestors, to that other bit of striped bunting which had defied the power of England in the Tolden War, of which our war was but the logical sequence. The reader must not suppose that our anxiety was wholly allayed, as soon as we saw the Brooklyn turn away from us. Kelly, Byatt and C.O. Publishers Lith. By A. Hone and C.O. Bolto. Larger Image. The Sumter running the blockade of Par Sail try the enemy's ship Brooklyn, on the 30th of June, 1861. We were, as yet, only a few miles from the land, and our coast was swarming with the enemy's cruisers. Ship Island was not a great way off, and there was a constant passing to and fro, of ships of war between that island and the passes of the Mississippi, and we might stumble upon one of these at any moment. Sail ho! was now shouted from the masthead. Where away? cried the officer of the deck. Right ahead, said the lookout. A few minutes only elapsed, and a second sail was descried, broad on the starboard bow. But nothing came of these spectres, we passed on, seaward, without so much as raising either of them from the deck, and finally, the friendly robes of night enveloped us. When we at length realized that we had gained an offing, when we began to feel the welcome heave of the sea, when we looked upon the changing aspect of its waters, now darkening into the deepest blue, and breathed the pure air, fresh from the gulf, untainted of malaria, 
and untouched of mosquito's wing, we felt like so many prisoners who had been turned loose from a long and painful confinement, and when I reflected upon my mission, to strike for the right, to endeavor to sweep from the seas the commerce of a treacherous friend, who had become a cruel and relentless foe, I felt, in full force, the inspiration of the poet. Hours the wildlife in tumult still to range. From toil to rest, and joy in every change. Oh, who can tell? Not thou, luxurious slave. Whose soul would sicken o'er the heaving wave. Not thou, vain lord of wantonness and ease. Whom slumber soothes not, pleasures cannot please. Oh, who can tell, save he whose heart hath dried. And danced in triumph for the waters wide. The exulting sense, the pulse's maddening play. That thrills the wanderer of that trackless way. Death. Come when it will, we snatch the life of life. When lost, what wrecks it, by disease or strife? Let him who crawls, enamored of decay. Cling to his couch, and sicken years away. Heave his thick breath and shake his palsied head. Ours. The fresh turf, and not the feverish bed. While gasp by gasp he falters forth his soul. Ours, with one pang, one bound, escapes control. His corpse may boast its swan and narrow cave. And they who loathed his life, may gild his grave. Ours are the tears, though few, sincerely shed. When ocean shrouds and sepulchres are dead. Chapter 12. Brief sketch of the officers of the Sumter, her first prize, with other prizes, in quick succession, her first port. Captain Poor, the commander of the Brooklyn, was greatly censured by his government, for permitting the escape of the Sumter. It was even hinted that there had been treason, in the engine room of the Brooklyn as one or more of the engineers had been heard to express sentiments favorable to the South. There was no truth, of course, in this report. It had its origin in the brain of a people, who, having become traitors, themselves, to their former principles, were ready to suspect, and to impute treason to every one else. The greatest offense which had been committed by Captain Poor was that he had probably permitted his cupidity to draw him away from his station. He had chased a prize, in his eagerness to clutch the prize money, a little too far, that was all. But in this, he sinned only in common with his countrymen. The thirst of gain, as well as the malignity of hate, seemed, from the very first days of the war, to have seized upon a majority of the northern people. The army, and the navy, professions hitherto held honorable, did not escape the contamination. They were soon found, first plundering, and then maliciously burning private houses. The spectacle of cotton thieving was more than once presented by the highest dignitaries of the two services, the admiral quarreling with the general, as ignoble rogues are wont to quarrel, as to which rightly pertained the booty. The evening of the escape of the Sumter was one of those gulf evenings, which can only be felt, and not described. The wind died gently away, as the sun declined, leaving a calm, and sleeping sea, to reflect a myriad of stars. The sun had gone down behind a screen of purple, and gold, and to add to the beauty of the scene, as night set in, a blazing comet, whose tail spanned nearly a quarter of the heavens, mirrored itself within a hundred feet of our little bark, as she ploughed her noiseless way through the waters. As I leaned on the carriage of a howitzer on the poop of my ship, and cast a glance toward the quarter of the horizon whence the land had disappeared, memory was busy with the events of the last few months. How hurried, and confused they had been! It seemed as though I had dreamed a dream, and found it difficult, upon waking, to unite the discordant parts. A great government had been broken up, family ties had been severed, and war, grim, ghastly war, was arraying a household against itself. A little while back, and I had served under the very flag which I had that day defied. Strange revolution of feeling, how I now hated that flag. It had been to me as a mistress to a lover, I had looked upon it with admiring eyes, 
had dallied with it in hours of ease, and had had recourse to it, in hours of trouble, and now I found it false. What wonder that I felt a lover's resentment. My first lieutenant now approached me, and touching my elbow, said, Captain, had we not better throw this howitzer overboard? It can be of no further service to us, and is very much in the way. My waking dream was dissolved, on the instant, and I returned at once to the duties of the ship. I assented to the lieutenant's proposition, and in a few minutes more, the poop was cleared of the encumbrance. It was the howitzer, a heavy, awkward, iron field piece with huge wheels, which we had received on board, when we lay between the forts, as a protection against the enemy's boats. The rest of the night, to a late hour, was devoted to lashing, and otherwise securing such heavy articles, as were likely to be thrown from their places, by the rolling of the ship, getting the anchors in board and stowing them, and, generally, in making the ship snug. I turned in after a day of excitement, and slept too soundly to continue the daydream from which I had been aroused by my first lieutenant. The sun rose in an unclouded sky, the next morning, with a gentle breeze from the southwest, or about a beam, our course being about southeast. The lookout at the masthead, after having carefully scanned the horizon in every direction, informed the officer of the deck, that there was nothing in sight. The awnings were soon spread, and the usual routine of a man of war, at sea, commenced. The crew was mustered, in clean apparel, at quarters, at nine o'clock, and a division of guns was exercised, the rest of the crew being dispersed in idle groups about the deck, the old salts overhauling their bags, and seeing that their tobacco, and soap, and needles, and thread were all right for the crews, and the youngsters discussing their recent escape. At noon, we found ourselves in latitude 26 degrees 18 comma and longitude 87 degrees 23 dot I had provided myself with two excellent chronometers, before leaving New Orleans, and having had much experience as a master, I was always enabled, when the sun was visible, at the proper hours, to fix my position within from a quarter, to half a mile, or, what is the same thing, within from one to two seconds of time. I appointed my junior lieutenant, navigating officer, pro forma, but always navigated my ship, myself. I had every confidence in the ability of my young lieutenant, but I always found, that I slept better, when surrounded by danger, after I had fixed the position of my ship, by my own observations. We held on our course, during the rest of this day without the least incident to break in upon the monotony, not so much as a sail having been descried in any direction, not that we were in want of excitement, for we had scarcely regained our equilibrium from the excitement of the previous day. An occasional swash of the sea against the ship's sides, the monotonous beating of time by her propeller, an occasional order from the officer of the deck, and the routine calls of the boatswain's whistle, as dinner, or grog was piped were the only sounds audible, beyond the usual hum of conversation among the crew. If the reader will permit me, I will avail myself of this interval of calm before the storm, to introduce to him some of my officers. This is indeed but a courtesy due him, as he is to be a passenger in our midst. On the afternoon of our escape from the Brooklyn, the officers of the wardroom were kind enough to invite me to drink a glass of wine with them, in honor of our success and I will avail myself of this occasion, to make the presentations. I am seated at one end of the long mess table, and my first lieutenant at the other. The first lieutenant, as the reader has already been informed, by an inspection of the Sumter's muster roll, is from Georgia. John McIntosh Kelly is a descendant from one of the oldest families in that state, having the blood of the Macintoshes in his veins, through one branch of his ancestors. He was bred in the old navy, and my acquaintance with him commenced when he was in trouble. He was serving as a past midshipman, on board the old sailing sloop Albany, and being ordered, on one occasion, to perform what he considered a menial duty, he resisted the order. Some of his brother past midshipmen were in the same category. A court-martial resulted, and, at the request of the young gentleman, 
I defended them. The relation of counsel, and client, as a matter of course, brought us close together, and I discovered that young Kell had in him, the making of man. So far from being a mutineer, he had a high respect for discipline, and had only resisted obedience to the order in question, from a refined sense of gentlemanly propriety. The reader will see these qualities in him, now, as he sits opposite me. He has developed since the time I speak of, into the tall, well-proportioned gentleman, of middle age, with brown, wavy hair, and a magnificent beard, inclining to red. See how scrupulously neat he is dressed, and how suave, and affable he is, with his associates. His eye is now beaming gentleness, and kindness. You will scarcely recognize him, as the same man, when you see him again on deck, arraigning some culprit, at the mast, for a breach of discipline. When Georgia seceded, Lieutenant Kell was well on his way to the commander's list, in the old navy, but he would have scorned the commission of an admiral, if it had been tendered him as the price of treason to his state. To have brought a federal ship into the waters of Georgia, and ravaged her coasts, and fired upon her people, would have been, in his eyes, little less than matricide. He forthwith resigned his commission, and joined his fortunes with those of his people. When it was decided, at Montgomery, that I was to have the Sumter, I at once thought of Cal, and, at my request, he was ordered to the ship, Commodore Tatnall, with whom he had been serving on the Georgia coast, giving him up very reluctantly. Seated next to myself, on my right hand, is Lieutenant Robert T. Chapman. This gentleman is from Alabama, he is several years younger than Kell, not so tall, but stouter, in proportion. His complexion, as you see, is dark, and he has jet black hair, and eyes, the latter remarkable for their brilliancy, and for a twinkle of fun, and good humor. Chapman is the life of the mess table, always in a pleasant mood, and running over with wit and anecdote. Though he has a fashion, as you see, of wearing his hair closely cropped, he is the very reverse of a round head, being a reux chevalier, as ready for the fight as the dance, and having a decided preference for the music of the band, over that of old hundred. He is the second lieutenant, and has, consequently, the easiest berth among the sea lieutenants, being relieved from the drudgery of the first lieutenant, and exempt from the calls for extra duty, that are sometimes made upon the junior lieutenant. When his watch is over, and his division drilled, he is a gentleman at large, for the rest of the day. You see by his build, a slight inclination to corpulency, that he is fond of his ease, and that he has fallen as naturally into the place of second lieutenant, as if it had been cut out for him on purpose. He also was bred in the old navy, and was found to be of the pure metal, instead of the dross when the touchstone of secession came to be applied to separate the one from the other. At Lieutenant Kell's right hand, sits Lieutenant John M. Stribling, the third lieutenant, and a native of the glorious little state of South Carolina. He is of medium height, somewhat spare in build, with brown hair, and whiskers, and mild and expressive blue eyes, the mildness of the eye only dwelling in it, however, in moments of repose. When excited at the thought of wrong, or oppression, it has a peculiar stare of firmness, as much as to say, This rock shall fly. From its firm base as soon as I. Stribling was also an eleve of the old navy, and, though tied to it, by cords that were hard to sever, he put on rebuff place, in the hour of trial, and came south. Larger image. Kelly, Byatt and Company Baltimore. Next to Stribling, sits Lieutenant William E. Evans, the fourth and junior lieutenant of the ship. He is not more than twenty-four years of age, slim in person, of medium height, and rather delicate looking, though not from ill health. His complexion is dark, and he has black hair, and eyes. He has a very agreeable, reenty expression about his face, and is somewhat given to casuistry, being fond of an argument when occasion presents itself. He is but recently out of the Naval Academy, at Annapolis, and like all new graduates, 
feels the freshness of academic honors. He is a native of South Carolina, and a brother of General Evans of that state, who so greatly distinguished himself, afterward, at the Battle of Manassas, and on other bloody fields. If the reader will now cast his eye toward the center of the table, on my right hand, he will see two gentlemen, both with black hair and eyes, and both somewhat under middle size, conversing together. These are Dr. Francis L. Galt, the surgeon, and Mr. Henry Myers, the paymaster, both from the old service, the former a native of Virginia, and the latter a native of South Carolina, and opposite these, are the chief engineer, and marine officer common Mr. Miles J. Freeman, and Lieutenant B. Howell, the latter a brother-in-law of Mr. Jefferson Davis, our honored president. I have thus gone the circuit of the wardroom. All these officers, courteous reader, will make the cruise with us, and if you will inspect the adjoining engraving, and are a judge of character, after the rules of lavator and spurs I'm, you will perceive in advance, how much reason I shall have to be proud of them. We may now take up our narrative, from the point at which it was interrupted, for the purpose of these introductions. Day passed into night, and with the night came the brilliant comet again, lighting us on our way over the waste of waters. The morning of the 2nd of July, our second day out, dawn clear, and beautiful, the Sumter still steaming in an almost calm sea, with nothing to impede her progress. At 8 a.m., we struck the northeast trade wind, and made sail in aid of steam, giving orders to the engineer, to make the most of his fuel, by carrying only a moderate head of steam. Toward noon, a few trade squalls passed over us, with light and refreshing showers of rain, just enough to cause me to take shelter, for a few moments, under the lee of the spanker. At noon, we observed in latitude 23 degrees 4 showing that we had crossed the tropic, the longitude being 86 degrees 13. The reader has seen that we have been steering to the S. E., diminishing both latitude, and longitude and if he will look upon the chart of the Caribbean Sea, he will perceive, that we are approaching Cape San Antonio, the south end of the island of Cuba, but he can scarcely conjecture what sort of a cruise I had marked out for myself. The Secretary of the Navy, in those curt sailing orders which we have already seen, had considerately left me carte blanche as to cruising ground, but as I was to do the greatest injury to the enemy's commerce, in the shortest time. The implication was, that I should, at once, throw myself into some one of the chief thoroughfares of his trade. I accordingly set my eye on Cape Street Roque, in Brazil, which may be said to be the great turning point of the commerce of the world. My intention was to make a dash, of a few days, at the enemy's ships on the south side of Cuba, coal at some convenient point, stretch over to Barbados, coal again and then strike for the Brazilian coast. It is with this view, that the Sumter is now running for the narrow outlet, that issues from the Gulf of Mexico, between Cape Antonio, and the opposite coast of Yucatan. I shaped my course for the middle of this passage, but about midnight, made the light of Cape Antonio right ahead, showing that I had been drifted, northward, by a current setting, at the rate of from three-fourths of a mile, to a mile per hour. We drew off a little to the southward, doubled the cape, with the light still in view, and at nine o'clock, the next morning, we found ourselves off Cape Coyantes. The weather had now become cloudy, and we had a fresh trade wind, veering from E. to E. S. E., with some sea on. At Meridian, we observed in latitude 21 degrees 29 comma the longitude being 84 degrees 06 dot running along the Cuban coast, between it and the Isle of Pines, of piratical memory, at about three in the afternoon. The cry of sail ho! was heard from the masthead, for the first time since we had left the mouths of the Mississippi. The lookout, upon being questioned, said that he saw two sail, and that they were both right ahead. We came up with them, very rapidly, for they were standing in our direction, and when we had approached within signal distance, we showed them the English colors. The nearest sail, which proved to be a brig, hoisted the Spanish colors, and, 
upon being boarded, was found to be from Cadiz, bound for Vera Cruz. She was at once permitted to proceed. Resuming our course, we now stood for the other sail, which, by this time, there was no mistaking, she being plainly American, although she had not yet shown her colors. A gun soon brought these to the peak, when, as I had expected, the stars and stripes unfolded themselves, gracefully, to the breeze. Here was our first prize, and a most welcome sight it was. The capture, I find, upon looking over my notes, was recorded in a few lines, barren of all incident, or remark, except only that the doomed ship was from the black republican state of Maine, but I well recollect the mingled impressions of joy, and sadness, that were made upon me by the event. The old flag, which I had been accustomed to worship, in my youth, had a criminal look, in my eyes, as it ascended to the peak of that ship. How strangely we sometimes invest mere inanimate things with the attributes of life. When I had fired the gun, as a command to the stranger to heave to, and show his colors, I had hauled down the English, and hoisted my own flag. The stars and stripes seemed now to look abashed in the presence of the new banner of the South, pretty much as a burglar might be supposed to look, who had been caught in the act of breaking into a gentleman's house. But then the burglar was my relative, and had erst been my friend, how could I fail to feel some pity for him, along with the indignation, which his crime had excited? The boarding officer soon returned from the captured ship, bringing with him the master, with his papers. There were no knotty points of fact or law to embarrass my decision. There were the American register, and clearance, and the American character impressed upon every plank and spar of the ship. Nothing could exceed the astonishment of the master, who was rather a mild, amiable looking gentleman, not at all disposed to go either into hysterics, or the heroics. A clap of thunder in a cloudless sky could not have surprised me more, said he to me as I overhauled his papers, than the appearance of the Confederate flag in these seas. My duty is a painful one, said I, to destroy so noble a ship as yours but I must discharge it without vain regrets, and as for yourself, you will only have to do, as so many thousands have done before you, submit to the fortunes of war, yourself and your crew will be well treated on board my ship. The prize bore the name of the Golden Rocket, was a fine bark, nearly new, of about seven hundred tons, and was seeking, in ballast, a cargo of sugar in some one of the Cuban ports. Boats were dispatched to bring off the crew, and such provisions, cordage, sails, and paints as the different departments of my ship stood in need of, and at about ten o'clock at night, the order was given to apply the torch to her. The wind, by this time, had become very light, and the night was pitch dark, the darkness being of that kind, graphically described by old sailors, when they say, you may cut it with a knife. I regret that I cannot give to the reader the picture of the burning ship, as it presented itself to the silent, and solemn watchers on board the Sumter as they leaned over her hammock rails to witness it. The boat, which had been sent on this errand of destruction, had pulled out of sight, and her oars ceasing to resume, we knew that she had reached the doomed ship, but so impenetrable was the darkness, that no trace of either boat, or ship could be seen although the Sumter was distant only a few hundred yards. Not a sound could be heard on board the Sumter, although her deck was crowded with men. Everyone seemed busy with his own thoughts, and gazing eagerly in the direction of the doomed ship, endeavoring, in vain, to penetrate the thick darkness. Suddenly, one of the crew exclaimed, There is the flame. She is on fire. The decks of this main-built ship were of pine caulked with old-fashioned oakum, and paid with pitch. The woodwork of the cabin was like so much tinder, having been seasoned by many voyages to the tropics, and the forecastle was stowed with paints, and oils. The consequence was, that the flame was not long in kindling, but leapt, full-grown, into the air, in a very few minutes after its first faint glimmer had been seen. The boarding officer, to do his work more effectually, had applied the torch simultaneously in three places, the cabin, the main hold, 
and the forecastle, and now the devouring flames rushed up these three apertures, with a fury which nothing could resist. The burning ship, with the Sumter's boat in the act of shoving off from her side, the Sumter herself, with her grim, black sides, lying in repose like some great sea monster, gloating upon the spectacle, and the sleeping sea, for there was scarce a ripple upon the water, were all brilliantly lighted. The indraft into the burning ship's holds, and cabins, added every moment new fury to the flames, and now they could be heard roaring like the fires of a hundred furnaces, in full blast. The prize ship had been laid to, with her main topsail to the mast, and all her light sails, though clued up, were flying loose about the yards. The forked tongues of the devouring element, leaping into the rigging, newly tarred, ran rapidly up the shrouds, first into the tops, then to the top mastheads, thence to the top gallant, and royal mastheads, and in a moment more to the trucks, and whilst this rapid ascent of the main current of fire was going on, other currents had run out upon the yards, and ignited all the sails. A top gallant sail, all on fire, would now fly off from the yard, and sailing leisurely in the direction of the light breeze that was fanning, rather than blowing, break into bright, and sparkling patches of flame, and settle, or rather silt into the sea. The yard would then follow, and not being wholly submerged by its descent into the sea, would retain a portion of its flame, and continue to burn, as a floating brand, for some minutes. At one time, the intricate network of the cordage of the burning ship was traced, as with a pencil of fire, upon the black sky beyond, the many threads of flame twisting, and writhing, like so many serpents that had received their death wounds. The mizzenmast now went by the board, then the foremast, and in a few minutes afterward, the great mainmast tottered, reeled, and fell over the ship's side into the sea making a noise like that of the sturdy oak of the forests when it falls by the stroke of the axeman. By the light of this flamp, upon the lonely and silent sea, lighted of the passions of bad men who should have been our brothers, the Sumter, having aroused herself from her dream of vengeance, and run up her boats, moved forward on her course. The captain of the Golden Rocket watched the destruction of his ship from the quarter-deck of the Sumter, apparently with the calm eye of a philosopher, though, doubtless, he felt the emotions which the true sailor always feels, when he looks upon the dying agonies of his beloved ship, whether she be broken up by the storm, or perish in any other way. The flag. What was done with the old flag? It was marked with the day, and the latitude and longitude of the capture, and consigned to the keeping of the signal quartermaster, who prepared a bag for its reception, and when this bag was full, he prepared another, and another, as the cruise progressed, and occasion required. It was the especial pride of this veteran American seaman to count over his trophies, and when the weather was fine, he invariably asked permission of the officer of the deck, under pretense of damage from moths, to air his flags, and as he would bend on his signal halyards, and throw them out to the breeze, one by one, his old eye would glisten, and a grim smile of satisfaction would settle upon his sunburned, and weather-beaten features. This was our practice also on board the Alabama, and when that ship was sunk in the British Channel, in her engagement with the enemy's ship Kearsarge, as the reader will learn in due time, if he has the patience to follow me in these memoirs, we committed to the keeping of the guardian spirits of that famous old battleground, a great many bags full of old flags, to be stored away in the caves of the sea, as mementos that a nation once lived whose naval officers prized liberty more than the false memorial of it, under which they had once served, and who were capable, when it became hate's polluted drag of tearing it down. The prisoners, what did we do with them? The captain was invited to mess in the wardroom, and when he was afterward landed, the officers generously made him up a purse to supply his immediate necessities. The crew was put into a mess by themselves, with their own cook, and was put on a footing, with regard to rations, with the Sumter's own men. We were making war upon the enemy's commerce, but not upon his unarmed seamen. It gave me as much pleasure to treat these with humanity, 
as it did to destroy his ships, and one of the most cherished recollections which I have brought out of a war, which, in some sense, may be said to have been a civil war, is, that the pirate, whom the enemy denounced, with a pen dipped in Gaul, and with a vocabulary of which decent people should be ashamed, set that same enemy the example, which he has failed to follow, of treating prisoners of war, according to the laws of war. Chapter 13 Rapid work, seven prizes in two days, the Sumter makes her first port, and what occurred there? We burned the golden rocket, as has been seen, on the 3d of July. The next day was the glorious fourth once glorious, indeed, as the day on which a people broke the chains of a government which had bound them against their will, and vindicated the principle of self-government as an inalienable right, but since desecrated by the same people, who have scorned, and spat upon the record made by their fathers, and repudiated, as a heresy fraught with the penalties of treason, the inalienable right for which their fathers struggled. The grand old day belonged, of right, to us of the south, for we still venerated it, as hallowed by our fathers, and were engaged in a second revolution, to uphold, and defend the doctrines which had been proclaimed in the first, but we failed to celebrate it on board the Sumter. We could not help associating it with the old flag, which had now become a sham and a deceit, with the wholesale robberies which had been committed upon our property, and with the vilification and abuse which had been heaped upon our persons by our late co-partners, for a generation and more. The Declaration of Independence had proved to be a specious mask, under which our loving brethren of the North had contrived to draw us into a co-partnership with them, that they might be the better enabled, in the end, to devour us. How could we respect it, in such a connection? Accordingly, the captain of the Sumter was not invited to dine in the ward room, on the time honored day, nor was there any extra glass of grog served to the crew, as had been the custom in the old service. The weather still continued cloudy, with a few rain squalls passing with the trade wind, during the morning. I had turned into my cot, late on the previous night, and was still sleeping soundly, when, at daylight, an officer came below to inform me, that there were two sails in sight from the masthead. We were steaming, as before, up the south side of Cuba, with the land plainly in sight, and soon came close enough to distinguish that the vessels ahead were both brigantines, and probably Americans. There being no occasion to resort trues, or stratagem, as the wind was light, and there was no possibility of the ships running away from us, we showed them at once the Confederate colors, and at the same time fired a blank cartridge to heave them to. They obeyed our signal, promptly, and came to the wind, with their foretop sails aback, and the United States colors at their peaks. When within a few hundred yards, we stopped our engine, and lowered, and sent a boat on board of them, the boarding officer remaining only a few minutes on board of each, and bringing back with him, their respective masters, with their ship's papers. Upon examination of these, it appeared that one of the brigantines was called the Cuba, and the other the Machias, that they were both laden with sugar and molasses, for English ports, and that they had recently come out of the port of Trinidad to Cuba. Indeed the recency of their sailing was tested, by the way in which their stern boats were garlanded, with festoons of luscious bananas, and pineapples, and by sundry nets filled with golden-hued oranges, all of which was very tempting to the eyes and olfactories of men, who had recently issued from a blockaded port, in which such luxuries were tabooed. The cargoes of these small vessels being neutral, as certified by the papers, and indeed of this there could be little doubt, as they were going from one neutral port to another, I could not burn the vessels as I had done the golden rocket, and so after transferring prize crews to them, which occupied us an hour or two, we took them both in tow, and steamed away for Chienfuegos, it being my intention to test the disposition of Spain toward us, in this matter of taking in prizes. England and France had issued proclamations prohibiting both belligerents, alike, from bringing prizes into their ports, but Spain had not yet spoken, and I had hopes that she might be induced to pursue a different course. 
nothing worthy of note occurred during the rest of this day, we steamed leisurely along the coast, making about five knots an hour. Finding our speed too much diminished, by the towage of two heavily laden vessels, we cast off one of them, the Cuba, during the night and directed the prize master to make sail, and follow us into port. The Cuba did not rejoin us, and we afterward learned through the medium of the enemy's papers, that she had been recaptured by her crew. I had only sent a midshipman and four men on board of her as a prize crew, and the midshipman incautiously going aloft, to look out for the land, as he was approaching his port, and a portion of his prize crew proving treacherous, they were not Native Americans I am glad to say, he was fired upon by the master, and crew of the brig, who had gotten possession of the revolvers of the prize crew, and compelled to surrender, after defending himself the best he could, and being wounded in one or two places. The vessel then changed her course and made haste to get out of the Caribbean Sea. The morning of the fifth dawned cloudy, with the usual moderate trade wind. It cleared toward noon, and at 2 p.m. We crossed the shoal off the east end of the Jardinillo's Reef, in from seven to five fathoms of water. The sea, by this time, had become quite smooth, and the rays of a bright sun penetrated the clear waters to the very bottom of the shoal, revealing everything to us, as clearly as though the medium through which we were viewing it were atmosphere instead of water. Every rock, seashell, and pebble lying at the bottom of the sea were distinctly visible to us and we could see the little fish darting into their holes, and hiding places, as the steamer ploughed her way through their usually quiet domain. It was quite startling to look over the side, so shallow did the waters appear. The chart showed that there was no danger, and the faithful lead line, in the hands of a skilful seaman, gave us several fathoms of water to spare, and yet one could hardly divest himself of the belief that at the next moment the steamer would run aground. Crossing this shoal, we now hauled up N. E. by N, for the Chienfuego's lighthouse. As we approached the lights, we descried two more sail in the southeast, making an offing with all diligence, to which we immediately gave chase. They were eight or nine miles distant from the land, and to facilitate our pursuit, we cast off our remaining tow directing the prize master to heave to, off the lighthouse, and await our return. We had already captured three prizes, in twenty-four hours, and, as here were probably two more, I could perceive that my crew were becoming enamoured of their business, pretty much as the veteran fox hunter does in view of the chase. They moved about with great alacrity, in obedience to orders, the seamen springing aloft to furl the sails like so many squirrels and the firemen below sending up thick volumes of black smoke, from their furnaces. The Sumter, feeling the renewed impulse of her engines, sprang forward in pursuit of the doomed craft ahead, as if she too knew what was going on. We had just daylight enough left to enable us to accomplish our purpose, an hour or two later, and at least one of the vessels might have escaped. Coming up, first with one, and then the other, we hove them to, successively by hail, and brought the masters on board. They both proved to be brigantines, and were American, as we had supposed Colon one, the Ben. Dunning, of Maine, and the other, the Albert Adams, of Massachusetts. They had come out of the port of Chienfuegos, only a few hours before, were both sugar laden, and their cargoes were documented as Spanish property. We hastily threw prize crews on board of them, and directed the prize masters to stand in for the light, still in sight, distant about twelve miles, and hold on to it until daylight. It was now about ten p.m. Some appeal was made to me by the master of one of the brigantines, in behalf of his wife and a lady companion of hers, who were both invalids from the effects of yellow fever, which they had taken in Chienfuegos, and from which they were just convalescing. I desired him to assure ladies, that they should be treated with every tenderness, and respect, and that if they desired it, I would send my surgeon to visit them, but I declined to release the captured vessel on this account. We now stood in for the light ourselves, and letting our steam go down, to the lowest point consistent with locomotion, lay off, 
and on, until daylight. The next morning dawned beautiful, and bright, as a tropic morning only can dawn. We were close in under the land, and our prizes were lying around us, moving to and fro, gracefully, to preserve their positions. The most profuse, and luxuriant vegetation, of that peculiarly dark green known only to the tropics, ran down to the very water's edge, the beautiful little stream, on which she and Fuigos lies, disembogged itself at the foot of the lighthouse perched on a base of blackened limestone rock, and the neat, white fort, that set a mile or two up the river, was now glistening in the rays of the sun, just lifting himself above the central range of mountains. The sea breeze had died away during the night, and been replaced by the land breeze, in obedience to certain laws which prevail in all countries swept by the trade winds, and this land breeze, blowing so gently, as scarce to disturb a tress on the brow of beauty, came laden with the most delicious perfume of shrub and flower. But, what smoke is that we perceive, coming down the river? said I, to the officer of the deck. I will see in a moment, said this active young officer, and springing several ratlines up the rigging, to enable him to obtain a view over the intervening foliage, he said, there is a small steam tug coming down, with three vessels in tow, two barks and a brig. Can you make out the nationality of the ships in tow? I inquired. Plainly, he replied, they all have the American colors set. Here was a piece of unlooked for good fortune. I had not reckoned upon carrying more than three, or four prizes into port, but here were three others. But to secure these latter, a little management would be necessary. I could not molest them, within neutral jurisdiction, and the neutral jurisdiction extended to a marine league, or three geographical miles from the land. I immediately hoisted a Spanish jack at the fore, as a signal for a pilot, and directed the officer of the deck to disarrange his yards, a little, cockbilling this one, slightly, in one direction, and that one, in another, and to send all but about a dozen men below, to give the strangers the idea that we were a common merchant steamer, instead of a ship of war. To carry still further the illusion, we hoisted the Spanish merchant flag. But the real trouble was with the prizes, two of these must surely be recognized by their companions of only the day before. Luckily my prize masters took the hint I had given them, and hoisted their respective flags, at the fore, for a pilot also. This mystified the newcomers, and they concluded that the two brigantines, though very like, could not be the same. Besides, there was a third brigantine in company, and she evidently was a new arrival. And so they came on, quite unsuspiciously, and when the little steamer had towed them clear of the mouth of the harbour, she let them go and they made sail. The fellows worked very industriously, and soon had their ships under clouds of canvas, pressing them out to get an offing, before the sea breeze should come in. The steam tug, as soon as she had let go her toes, came alongside the Sumter, and a Spanish pilot jumped on board of me, asking me in his native tongue, if I desired to go up to town, showing that my ruse of the Spanish flag had even deceived him. I replied in the affirmative, and said to him, pleasantly, but I am waiting a little, to take back those ships you have just towed down. Diablo! said he, how can that be, they are Americanos del Norte, bound to Boston, and land with York. That is just what I want, said I, we are confederados, and we have Lagara with the Americanos del Norte. Caramba! said he, that is good. Give her the steam quick, Captain. No, no, replied I, wait a while. I must pay due respect to your Queen, and the Captain General, they command in these waters, within the league, and I must wait until the ships have passed beyond that. I accordingly waited until the ships had proceeded some five miles from the coast, as estimated both by the pilot, and myself, when we turned the Sumter's head seaward and again removed the leash. She was not long in pouncing upon the astonished prey. A booming gun, and the simultaneous descent of the Spanish, and ascent of the Confederate flag to the Sumter's Peak, when we had approached within about a mile of them, cleared up the mystery of the chase, 
and brought the fugitives to the wind. In half an hour more, their papers had been examined, prize crews had been thrown on board of them, and they were standing back in company with the Sumter, to rejoin the other prizes. I had now a fleet of six sail, and when the sea breeze set in next morning, which it did between nine and ten o'clock, I led into the harbor, the fleet following. The three newly captured vessels were the Bark West Wind, of Rhode Island, the Bark Louisa Clum, of Massachusetts, and the Brigantine Niad, of New York. They had all cargoes of sugar, which were covered by certificates of neutral property. When the Sumter came abreast of the small fort, which has already been noticed, we were surprised to see the sentinels on post fire a couple of loaded muskets, the balls of which whistled over our heads, and to observe them making gestures, indicating that we must come to anchor. This we immediately did, but the prizes, all of which had the United States colors flying, were permitted to pass, and they sped on their way to the town, some miles above, as they had been ordered. When we had let go our anchor, I dispatched Lieutenant Evans to the fort, to call on the Commandant, and ask for an explanation of his conduct, in bringing us to. The explanation was simple enough. He did not know what to make of the newborn Confederate flag. He had never seen it before. It did not belong to any of the nations of the earth, of which he had any knowledge, and we might be a buccaneer for aught he knew. In the afternoon, the Commandant himself came on board to visit me and inform me, on the part of the governor of Chienfuegos, with whom he had communicated, that I might proceed to the town, in the Sumter, if I desired. We drank a glass of wine together, and I satisfied him, that I had not come in to carry his fort by storm, which would have been an easy operation enough, as he had only about a corporal's guard under his command, or to sack the town of Chienfuegos, after the fashion of the Drakes, and other English sea robbers who have left so vivid an impression upon Spanish memory, as to make Spanish commandants of small forts, cautious of all strange craft. It had only been a week since the Sumter had run the blockade of New Orleans, and already she was out of fuel, having only coal enough left for about twenty-four hours steaming. Here was food for reflection. Active operations which would require the constant use of steam, would never do, for, by and by, when the enemy should get on my track, it would be easy for him to trace me from port to port, if I went into port once a week. I must endeavor to reach some cruising ground, where I could lie in wait for ships, under sail, and dispense with the use of steam, except for a few hours, at a time, for the purpose of picking up such prizes, as I could not decoy within reach of my guns. I was glad to learn from the pilot, that there was plenty of coal to be had in she and Fugos, and I dispatched Lieutenant Chapman to town, in one of the ship's cutters, for the double purpose of arranging for a supply, and communicating with the governor, on the subject of my prizes, and the position which Spain was likely to occupy, during the war. The following letter addressed by me to His Excellency will explain the object I had in view in coming into she and Fugos, and the hopes I entertained of the conduct of Spain, whose important island of Cuba lay, as it were, athwart our main gateway to the sea, the Gulf of Mexico. Confederate States Steamer Sumter. Island of Cuba, July 6, 1861. Sir Colon I have the honor to inform you, of my arrival at the port of Chienfuegos, with seven prizes of war. These vessels are the brigantines Cuba, 1, Machias, Ben. Dunning, Albert Adams, and Nyad, and Barks West Wind, and Louise Eklam, property of citizens of the United States, which states, as your excellency is aware, are waging an aggressive and unjust war upon the Confederate States, which I have the honor, with this ship under my command, to represent. I have sought a port of Cuba, with these prizes, with the expectation that Spain will extend to the cruisers of the Confederate States the same friendly reception that, in similar circumstances, she would extend to the cruisers of the enemy, in other words, that she will permit me to leave the captured vessels within her jurisdiction, until they can be adjudicated by a court of admiralty of the Confederate States. 
as a people maintaining a government de facto, and not only holding the enemy in check, but gaining advantages over him, we are entitled to all the rights of belligerents, and I confidently rely upon the friendly disposition of Spain, who is an near neighbor, in the most important of her colonial possessions, to receive us with equal and even-handed justice, if not with the sympathy which our identity of interests and policy, with regard to an important social and industrial institution, are so well calculated to inspire. A rule which would exclude our prizes from her port, during the war, although it should be applied, in terms, equally to the enemy, would not, I respectfully suggest, be an equitable, or just rule. The basis of such a rule, as indeed, of all the conduct of a neutral during war, is equal and impartial justice to all the belligerents, without inclining to the side of either, and this should be a substantial and practical justice, and not exist in terms merely, which may be deceptive. Now, a little reflection will, I think, show your excellency that the rule in question, the exclusion of the prizes of both belligerents from neutral port, cannot be applied in the present war, without operating with great injustice to the Confederate States. It is well known to your excellency, that the United States are a manufacturing and commercial people, whilst the Confederate States are an agricultural people. The consequence of this dissimilarity of pursuits was, that at the breaking out of the war, the former had within their limits, and control, almost all the naval force of the old government. This naval force they have dishonestly seized, and turned against the Confederate States, regardless of the just claims of the latter to a large proportion of it, as taxpayers, out of whose contributions to the common treasury it was created. The United States, by this decision of the property of the Confederate States, are enabled, in the first months of the war, to blockade all the ports of the latter states. In this condition of things, observe the practical working of the rule I am discussing, whatever may be the seeming fairness of its terms. It will be admitted that we have equal belligerent rights with the enemy. One of the most important of these rights, in a war against a commercial people, is that which I have just exercised, of capturing his property, on the high seas. But how are the Confederate States to enjoy, to its full extent, the benefit of this right, if their cruisers are not permitted to enter neutral port, with their prizes, and retain them there, in safe custody, until they can be condemned, and disposed of. They cannot send them into their own ports, for the reason already mentioned, viz., that those ports are hermetically sealed by the agency of their own ships, forcibly wrested from them. If they cannot send them into neutral ports, where are they to send them? Nowhere. Except for the purpose of destruction, therefore, their right of capture would be entirely defeated by the adoption of the rule in question, whilst the opposite belligerent would not be inconvenienced by it, at all, as all his own ports are open to him. I take it for granted, that Spain will not think of acting upon so unjust, and unequal a rule. But another question arises, indeed has already arisen, in the cases of some of the very captures which I have brought into port. The cargoes of several of the vessels are claimed, as appears by certificates found among the papers, as Spanish property. This fact cannot, of course, be verified, except by a judicial proceeding, in the prize courts of the Confederate States. But if the prizes cannot be sent either into the ports of the Confederate States, or into neutral port, how can this verification be made? Further, supposing there to be no dispute about the title to the cargo, how is it to be unladen, and delivered to the neutral claimant, unless the captured ship can make a port? Indeed, one of the motives which influenced me in making a Spanish colonial port, was the fact that these cargoes were claimed by Spanish subjects, whom I was desirous of putting to as little inconvenience as possible in the unlading and reception of their property, should it be restored to them, by a decree of the Confederate courts. It will be for your excellency to consider, and act upon these grave questions, touching alike the interests of both our governments. I have the honor to be, and see, and see. Raphael Semmes
I did not expect much to grow immediately out of the above communication. Indeed, as the reader will probably surmise, I had written it more for the eye of the Spanish Premier, than for that of the governor of a small provincial town, who had no diplomatic power, and whom I knew to be timid, as are all the subordinate officers of absolute governments. I presumed that the governor would telegraph it to the Captain General, at Havana, and that the latter would hold the subject in abeyance, until he could hear from the home government. Nor was I disappointed in this expectation, for Lieutenant Chapman returned from Chienfuegos, the next morning, and brought me intelligence to this effect. To dispose of the questions raised, without the necessity of again returning to them, the reader is informed, that Spain, in due time, followed the lead of England and France, in the matter of excluding prizes from her port, and that my prizes were delivered, to whom, do you think, reader? You will naturally say, to myself, or my duly appointed agent, with instructions to take them out of the Spanish port. This was the result to be logically expected. The Captain General had received them, in trust, as it were, to abide the decision of his government. If that decision should be in favor of receiving the prizes of both belligerents, well, if not, I expected to be notified to take them away. But nothing was further, it seems, from the intention of the Captain General, than this simple and just proceeding, for as soon as the Queen's proclamation was received, he deliberately handed back all my prizes to their original owners. This was so barefaced a proceeding, that it was necessary to allege some excuse for it, and the excuse given was, that I had violated the neutral waters of Cuba, and captured my three last prizes within the Marine League, my sympathizing friend, the Spanish pilot, and an English sailor, on board the tug, being vouched as the respectable witnesses to the fact. Such was the power of Spanish gold, and Yankee unscrupulousness in the use of it. When I heard of these transactions a few months afterward, I planned a very pretty little quarrel between the Confederate States and Spain, in case the former should be successful in establishing their independence. Cuba, I thought, would make us a couple of very respectable states, with her staples of sugar and tobacco, and with her similar system of labor, and if Spain refused to foot our bill for the robbery of these vessels, we would foot it ourselves, at her expense. But poor old Spain! I ought perhaps to forgive thee, for thou wast afterward kicked, and cuffed by the very power to which thou didst truckle. The federal steamers of war making a free use of thy coast of the ever faithful island of Cuba, chasing vessels on shore, and burning them, in contempt of thy jurisdiction, and in spite of thy remonstrances. And the day is not far distant, when the school mom and the carpet bag missionary will encamp on thy plantations, and hold joint conventicles with thy freedmen, in the interests of godliness, and the said mom and missionary. Great excitement was produced, as may be supposed, by the arrival of the Sumter, with her six prizes, at the quiet little town of Chienfuegos. Lieutenant Chapman was met by a host of sympathizers, and carried to their club, and afterward to the house of one of the principal citizens, who would not hear of his spending the night at a hotel, and installed as his honored guest. Neighbors were called in, and the night was made merry, to a late hour, by the popping of champagne corks and the story, and the song, and when the festivities had ceased, my tempest tossed lieutenant was laid away in the sweetest and whitest of sheets to dream of the eyes of the houries of the household, that had beamed upon him so kindly, that he was in danger of forgetting that he was a married man. For weeks afterward, his messmates could get nothing out of him, but something about Don this, and Donia that. There was a hurrying to and fro, too, of the stewards, and mess boys, as the cutter in which he returned, came alongside of the ship, for there were sundry boxes, marked Bordeaux, and set, and sundry baskets branded with anchors, and there were fruits, and flowers, and squalling chickens to be passed up. The principal coffee house of the place had been agog with wonders, the billiard players had rested idly on their cues, to listen to Madame Rumour with her thousand tongues, how the fort had fired into the Sumter, and how the Sumter had fired back at the fort, 
and how the matter had finally been settled by the Piratu and the Commandante, over a bottle of champagne. Yankee captains, and consignees, supercargoes, and consuls passed in, and out, in consultation, like so many ants whose nest had been trodden upon, and nothing could be talked of but freights, and insurance, with, and without the war risk, bills of lading, invoices, consuls certificates to cover cargoes, and last, though not least, where the d.l. all the federal gunboats were, that this confederate hawk should be permitted to make such a flutter in the Yankee dovecot. Chapter 14 The Sumter on the wing again, is put under sail for the time, reaches the island of Curaçao, and is only able to enter after a diplomatic fight. From what has been said in the last chapter, the reader will have observed how anxious I was to conform my conduct, in all respects, to the laws of war. My hope was, that some of the nations of the earth, at least, would give me an asylum for my prizes, so that I might have them formally condemned by the Confederate States prize courts, instead of being obliged to destroy them. It was with this hope, that I had entered the port of Chienfugos, as the reader has seen, and it was in furtherance of this object, that I now drew up the following appointment of a prize agent, who had come well recommended to me, as a gentleman of integrity and capacity. C.S. Steamer Sumter, Chienfugos. July 6, 1861. Sir Colon you are hereby appointed prize agent, for, and in behalf of the Confederate States of America, of the following prizes, to wit, the Cuba, Machias, Ben. Dunning, Albert Adams, Nyad, West Wind, and Louisa Clum, and their cargoes, until the same can be adjudicated, by the prize courts of the Confederate States, and disposed of by the proper authorities. You will take the necessary steps for the safe custody of these prizes, and you will not permit anything to be removed from, or disturbed on board of them. You will be pleased, also, to take the examinations of the master, and mate of each of these vessels, before a notary, touching the property of the vessels, and cargoes, and making a copy thereof, to be retained in your own possession, you will send, by some safe conveyance, the originals, addressed to the judge of the Confederate States District Court, New Orleans, La. I have the honor to be, and see. Raphael Semmes. Senor Don Mariano Diaz. During the day, the steam tug towed down from the town, for me, a couple of lighters, containing about 100 tons of coal, 5,000 gallons of water, and some fresh provisions for the crew. It was necessary that we should prepare for sea, with some dispatch, as there was a line of telegraph, from Chienfugos to Havana, where there were always a number of the enemy's ships of war stationed. As a matter of course, the U.S. Consul at Chienfugos had telegraphed to his brother Consul, in Havana, the arrival of the Sumter, in the first ten minutes after she had let go her anchor, and as another matter of course, there must already be several fast steamers on their way, to capture this piratical craft, which had thus so unceremoniously broken in upon the quiet of the Cuban waters, and the Yankee sugar, and rum trade. I had recourse to the chart and having ascertained at what hour these steamers would be enabled to arrive, I fixed my own departure, a few hours ahead, so as to give them the satisfaction of finding that the bird, which they were in pursuit of, had flown. My excellent first lieutenant came up to time, and the ship was reported ready for sea before sunset, or in a little more than twenty-four hours, after our arrival. To avoid the cold dust, which is one of the pests of a steamer, and the confusion, and noise which necessarily accompany the exceedingly poetic operation of coaling, I landed, as the sun was approaching the western horizon, in company with my junior lieutenant and sailing master, for a stroll, and to obtain sights for testing my chronometers, as well. Having disposed of the business part of the operation first, in obedience to the old maxim, that is to say, having made our observations upon the sun, for time. We wandered about, for an hour, and more, amid the rich tropical vegetation of this queen of islands, now passing under the flowering acacia, and now under the deep foliaged orange tree, 
which charmed two senses at once, that of smell, by the fragrance of its young flowers, and that of sight, by the golden hue of its luscious and tempting fruit. We had landed abreast of our ship, and a few steps sufficed to put us in the midst of a dense wilderness, of floral beauty, with nothing to commune with but nature. What a contrast there was between this peaceful, and lovely scene, and the life we had led for the last week. We almost loathed to go back to the dingy walls, and close quarters of our little craft, where everything told us of war, and admonished us that a life of toil, vexation, and danger lay before us, and that we must bid a long farewell to rural scenes, and rural pleasures. As we still wandered, absorbed in such speculations as these, unconscious of the flight of time, the sound of the evening gun came booming on the ear, to recall us to our senses, and retracing our steps, we hurriedly re-embarked. That evening's stroll lingered long in my memory, and was often recalled, amid the whistling, and surging of the gale, and the tumbling, and discomforts of the ship. I had been looking anxiously, for the last few hours, for the arrival of our prize brigantine, the Cuba, but she failed to make her appearance, and I was forced to abandon the hope of getting back my prize crew from her. I left with my prize agent, the following letter of instructions for the midshipman in command of the Cuba. Confederate States Steamer Sumter. Chienfuegos, July 7, 1861. Sir Colon upon your arrival at this place, you will put the master, mate, and crew of the Cuba on parole, not to serve against the Confederate States, during the present war, unless exchanged, and release them. You will then deliver the brigantine to the governor, for safe custody, until the orders of the Captain General can be known in regard to her. I regret much that you are not able to arrive in time, to rejoin the ship, and you must exercise your judgment, as to the mode in which you shall regain your country. You will, no doubt, be able to raise sufficient funds for transporting yourself, and the four seamen who are with you, to some point in the Confederate States, upon a bill of exchange, which you are hereby authorized to draw, upon the Secretary of the Navy. Upon your arrival within our territory, you will report yourself to that officer. Your baggage has been sent you by the pilot. Midshipman A. G. Hudgens. I did not meet Mr. Hudgens, afterward, until as a rear admiral, I was ordered to the command of the James River Fleet, in the winter of 1864. He was then attached to one of my ships, as a lieutenant. On the retreat from Richmond, I made him a captain of light artillery and he was paroled with me, at Greensboro, North Carolina, in May 1865. How he has settled with my friend, the Spanish pilot, who agreed with me that the prizes which I captured, off Chienfuegos, were five miles from the land, and with the northern claimants, and the Captain General of Cuba, that they were less than three miles from it, about his baggage, I have never learned. Everything being in readiness for sea, on board the Sumter, and the officers having all returned from their visits to the town, at 11 p.m., we got under way, and as the bell struck the midnight hour, we steamed out of the harbor, the lamps from the lighthouse throwing a bright glare upon our deck, as we passed under its shadow, close enough to have tossed a biscuit to the keeper, so bold is the entrance of the little river. The sea was nearly calm, and the usual land breeze was gently breathing, rather than blowing. Having given the course to the officer of the deck, I was glad to go below, and turn in, after the excitement, and confusion of the last forty-eight hours. When some seven or eight miles from the land, we lost the land breeze, and were struck by the sea breeze, nearly ahead, with some force. We steamed on, all the next day, without any incident to break in upon the monotony, except a short chase which we gave to a brigantine, which proved, upon our coming up with her, to be Spanish. Between nine, and ten o'clock in the evening, we passed the small islands of the Caymans, which we found to be laid down in the charts we were using, some fifteen or sixteen miles too far to the westward. As there is a current setting in the vicinity of these islands, and as the islands themselves are so low, as to be seen with difficulty, 
in a dark night, comma, and the night on which we were passing them was dark, comma, I make this observation, to put navigators on their guard. The morning of the 9th of July dawned clear, and beautifully, but as the sun gained power, the trade wind increased, until it blew half a gale, raising considerable sea, and impeding the progress of the ship. Indeed, so little speed did we make, that the island of Jamaica, which we had descried with the first streaks of dawn, remained in sight all day, its blue mountains softened but not obliterated by the distance as the evening set in. The sea was as blue as the mountains, and the waves seemed almost as large, to our eyes, as the little steamer plunged into, and struggled with them, in her vain attempt to make headway. All the force of her engine was incapable of driving her at a greater speed than five knots. The next day, and the day after were equally unpropitious. Indeed the weather went from bad, to worse, for now the sky became densely overcast, with black, and angry looking clouds, and the wind began to whistle through the rigging, with all the symptoms of a gale. We were approaching the hurricane season, and there was no telling at what moment, one of those terrible cyclones of the Caribbean Sea might sweep over us. To add to the gloominess of the prospect, we were comparatively out of the track of commerce, and had seen no sail, since we had overhauled the Spanish brigantine. As explained to the reader, in one of the opening chapters, it was my intention to proceed from Cuba, to Barbados, there coal, and thence make the best of my way to Cape Street Roque, in Brazil, where I expected to reap a rich harvest from the enemy's commerce. I was now obliged to abandon, or at least to modify this design. It would not be possible for me to reach Barbados, with my present supply of coal, in the teeth of such trade winds, as I had been encountering for the last few days. I therefore determined to bend down toward the Spanish main, converting the present head wind, into a fair wind, for at least a part of the way, and hoping to find the weather more propitious, on that coast. It was now the 13th of July, and as we had sailed from Chienfuegos, on the 7th, we had consumed six out of our eight days supply of fuel. Steaming was no longer to be thought of, and we must make some port under sail. The Dutch island of Curaçao lay under our lee, and we accordingly made sail for that island. The engineer was ordered to let his fires go down, and uncouple his propeller that it might not retard the speed of the ship and the sailors were sent aloft to loose the top sails. This was the first time that we were to make use of our sails, unaided by steam, and the old sailors of the ship, who had not bestridden a yard for some months, leapt aloft, with a will, to obey the welcome order. The race of sailors has not yet entirely died out, though the steamship is fast making sad havoc with it. There is the same difference between the old-time sailor, who has been bred in the sailing ship, and the modern sailor of the steamship, that there is between the well-trained foxhound, who chases Renard all day, and the cur that dodges a rabbit about, for half an hour or so. The sailing ship has a romance, and a poetry about her, which is thoroughly killed by steam. The sailor of the former loves, for its own sake, the howling of the gale, and there is no music so sweet to his ear as the shouting of orders through the trumpet of the officer of the deck, when he is poised upon the top sail yard, of the rolling and tumbling ship, hauling out the weather earring. It is the Rand's de Vash, which recalls the memory of his boyhood, and youth, when under the tutelage of some foster father of an old salt, he was taking his first lessons in seamanship. It used to be beautiful to witness the rivalry of these children of the deep, when the pitiless hurricane was scourging their beloved ship, and threatening her with destruction. The greater the danger, the more eager the contest for the post of honor. Was there a sail to be secured, which appeared about to be torn into ribbons, by the gale, and the loose gear of which threatened to whip the sailor from the yard, or was there a topmast to be climbed, which was bending like a willow wand under the fury of the blast, threatening to part at every moment? and throw the climber into the raging, and seething cauldron of waters beneath, from which it would be impossible to rescue him, Jack, noble Jack was ever ready for the service. 
I have seen an old naval captain, who had been some years retired from the sea, almost melt into tears, as he listened to the musical heaving of the lead by an old sailor, in the chains of a passing ship of war. But steam, practical, commonplace, hard-working steam, has well nigh changed all this, and cut away the webbing from the foot of the old-time sailor. Seamanship, evolutions, invention, skill, and ready resource in times of difficulty, and danger, have nearly all gone out of fashion, and instead of reefing the top sails, and club hauling, and box hauling the ship, some order is now sent to the engineer, about regulating his fires, and paying attention to his steam gauges. Alas! Alas! There will be no more Nelsons, and Collingwoods, and no more such venerable bulwarks upon the deep, as the Victory, and the Royal Sovereign. In future wars upon the ocean, all combatants will be on the dead level of impenetrable iron walls, with regard to dash, and courage, and with regard to seamanship, and evolutions, all the knowledge that will be required of them, will be to know how to steer a nondescript box toward their enemy. Our first night under canvas, I find thus described, in my journal, heavy sea all night, and ship rolling, and tumbling about, though doing pretty well. The propeller revolves freely, and we are making about five knots. The next day was Sunday, and the weather was somewhat ameliorated. The wind continued nearly as fresh as before, but as we were now running a point free, this was no objection, and the black, angry clouds had disappeared, leaving a bright, and cheerful sky. A sail was seen on the distant horizon, but it was too rough to chase. This was our usual muster day, but the decks were wet, and uncomfortable, and I permitted my crew to rest, they having scarcely yet recovered from the fatigue of the last few days. There is, perhaps, no part of the world where the weather is so uniformly fine, as on the Spanish main. The cyclones never bend in that direction, and even the ordinary gales are unknown. We were already beginning to feel the influence of this meteorological change, for on Monday, the 15th of July, the weather was thus described in my journal, weather moderating, and the sea going down, though still rough. Nothing seen. In the afternoon, pleasant, with a moderate breeze, and the clouds assuming their usual soft, fleecy, trade wind appearance. The next day was still clear, though the wind had freshened, and the ship was making good speed. At 9 a.m., we made the land, on the starboard bow, which proved to be the island of Uba, to leeward, a few miles, of Curaçao. For some hours past, we had been within the influence of the equatorial current, which sets westward, along this coast, with considerable velocity, and it had carried us a little out of our course, though we had made some allowance for it. We hauled up, a point, or two, and at 11 a.m., we made the island of Curaçao, on the port bow. We doubled the northwest end of the island, at about 4 p.m., and hauling up on the south side of it we soon brought the wind ahead, when it became necessary to put the ship under steam again, and to furl the sails. The afternoon proved beautifully bright, and clear, the sea was of a deep indigo blue, and we were all charmed, even with this barren little island, as we steamed along its bold, and blackened shores, of limestone rock, alongside of which the heaviest ship might have run, and throwing out her bow and stern lines, made herself fast with impunity, so perpendicularly deep were the waters. Our average distance from the land, as we steamed along, was not greater than a quarter of a mile. There were a few stunted trees, only, to be seen, in the little ravines, and some wild shrubbery, and sickly looking grass, struggling for existence on the hill's sides. A few goats were browsing about here, and there, and the only evidence of commerce, or thrift, that we saw, were some piles of salt, that had been raked up from the lagoons, ready for shipment and yet the Dutch live, and thrive here, and have built up quite a pretty little town, that of St. Anne's, to which we were bound. The explanation of which is, that the island lies contiguous to the Venezuelan coast, 
and is a free port, for the introduction of European, and American goods, in which a considerable trade is carried on, with the mainland. We arrived off the town, with its imposing battlements frowning on either side of the harbour, about dusk, and immediately hoisted a jack, and fired a gun, for a pilot. In the course of half an hour, or so, this indispensable individual appeared, but it was too late, he said, for us to attempt the entrance, that night. He would come off, the first thing in the morning, and take us in. With this assurance we rested satisfied, and lay off, and on, during the night, under easy steam. But we were not to gain entrance to this quaint little Dutch town, so easily, as had been supposed. We were to have here a foretaste of the trouble, that the federal consuls were to give us in the future. We have already commented on the love of office of the American people. There is no hole, or corner of the earth, into which a ship can enter, and where there is a dollar to be made, that has not its American consul, small or large. The smallest of salaries are eagerly accepted, and, as a consequence, the smallest of men are sometimes sent to fill these places. But the smaller the place, the bigger were the cocked hats and epaulets the officials wore, and the more brimful were they of patriotism. At the time of which I am writing, they called one William H. Seward, master, and they had taken Billy's measure to a fraction. They knew his tastes, and pandered to them, accordingly. His circular letters had admonished them, that, in their intercourse with foreign nations, they must speak of our great civil war, as a mere rebellion, that would be suppressed, in from sixty, to ninety days, insist that we were not entitled to belligerent rights, and call our cruisers, corsairs, or pirates. Accordingly, soon after the pilot had landed, from the Sumter, carrying with him to the shore, the intelligence that she was a Confederate States cruiser, the Federal Consul made his appearance at the Government House and claimed that the pirate should not be permitted to enter the harbour, informing His Excellency, the Governor, that Mr. Seward would be irate, if such a thing were permitted, and that he might expect to have the stone, and mortar of his two forts knocked about his ears, in double quick, by the ships of war of the Great Republic. This bold, and defiant tone, of the doughty little consul, seemed to stagger His Excellency it would not be so pleasant to have St. Anne's demolished, merely because a steamer with a flag that nobody had seen before, wanted some coal, and so, the next morning, bright and early, he sent the pilot off, to say to me, that the governor could not permit the Sumter to enter, having received recent orders from Holland to that effect. Here was a pretty kettle of fish. The Sumter had only one day's fuel left, and it was some distance from Curaçoa to any other place, where coal was to be had. I immediately sent for Lieutenant Chapman, and directed him to prepare himself for a visit to the shore, and calling my clerk, caused him to write, after my dictation, the following dispatch to His Excellency. Confederate States Steamer Sumter. Off St. Anne's, Curaçao, July 17, 1861. His Excellency Governor Krill. I was surprised to receive, by the pilot, this morning, a message from your excellency, to the effect that this ship would not be permitted to enter the harbour, unless she was in distress, as your excellency had received orders from his government not to admit vessels of war of the Confederate States of America, to the hospitality of the port, under your excellency's command. I most respectfully suggest that there must be some mistake here, and I have sent to you the bearer, Lieutenant Chapman, of the Confederate States Navy, for the purpose of an explanation. Your Excellency must be under some misapprehension as to the character of this vessel. She is a ship of war, duly commissioned by the government of the Confederate States, which states have been recognized, as belligerents, in the present war, by all the leading powers of Europe, viz. Colon Great Britain, France, Spain, and C as your excellency must be aware. It is true, that these powers have prohibited both belligerents, alike, from bringing prizes into their several jurisdictions, but no one of them has made a distinction, either between the respective prizes, or the cruisers, themselves, of the two belligerents, 
the cruisers of both governments, unaccompanied by prizes, being admitted to the hospitalities of the ports of all these great powers, on terms of perfect equality. In the face of these facts, am I to understand from your excellency, that Holland has adopted a different rule, and that she not only excludes the prizes, but the ships of war, themselves, of the Confederate States? And this, at the same time, that she admits the cruisers of the United States, thus departing from her neutrality, in this war, ignoring the Confederate States, as belligerents, and aiding and abetting their enemy? If this be the position which Holland has assumed, in this contest, I pray your excellency to be kind enough to say as much to me in writing. When this epistle was ready, Chapman shoved off for the shore, and a long conference ensued. The governor called around him, as I afterward learned, all the dignitaries of the island, civil and military, and a grand council of state was held. These Dutchmen have a ponderous way of doing things, and I have no doubt, the gravity of this council was equal to that held in New Amsterdam in colonial days, as described by the renowned historian Diedrich Knickerbocker, at which Wout van Twiller, the doubter, was present. Judging by the time that Chapman was waiting for his answer, during which he had nothing to do but sip the most delightful mint juleps, for these islanders seemed to have robbed old Virginia of some of her famous mint patches, in company with an admiring crowd of friends, the councillors must have smoked and talked, and smoked again, pondered with true Dutch gravity, all the arguments, pro and con, that were offered, and weighed my dispatch along with the recent order from Holland, in a torsion balance, to see which was heaviest. After the lapse of an hour, or two, becoming impatient, I told my first lieutenant, that as our men had not been practiced at the guns, for some time, I thought it would be as well to let them burst a few of our eight-inch shells, at a target. Accordingly the drum beat to quarters, a great stir was made about the deck, as the guns were cast loose and pretty soon, whiz! went a shell, across the windows of the council chamber, which overlooked the sea, the shell bursting like a clap of rather sharp, ragged thunder, a little beyond, in close proximity, to the target. Sundry heads were seen immediately to pop out of the windows of the chamber, and then to be withdrawn very suddenly, as though the owners of them feared that another shell was coming, and that my gunners might make some mistake in their aim. By the time we had fired three or four shells, all of which bursted with beautiful precision, Chapman's boat was seen returning, and thinking that our men had had exercise enough, we ran out and secured the guns. My lieutenant came on board, smiling, and looking pleasantly, as men will do, when they are bearers of good news, and said that the governor had given us permission to enter. We were lying close in with the entrance, and in a few minutes more, the Sumter was gliding gracefully past the houses, on either side of her, as she ran up the little canal, or river, that split the town in two. The quays were crowded with a motley gathering of the town's people, men, women, and children, to see us pass, and sailors waved their hats to us, from the shipping in the port. Running through the town into a landlocked basin, in its rear, the Sumter let go her anchor, hoisted out her boats and spread her awnings, comma, and we were once more in port. Chapter 15 The Sumter at Curaçoa, her surroundings, preparations for sea, and departure, the capture of other prizes, Puerto Cabello, and what occurred there. The Sumter had scarcely swung to her anchors, in the small landlocked harbour described, before she was surrounded by a fleet of bum boats, laden with a profusion of tropical fruits and filled with men, and women, indifferently, the women rather preponderating. These bumboat women are an institution in Curaçoa, the profession descends from mother to daughter and time seems to operate no change among them. It had been nearly a generation since I was last at Curaçoa. I was then a gay, rollicking young midshipman, in the old navy, and it seemed as though I were looking upon the same faces, and listening to the same confusion of voices as before. The individual women had passed away, of course, but the bumboat women remained. 
they wore the same party-colored handkerchiefs wound gracefully around their heads, the same gingham or muslin dresses, and exposed similar, if not the same, bare arms, and unstockinged legs. They were admitted freely on board, with their stocks in trade, and pretty soon Jack was on capital terms with them, converting his small change into fragrant bananas, and blood-red oranges, and replenishing his tobacco pouch for the next cruise. As Jack is a gallant fellow, a little flirtation was going on too with the purchasing, and I was occasionally highly amused at these joint efforts at trade and love-making. No one but a bumboat woman is ever a sailor's blanche I suse, eight par consequence a number of well-filled clothes bags soon made their appearance, on deck, from the different apartments of the ship and were passed into the boats alongside. These people all speak excellent English, though with a drawl, which is not unmusical, when the speaker is a sprightly young woman. Jack has a great fondness for pets, and no wonder, poor fellow, debarred, as he is, from all family ties, and with no place he can call his home, but his ship and pretty soon my good-natured first lieutenant had been seduced into giving him leave to bring sundry monkeys, and parrots on board, the former of which were now gambling about the rigging, and the latter waking the echoes of the harbour with their squalling. Such was the crowd upon our decks, and so serious was the interruption to business, that we were soon obliged to lay restrictions upon the bumboat fleet, by prohibiting it from coming alongside, except at meal hours which we always designated by hoisting a red pennant, at the mizzen. It was curious to watch the movements of the fleet, as these hours approached. Some twenty or thirty boats would be lying upon their oars, a few yards from the ship, each with from two to half a dozen inmates, eagerly watching the old quartermaster, whose duty it was to hoist the pennant, the women chattering, and the parrots squalling, whilst the oarsmen were poising their oars that they might get the first stroke over their competitors in the race. At length, away goes the flag. And then what a rushing and clattering, and bispatering until the boats are alongside. In an hour after our anchor had been let go, the business of the ship, for the next few days, had all been arranged. The first lieutenant had visited a neighboring shipyard, and contracted for a new foretop mast, to supply the place of the old one which had been sprung. The paymaster had contracted for a supply of coal, and fresh provisions, daily, for the crew, and for having the ship watered, the latter no unimportant matter, in this rainless region, and I had sent an officer to call on the governor, with my card, being too unwell to make the visit, in person. Upon visiting the shore the next day, I found that we were in a quasi-enemy's territory, for besides the federal consul before spoken of, a Boston man had entrenched himself in the best hotel in the place, as proprietor, and was doing a thriving business, far away from war's alarms, and a New Yorker had the monopoly of taking all the fizes of the staid old Dutchman, John Smith, of New York, photographer hanging high above the artist's windows, on a signboard that evidently had not been painted by a curasso un. Mr. Smith had already taken an excellent photograph of the Sumter, which he naively enough told me, was intended for the New York Illustrated Papers. If I had had ever so much objection, to having the likeness of my ship hung up in such a rogue's gallery, I had no means of preventing it. Besides, it could do us but little damage, in the way of identification, as we had the art of disguising the Sumter so that we would not know her, ourselves, at half a dozen miles distance. I was surprised, one morning, during our stay here, whilst I was lounging, listlessly, in my cabin, making a vain attempt to read, under the infliction of the corkers overhead, who were striking their corking irons with a vigor, and rapidity, that made the tympanum of my ears ring again, at the announcement that on somebody or other, the private secretary of President Castro, desired to see me. The corkers were sent away, and His Excellency's private secretary brought below. President Castro was one of those unfortunate South American chiefs, who had been beaten in a battle of ragamuffins, and compelled to fly his country. He was president of Venezuela, and had been deprived of his office, 
before the expiration of his term, by some military aspirant, who had seated himself in the presidential chair, instead, and was now in exile in Curaçao, with four of the members of his cabinet. The object of the visit of his secretary was to propose to me to reinstate the exiled president, in his lost position, by engaging in a military expedition, with him, to the mainland. Here was a chance, now, for an ambitious man. I might become the Warwick of Venezuela, and put the crown on another's head, if I might not wear it myself. I might hoist my admiral's flag, on board the Sumter, and take charge of all the piragas, and canoes, that composed the Venezuelan navy, whilst my colleague mustered those men in Buckram, so graphically described by Sir John Falstaff, and made an onslaught upon his despoiler. But unfortunately for friend Castro, I was like one of those damsels who had already plighted her faith to another, before the new wooer appeared, I was not in the market. I listened courteously, however, to what the secretary had to say, told him, that I felt flattered by the offer of his chief, but that I was unable to accept it. I cannot, I continued, consistently with my obligations to my own country, engage in any of the revolutionary movements of other countries. But, said he, Senor Castro is the de jure president of Venezuela, and you would be upholding the right in assisting him semicolon can you not, at least, land us, with some arms and ammunition, on the mainland? I replied that, as a Confederate States officer, I could not look into de jure claims. These questions were for the Venezuelans, themselves, to decide. The only government I could know in Venezuela was the de facto government, for the time being, and that, by his own showing, was in the hands of his antagonists. Here the conversation closed, and my visitor, who had the bearing and speech of a cultivated gentleman, departed. The jottings of my diary for the next few days, will perhaps now inform the reader, of our movements, better than any other form of narrative. July 19th Wind unusually blustering this morning, with partial obscuration of the heavens. The engineers are busy, overhauling and repairing damages to their engine and boilers. The gunner is at work, polishing up his battery and ventilating his magazine, and the sailors are busy renewing ratlines and tarring down their rigging. An English bark entered the harbour today from Liverpool. July 20th. Painting and refitting ship, got off the new foretopmast from the shore. It is a good pine stick, evidently from our southern states, and has been well fashioned. The monthly packet from the island of St. Thomas arrived, today, bringing newspapers from the enemy's country as late as the 26th of June. We get nothing new from these papers, except that the northern beehive is all agog with the marching and counter-marching of troops. July 21 SD. Fresh trade winds, with flying clouds, atmosphere highly charged with moisture, but no rain. This being Sunday, we mustered and inspected the crew. The washerwomen have decidedly improved the appearance of the young officers, the glistening of white shirt bosoms and collars having been somewhat unusual on board of the Sumter, of late. The crew look improved too by their change of diet, and the use of antiscabutics, which have been supplied to them, at the request of the surgeon, though some of them, having been on shore, on liberty, have brought off a blackened dye. No matter, the more frequently Jack settles his accounts, on shore, the fewer he will have to settle on board ship, in breach of discipline. We read, at the muster, today, the finding and sentence of the first court-martial, that has sat on board the Sumter since she reached the high seas. July 22 D. Warped alongside a wharf, in the edge of the town, and commenced receiving coal on board. Refitting, and repainting ship. In the afternoon, I took a lonely stroll through the town, mainly in the suburbs. It is a quaint, picturesque old place, with some few modern houses, but the general air is that of dilapidation, and a decay of trade. The lower classes are simple, and primitive in their habits, and but little suffices to supply their wants. The St. Thomas packet sailed, today, and, as a consequence, 
the federal cruisers, in and about that island, will have intelligence of our whereabouts, in four or five days. To mislead them, I have told the pilot, and several gentlemen from the shore, in great confidence, that I am going back to cruise on the coast of Cuba. The packet will of course take that intelligence to St. Thomas. July 23 D. Still coaling, refitting and painting. Weather more cloudy, and wind not so constantly fresh, within the last few days. Having taken sights for our chronometers, on the morning after our arrival, and again today, I have been enabled to verify their rates. They are running very well. The chronometer of the Golden Rocket proves to be a good instrument. We fix the longitude of Curaçao to be 68 degrees 58 30 inches, west of Greenwich. July 24 th. Sky occasionally obscured, with a moderate trade wind. Our men have all returned from their visits to the shore, except one, a simple lad named Dor, who, as I learn, has been seduced away, by a Yankee skipper, in port, aided by the Boston hotel keeper, and our particular friend, the consul. As these persons have tampered with my whole crew, I am gratified to know, that there has been but one traitor found among them. We had now been a week in Curaçao, during which time, besides recruiting, and refreshing my crew, I had made all the necessary preparations for another cruise. The ship had been thoroughly overhauled, inside and out, and her coal bunkers were full of good English coal. It only remained for us to put to sea. Accordingly, at twelve o'clock precisely, on the day last above mentioned, as had been previously appointed, the Sumter, bidding farewell to her new made friends, moved gracefully out of the harbor, this time, amid the waving of handkerchiefs, in female hands, as well as of hats in the hands of the males, the key being lined, as before, to see us depart. The photographer took a last shot at the ship, as she glided past his sanctum, and we looked with some little interest to the future numbers of the Journal of Civilization, vulgarly clipped Harper's Weekly, for the interesting portrait, which came along in due time, accompanied by a lengthy description, voracious, of course, of the pirate. Curaçao lies a short distance off the coast of Venezuela, between Lagra and Puerto Cabello, and as both of these places had some commerce with the United States, I resolved to look into them. The morning after our departure found us on a smooth sea, with a light breeze off the land. The mountains, back of Lagra, loomed up blue, mystic, and majestic, at a distance of about thirty miles, and the lookout, at the masthead, was on the quay vive for strange sails. He had not to wait long. In the tropics, there is very little of that bewitching portion of the twenty-four hours, which, in other parts of the world, is called twilight. Day passes into night, and night into day, almost at a single bound. The rapidly approaching dawn had scarcely revealed to us the bold outline of the coast, above mentioned, when sail ho! resounded from the masthead. The sail bore on our port bow, and was standing obliquely toward us. We at once gave chase, and at half past six a. m. came up with, and captured the schooner Abbey Bradford, from New York, bound for Puerto Cabello. We knew our prize to be American, long before she showed us her colors. She was a down east, fore and aft schooner, and there are no other such vessels in the world. They are as thoroughly marked, as the Puritans who build them and there is no more mistaking the cut of their jib. The little schooner was provision laden, and there was no attempt to cover her cargo. The news of the escape of the Sumter had not reached New York, at the date of her sailing, and the few privateers that we had put afloat, at the beginning of the war, had confined their operations to our own, and the enemy's coasts. Hence the neglect of the owners of the Bradford, in not providing her with some good English, or Spanish certificates protesting that her cargo was neutral. The old flag was treated very tenderly on the present occasion. The flaunting lie, which Mr. Horace Greeley had told us, should insult no sunny sky, was hauled down, and stowed away in the quartermaster's bag described a few pages back.
the Bradford being bound for Puerto Cabello, and that port being but a short distance, under my lee, I resolved to run down, with the prize, and try my hand with my friend Castro's opponent, the de facto president of Venezuela, to see whether I could not prevail upon him, to admit my prizes into his ports. I thought, surely, an arrangement could be made with some of these beggarly South American republics, the revenue of which did not amount to a cargo of provisions, annually, and which were too weak, besides, to be worth kicking by the stronger powers. What right had they, thought I, to be putting on the airs of nations, and talking about acknowledging other people, when they had lived a whole generation, themselves, without the acknowledgement of Spain? But, as the reader will see, I reckoned without my host. I found that they had a wholesome fear of the federal gunboats, and that even their cupidity could not tempt them to be just, or generous. If they had admitted my prizes into their ports, I could, in the course of a few months, have made those same ports more busy with the hum and thrift of commerce, than they had ever been before, I could have given a new impulse to their revolutions, and made them rich enough to indulge in the luxury of a pronunciamento once a week. The bait was tempting, but there stood the great lion in their path, the model republic. The fact is, I must do this model republic the justice to say, that it not only bullied the little South American republics, but all the world besides. Even old John Bull, grown rich, and plethoric, and asthmatic and gouty, trembled when he thought of his rich argosies, and of the possibility of Yankee privateers chasing them. Taking the Bradford in tow, then, we squared away for Puerto Cabello, but darkness came on before we could reach the entrance of the harbour, and we were compelled to stand off and on, during the night, the schooner being cast off, and taking care of herself, under sail. The sumter lay on the still waters, all night, like a huge monster asleep, with the light from the lighthouse, on the battlements of the fort, glaring full upon her and in plain hearing of the shrill cry of alerta, from the sentinels. So quietly did she repose, with banked fires, being fanned, but not moved, by the gentle land breeze that was blowing, that she scarcely needed to turn over her propeller during the night, to preserve her relative position with the light. There was no occasion to be in a hurry to run in, the next morning, as no business could be transacted before ten, or eleven o'clock and so I waited until the sun, with his broad disc glaring upon us, like an angry furnace, had rolled away the mists of the morning, and the first lieutenant had wholly stoned his decks, and arranged his hammock nettings, with his neat, white hammocks stowed in them, before we put the ship in motion. We had, some time before, hoisted the Confederate States flag, and the Venezuelan colors were flying from the fort in response. The prize accompanied us in, and we both anchored, within a stone's throw of the town, the latter looking like some old Moorish city, that had been transported by magic to the new world, Galanizos, and all. Whilst my clerk was copying my dispatch to the governor, and the lieutenant was preparing himself, and his boat's crew, to take it on shore, I made a hasty reconnaissance of the fort, which had a few iron pieces of small caliber mounted on it, well eaten by rust, and whose carriages had rotted from under them. The following is a copy of my letter to His Excellency. Confederate States Steamer Sumter. Puerto Cabello, July 26, 1861. His Excellency, the Governor. I have the honor to inform Your Excellency of my arrival at this place, in this ship, under my command, with the prize schooner, Abbey Bradford in company, captured by me about seventy miles to the northward and eastward. The Abbey Bradford is the property of citizens of the United States, with which states, as your excellency is aware, the Confederate States, which I have the honor to represent, are at war, and the cargo would appear to belong, also, to citizens of the United States, who have shipped it, on consignment, to a house in Puerto Cabello. Should any claim, however, be given for the cargo, or any part of it. The question of ownership can only be decided by the prize courts of the Confederate States. In the meantime, I have the honor to request, 
that your excellency will permit me to leave this prize vessel, with her cargo, in the port of Puerto Cabello, until the question of prize can be adjudicated by the proper tribunals of my country. This will be a convenience to all parties, as well to any citizens of Venezuela, who may have an interest in the cargo, as to the captors, who have also valuable interests to protect. In making this request, I do not propose that the Venezuelan government shall depart from a strict neutrality between the belligerents, as the same rule it applies to us, it can give the other party the benefit of, also. In other words, with the most scrupulous regard for her neutrality, she may permit both belligerents to bring their prizes into her waters, and, of this, neither belligerent could complain, since whatever justice is extended to its enemy, is extended also to itself. Here follows a repetition of the facts with regard to the seizure of the navy by the federal authorities, and the establishment of the blockade of the southern port, already stated in my letter to the governor of Chienfuegos, thus, your excellency sees, that under the rule of exclusion, the enemy could enjoy his right of capture, to its full extent, all his own ports being open to him, whilst the cruisers of the confederate states could enjoy it, submodo, only, that is, for the purpose of destroying their prizes. A rule which would produce such unequal results as this, is not a just rule, although it might, in terms, be extended to both parties, and as equality and justice, are of the essence of neutrality, I take it for granted, that Venezuela will not adopt it. On the other hand, the rule admitting both parties, alike, with their prizes into your ports, until the prize courts of the respective countries could have time to adjudicate the cases, would work equal and exact justice to both, and this is all that the Confederate States demand. With reference to the present case, as the cargo consists chiefly of provisions, which are perishable, I would ask leave to sell them, at public auction, for the benefit of whom it may concern, depositing the proceeds with a suitable prize agent until the decision of the court can be known. With regard to the vessel, I request that she may remain in the custody of the same agent, until condemned and sold. When the Sumter entered Puerto Cabello, with her prize, she found an empty harbor, there being only two or three coasting schooners anchored along the coast, there was a general dearth of business, and the quiet little city was panting for an excitement. A bombshell thrown into the midst of the stagnant commercial community, could not have startled them more, than the rattling of the chain cable of the Sumter through her hawse hole, as she let go her anchor, and when my missive was handed to the governor, there was a racing, and chasing of barefooted orderlies, that indicated a prospective gathering of the clans, similar to the one which had occurred at Curaçoa. A grand council was held, at which the Confederate States had not the honor to be represented that the reader may understand the odds against which we now had to struggle, he must recollect, that all these small South American towns are, more or less, dependent upon American trade. The New England states, and New York supply them with their domestic cottons, flour, bacon, and notions, sell them all their worthless old muskets, and damaged ammunition, and now and then, smuggle out a small craft to them for naval purposes. The American consul, who is also a merchant, represents not only those grand moral ideas, that characterize our northern people, but sends sarsaparilla, and Smith's wooden clocks. He is, par excellence, the big dog of the village. The big dog was present on the present occasion, looking portentous, and savage, and when he oped his mouth, all the little dogs were silent. Of course, the poor Sumter, anchored away off in the bay, could have no chance before so august an assemblage, and, pretty soon, an orderly came down to the boat, where my patient lieutenant was waiting, bearing a most ominous looking letter, put up in true South American style, about a foot square, and bearing on it, Dios y Libertad. When I came to break the seal of this letter, I found it to purport, that the governor had not the necessary functionaries, to reply to me, diplomatically, but that he would elevate my dispatch, to the supreme government, and that, in the meantime, I had better take the Abbey Bradford and get out of Puerto Cabello, 
as soon as possible. This was all said, very politely, for your petty South American chieftain is as mild a mannered man as ever cut a throat. But it was none the less strong for all that. The missive of the governor reached me early, in the afternoon, but I paid not the least attention to it. I sent the paymaster on shore, to purchase some fresh provisions, and fruits, for the crew, and gave such of the officers liberty, as desired it. The next morning I sent a prize crew on board the Bradford, and determined to send her to New Orleans. Being loath to part with any more of my officers, after the experience I had had, with the prize brig Cuba, I selected an intelligent quartermaster, who had been mate of a merchantman, as prize master. My men I could replace, my officers I could not. The following letter of instructions was prepared for the guidance of the prize master. Confederate States Steamer Sumter. Off Puerto Cabello, July 26, 1861. Quartermaster and Prize Master, Eugene Rull. You will take charge of the prize schooner, Abbey Bradford, and proceed with her, to New Orleans, making the land to the westward of the passes of the Mississippi, and endeavoring to run into Barataria Bay, Berwick's Bay, or some of the other small inlets. Upon your arrival, you will proceed to the city of New Orleans, in person, and report yourself to Commodore Russo, for orders. You will take a special care of the accompanying package of papers, as they are the papers of the captured schooner, and you will deliver them, with the seals unbroken, to the judge of the prize court, Judge Moyes. You will batten down your hatches, and see that no part of the cargo is touched, during the voyage, and you will deliver both vessel, and cargo, to the proper law officers, in the condition in which you find them, as nearly as possible. I avail myself of this opportunity, to address the following letter to Mr. Mallory, the Secretary of the Navy, having nothing very important to communicate, I did not resort to the use of the cipher, that had been established between us. Confederate States Steamer Sumter. Puerto Cabello, July 26, 1861. Sir Colon having captured a schooner of light draft, which, with her cargo, I estimate to be worth some $25,000, and being denied the privilege of leaving her at this port, until she could be adjudicated, I have resolved to dispatch her fine New Orleans, in charge of a prize crew, with the hope that she may be able to elude the vigilance of the blockading squadron, of the enemy, and run into some one of the shoal passes, to the westward of the mouth of the Mississippi, as Barataria, or Barracks Bay. In great haste. I avail myself of this opportunity to send you my first dispatch, since leaving New Orleans. I can do no more, for want of time, than barely enumerate, without describing events. We ran the blockade of Parsale by the Brooklyn, on the 30th of June, that ship giving us chase. On the morning of the 3d of July, I doubled Cape Antonio, the western extremity of Cuba, and, on the same day, captured off the Isle of Pines, the American ship, Golden Rocket, belonging to parties in Bangor, in Maine. She was a fine ship of 600 tons, and worth between 30 and 40 thousand dollars. I burned her. On the next day, the 4th, I captured the brigantines Cuba and Machias, both of Maine, also. They were laden with sugars. I sent them to she and Fuegos, Cuba. On the 5th of July, I captured the Briggs Ben. Dunning, and Albert Adams, owned in New York, and Massachusetts. They were laden, also, with sugars. I sent them to Chienfuegos. On the next day, the 6th, I captured the Bucks West Wind, and Louisa Clum, and the Brig Nyad, all owned in New York, Rhode Island, and Massachusetts. I sent them, also, to Chienfuegos. On the same day, I ran into that port, myself, reported my captures to the authorities, and asked leave for them to remain, until they could be adjudicated. The government took them in charge, until the home government should give directions concerning them. I coaled ship, and sailed, again, on the 7th. On the 17th I arrived at the island of Curaçao, 
without having fallen in with any of the enemy's ships. I called again, here, having had some little difficulty with the governor, about entering, and sailed on the 24th. On the morning of the 25th, I captured, off Lagra, the schooner Abbey Bradford, which is the vessel, by which I send this dispatch. I do not deem it prudent to speak, here, of my future movements, lest my dispatch should fall into the hands of the enemy. We are all well, and doing a pretty fair business, in mercantile parlance, having made nine captures in twenty-six days. The Bradford reached the coast of Louisiana, in due time, but approaching too near to the principal passes of the Mississippi, against which I had warned her, she was recaptured, by one of the enemy's steamers, and my prize crew were made prisoners, but soon afterward released, though they did not rejoin me. I am thus particular, in giving the reader an account of these, my first transactions, for the purpose of showing him, that I made every effort to avoid the necessity of destroying my prizes, at sea, and that I only resorted to this practice, when it became evident that there was nothing else to be done. Not that I had not the right to burn them, under the laws of war, when there was no dispute about the property, as was the case with the Golden Rocket, she having had no cargo on board, but because I desired to avoid all possible complication with neutrals. Having dispatched the Bradford, we got under way, in the Sumter, to continue our cruise. We had scarcely gotten clear of the harbor, before a sail was discovered, in plain sight, from the deck. The breeze was light, and she was running down the coast, with all her studding sails set. Her taunt and graceful spars, and her whitest of cotton sails, glistening in the morning's sun, revealed at once the secret of her nationality. We chased, and, at the distance of full seven miles from the land, came up with, and captured her. She proved to be the bark Joseph Maxwell, of Philadelphia, last from La Gra, where she had touched, to land a part of her cargo. The remainder she was bringing to Puerto Cabello. Upon inspection of her papers, I ascertained that one half of the cargo, remaining on board of her, belonged to a neutral owner, doing business in Puerto Cabello. Heaving the bark to, in charge of a prize crew, beyond the Marine League, I took her master on board the Sumter, and steaming back into the harbor, sent Paymaster Myers on shore with him, to see if some arrangement could not be made by which the interests of the neutral half-owner of the cargo could be protected, to see, in other words, whether this prize, in which a Venezuelan citizen was interested, would not be permitted to enter, and remain until she could be adjudicated. Much to my surprise, upon the return of my boat, the paymaster handed me a written command from the governor, to bring the Maxwell in and deliver her to him, until the Venezuelan courts could determine whether she had been captured within the Marine League, or not. This insolence was refreshing. I scarcely knew whether to laugh, or be angry at it. I believe I indulged in both emotions. The Sumter had not let go her anchor, but had been waiting for the return of her boat, under steam. She was lying close under the guns of the fort and we could see that the Tompians had been taken out of the guns, and that they were manned by some half-naked soldiers. Not knowing but the foolish governor might order his commandant to fire upon me, in case I should attempt to proceed to sea, in my ship, before I had sent a boat out to bring in the Maxwell, I beat to quarters, and with my crew standing by my guns, steamed out to rejoin my prize. When I had a little leisure to converse with my paymaster, he told me, that the federal consul had been consulted, on the occasion, and that the nice little ruse of the governor's order had been resorted to in the hope of intimidating me. I would have burned the Maxwell, on the spot, but, unfortunately, as the reader has seen, she had some neutral cargo on board, and this I had no right to destroy. I resolved, therefore, to send her in, not to the confederate states for she drew too much water to enter any, except the principal port, and these being all blockaded, by steamers, it was useless for her to make the attempt. The following letter of instructions to her prize master, will show what disposition was made of her. Confederate States Steamer Sumter. 
at sea, July 27, 1861. Midshipman and Prize Master William A. Hicks. You will take charge of the prize bark, Joseph Maxwell, and proceed, with her, to some port on the south side of the island of Cuba, say Street Jugo, Trinidad, or Cienfuegos. I think it would be safest for you to go into Cienfuegos, as the enemy, from the very fact of our having been there, recently, will scarcely be on the look for us a second time. The steamers which were probably sent thither from Havana in pursuit of the Sumter must, long since, have departed, to hunt her in some other quarter. Upon your arrival, you will inform the governor, or commandant of the port, of the fact, state to him that your vessel is the prize of a ship of war, and not of a privateer, and ask leave for her to remain in port, in charge of a prize agent, until she can be adjudicated by a prize court of the Confederate States. Should he grant you this request, you will, if you go into Cienfuegos, put the vessel in charge of Don Mariano Diaz, our agent for the other prizes, but should you go into either of the other ports, you will appoint some reliable person to take charge of the prize, but without power to sell, until further orders, taking from him a bond, with sufficient sureties for the faithful performance of his duties. Should the governor decline to permit the prize to remain, you will store the cargo, with some responsible person, if are permitted to land it, taking his receipt therefore, and then take the ship outside the port, beyond the marine league, and burn her. Should you need funds for the unlading and storage of the cargo, you are authorized to sell so much of it as may be necessary for this purpose. You will then make the best of your way to the Confederate States, and report yourself to the Secretary of the Navy. You will keep in close custody the accompanying sealed package of papers, being the papers of the captured vessel, and deliver it, in person, to the Judge of the Admiralty Court, in New Orleans. The paymaster will hand you the sum of one hundred dollars, and you are authorized to draw on the Secretary of the Navy for such further sum as you may need, to defray the expenses of yourself, and crew, to the Confederate States. I had not yet seen the proclamation of neutrality by Spain, and the reader will perceive, from the above letter, that I still clung to the hope that that power would dare to be just, even in the face of the truckling of England and France. The master of the Maxwell had his wife on board, and the sea being smooth, I made him a present of one of the best of his boats, and sent him and his wife on shore in her. He repaid my kindness by stealing the ship's chronometer, which he falsely told the midshipman in charge of the prize I had given him leave to take with him. At 3 p.m., taking a final leave of Puerto Cabello, there being neither waving of hats or handkerchiefs, or regrets on either side, we shaped our course to the eastward, and put our ship under a full head of steam. Chapter 16 Steaming along the coast of Venezuela, the coral insect, and the wonders of the deep, the Andes and the rainy season, the Sumter enters the port of Spain, in the British island of Trinidad, and cools, and sails again. There was a fresh trade wind blowing, and some sea on, as the Sumter brought her head around to the eastward, and commenced buffeting her way, again, to windward. She had, in addition, a current to contend with, which sets along this coast in the direction of the trade wind, at the rate of about a knot an hour. We were steaming at a distance of seven or eight miles from the land, and, as the shades of evening closed in, we descried a federal brigantine, running down the coast, probably for the port we had just left, hugging the bold shore very affectionately, to keep within the charmed marine league, within which she knew she was safe from capture. We did not, of course, molest her, as I made it a point always to respect the jurisdiction of neutrals, though never so weak. I might have offended against the sovereignty of Venezuela, by capturing this vessel, with impunity, so far as Venezuela was herself concerned, but then I should have committed an offence against the laws of nations, and it was these laws that I was, myself, looking to, for protection. Besides, the Secretary of the Navy, in preparing my instructions, had been particular to enjoin upon me, not only to respect the rights of neutrals, but to conciliate their goodwill. 
as we were running along the land, sufficiently near for its influence to be felt upon the trade winds, it became nearly calm during the night, the land and sea breezes, each struggling for the mastery, and thus neutralizing each other's forces. The steamer sprang forward with renewed speed, and when the day dawned the next morning, we were far to windward of Lagra. The sun rose in a sky, without a cloud, and the wind did not freshen, as the day advanced, so much as it had done the day before. The mountains of Venezuela lay sleeping in the distance, robed in a mantle of heavenly blue, numerous seabirds were on the wing, and the sail of a fishing boat, here and there, added picturesqueness to the scene. At half past nine, we gave chase to a fore and aft schooner, which proved to be a Venezuela coaster. In the afternoon, we passed sufficiently near the island of Tortuga, to run over some of its coral banks. The sun was declining behind the yet visible mountains, and the sea breeze had died away to nearly a calm, leaving the bright, and sparkling waters, with a mirrored surface. We now entered upon a scene of transcendent beauty, but the beauty was that of the deep, and not of the surface landscape. The reader is familiar with the history of the coral insect, that patient little stone mason of the deep, which, though scarcely visible through the microscope, lays the foundations of islands, and of continents. The little coralline sometimes commences its work, hundreds of fathoms down in the deep sea, and working patiently, and laboriously, day and night, night and day, week after week, month after month, year after year, and century after century, finally brings its structure to the surface. When its tiny blocks of limestone, which it has secreted from the salts of the sea, have been piled so high, that the tides now cover the structure, and now leave it dry, the little toiler of the sea, having performed the functions prescribed to it by its creator, dies, and is entombed in a mausoleum more proud than any that could be reared by human hands. The winds, and the clouds now take charge of the new island, or continent, and begin to prepare it for vegetation, and the habitation of man, and animals. The Pacific Ocean, within the tropics is, par excellence, the Coral Sea, and the navigator of that ocean is familiar with the phenomenon, which I am about to describe. In the midst of a clear sky, the mariner sometimes discovers on the verge of the horizon, a light, fleecy cloud, and as he sails toward it, he is surprised to find that it scarcely alters its position. It rises a little, and a little higher, as he approaches it, pretty much as the land would appear to rise, if he were sailing toward it, but that is all. He sails on, and on, and when he has come near the cloud, he is surprised to see under it, a white line of foam, or, maybe a breaker, if there is any undulation in the sea, in a spot where all is represented as deep water on his chart. Examining with his telescope, he now discovers, in the intervals of the foam, caused by the rising and falling of the long, lazy swell, a coral bank, so white as scarcely to be distinguished from the seething and boiling foam. He has discovered the germ of a new island, which in the course of time, and the decrees of providence, will be covered with forests, and inhabited by men, and animals. The cloud, as a sort of pillar by day, has conducted him to the spot, whilst it has, at the same time, warned him of his danger. But the cloud, how came it there, why does it remain so faithfully at its post, and what are its functions? One of the most beautiful of the phenomena of tropical countries is the alternation, with the regularity of clockwork, of the land and sea breezes, by day the sea breeze blowing toward the land, and by night the land breeze blowing toward the sea. The reason of this is as follows. The land absorbs heat, and radiates it, more rapidly than the sea. The consequence is, that when the sun has risen, an hour or two, the land becomes warmer than the surrounding sea, and there is an indraft toward it, in other words, the sea breeze begins to blow. When, on the contrary, the sun has set, and withdrawn his rays from both land and sea, and radiation begins, the land, parting with its absorbed heat, more rapidly than the sea, soon becomes cooler than the sea. As a consequence, 
there is an outdraft from the land, in other words, the land breeze has commenced to blow. The reader now sees how it is, that the pillar by day hangs over the little coral island, the bank of coral absorbing heat by day more rapidly than the surrounding sea, there is an indraft setting toward it, and as the lazy trade winds approach it, they themselves become heated, and ascend into the upper air. There is thus a constantly ascending column of heated atmosphere over these banks. This ascending column of atmosphere, when it reaches a certain point, is condensed into cumuli of beautiful, fleecy clouds, often piled up in the most fantastic and gorgeous shapes. It is thus that the cloud becomes stationary. It is ever forming, and ever passing off, retaining, it may be, its original form, but its nebula constantly changing. When a cooler blast of trade wind than usual comes along, the condensation is more rapid, and perfect, and showers of rain fall. The seabirds are already hovering, in clouds, over the inchoate little island, fishing, and wading in its shallow waters, and roosting on it, when they can get a sufficient foothold. Vegetation soon ensues, and, in the course of a few more ages, nature completes her work. But to return from this digression, into which we were led by a view of the coral bank over which we were passing. The little insect, which is at work under our feet, has not yet brought its structure sufficiently near the surface, to obstruct our passage over it. We are in five or six fathoms of water, but this water is so clear, that we are enabled to see the most minute object, quite distinctly. We have slowed the engine the better to enjoy the beautiful submarine landscape, and look. We are passing over a miniature forest, instinct with life. There are beautifully branching trees of madrepores, whose prongs are from one to two feet in length, and sometimes curiously interlaced. Each one of the branches, as well as the trunk, has a number of little notches in it. These are the cells in which the little stone mason is at work. Adhering to the branches of these miniature trees, like mosses, and lichens, you see sundry formations that you might mistake for leaves. These are also cellular, and are the workshops of the little masons. Scattered around, among the trees, are waving the most gorgeous of fans, and, what we might call sea ferns, and palms. These are of a variety of brilliant colors, purple predominating. Lying on the smooth, white sand, are boulders of coral in a variety of shapes, some, like the domes of miniature cathedrals, some, perfectly spherical, some, cylindrical. These, and the trees, are mostly of a creamy white, though occasionally, pink, violet, and green are discovered. As the passage of the steamer gives motion to the otherwise smooth sea, the fans, ferns, and palms wave, gracefully, changing their tints as the light flashes upon them, through the pellucid waters. The beholder looks entranced as though he were gazing upon a fairy scene, by moonlight, and to add to the illusion, there is a movement of life, all new to the eye, in every direction. The beautiful starfish, with its five points, as equally, and regularly arranged, as though it had been done by the rule of the mathematician, with great worm-like mollusks, lie torpid on the white sand. Jellyfish, polypi, and other nondescript shapes float about in the miniature forest, and darting hither and thither, among the many tinted ferns, some apparently in sport, and some in pursuit of their prey, are hundreds of little fishes, sparkling, and gleaming in silver, and gold, and green, and scarlet. The most curious of these is the parrot fish, whose head is shaped like the beak of the parrot, and whose color is light green. How wonderfully full is the sea of animal life! All this picture is animal life, for what appears to be the vegetable portion of this submarine landscape, is scarcely vegetable at all. The waving ferns, fans, and palms are all instinct with animal life. The patient little toiler of the sea, the coralline insect, is busy with them, as he is with his limestone trees. He is helping on their formation by his secretions and it is difficult to say what portion of them is vegetable, what, mineral, and what, animal. I had been an hour, 
and more, entranced by the fairy submarine forest, and its denizens, which I have so imperfectly described, when the sun sank behind the Andes, and night threw her mantle upon the waters, changing all the sparkling colors of forest, and fish, to somber gray, and admonishing me, that it was time to return to everyday life, and the duties of the ship. Let her have the steam, said I to the officer of the deck, as I rose from my bent posture over the ship's rail, and, in a moment more, the propeller was thundering us along at our usual speed. At 11 p.m., we were up with the island of Margarita, and as I designed to run the passage between it, and the mainland, I preferred daylight for the operation, and so, sounding in thirty-two fathoms of water, I hove the ship to, under her trysails for the night, permitting her steam to go down. The next day, the weather still continued clear and pleasant, the trade wind being sufficiently light not to impede our headway, for we were steaming, as the reader will recollect, nearly head to wind. We had experienced but little adverse current during the last twenty-four hours, and were making very satisfactory progress. I was now making a passage, rather than cruising, as a sail is a rare sight, in the part of the ocean I was traversing. At Meridian we passed that singular group of islands called the Frails, Anglice, Friars, jutting up from the sea in cones of different shapes, and looking, at a distance, not unlike so many hooded monks. With the exception of a transient fisherman, who now and then hauls up his boat out of the reach of the surf, on these harbourless islands, and pitches his tent, made of his boat's sail, for a few days of rest and refreshment, they have no inhabitants. July 30th, thick, cloudy weather, with incessant, and heavy rains, hauling in for the coast of Venezuela, near the entrance to the Gulf of Paria. So thick is the weather, that to hold on to the land, I am obliged to run the coast within a mile, and this is close running on a coast not minutely surveyed. So said my journal. Indeed the day in question was a memorable one, from its scenery, and surroundings. Few landscapes present so bold, and imposing a picture as this part of the South American coast. The Andes here rise abruptly out of the sea, to a great height. Our little craft running along their base, in the bluest and deepest of water, looked like a mere cockle shell, or nautilus. Besides the torrents of rain, that were coming down upon our decks, and through which, at times, we could barely catch a glimpse of the majestic, and sombre looking mountains, we were blinded by the most vivid flashes of lightning, simultaneously with which, the rolling and crashing of the thunder deafened our ears. I had stood on the banks of the Lake of Geneva, and witnessed a storm in the Alps, during which Byron's celebrated lines occurred to me. They occurred to me more forcibly here, for literally. Far along. From peak to peak, the rattling crags among. Leaps the live thunder. Not from one cloud. But every mountain now had found a tongue. And Juro answers, through her misty shroud. Back to the joyous Alps, who called to her aloud. That word joyous was well chosen by the poet, for the mountains did indeed seem to rejoice in this grand display of nature. Of wind there was scarcely any, what little there was, was frequently off the land, and even blew in the direction opposite to that of the trade wind. We were in the rainy season, along this coast, and all the vegetable kingdom was in full luxuriance. The coconut, and other palms, giving an eastern aspect to the scenery, waved the greenest of feathery branches, and every shrub, and almost every tree rejoiced in its flower. It was delightful to inhale the fragrance, as the whirling aerial current brought us an occasional puff from the land. On board the ship, we looked like so many half-drowned rats. The officer of the deck, trumpet in hand, was ensconced, to his ears, in his India rubber pea jacket, his long beard looking like a wet mop, and little rills of rain trickling down his neck, and shoulders, from his slouched sou-wester. The midshipman of the watch had taken off his shoes, and rolled up his trousers, and was paddling about in the pools on deck, as well pleased as a young duck. And as for the old salt, he was in his element. 
there was plenty of fresh water to wash his clothes in, and accordingly the decks were filled with industrious washers, or rather scrubbers, each with his scrubbing brush, and bit of soap, and a little pile of soiled duck frocks and trousers by his side. The reader has been informed, that we were running along the coast, within a mile of it, to enable us to keep sight of the land. The object of this was to make the proper landfall for running into the Gulf of Paria, on which is situated the port of Spain, in the island of Trinidad, to which we were bound. We opened the Gulf as early as 9 a.m., and soon afterward identified the three islands that form the Bocas del Drago, or Dragon's Mouth. The scenery is remarkably bold and striking at the entrance of this gulf or bay. The islands rise to the height of mountains, in abrupt and sheer precipices, out of the now muddy waters, for the great Orinoco, traversing its thousands of miles of alluvial soil, disembogs nearby. Indeed, we may be said to have been already within the delta of that great stream. Memory was busy with me, as the sumter passed through the dragon's mouth. I had made my first cruise to this identical island of Trinidad, when a green midshipman in the Federal Navy. A few years before, the elder Commodore Perry, he of Lake Erie memory, had died of yellow fever, when on a visit, in one of the small schooners of his squadron, up the Orinoco. The old sloop of war Lexington, under the command of Commander, now Rear Admiral Shubrick, was sent to the port of Spain to bring home his remains. I was one of the midshipmen of the ship. A generation had since elapsed. An infant people had, in that short space of time, grown old and decrepit, and its government had broken and ween. But there stood the everlasting mountains, as I remembered them, unchanged. I could not help again recurring to the poet. Man has another day to swell the past. And lead him near to little but his last. But mighty nature bounds us from her birth. The sun is in the heavens, and life on earth. Flowers in the valley, splendor in the beam. Health on the gale, and freshness in the stream. Immortal man! Behold her glories shine! And cry, exulting inly, they are thine. Gaze on, while yet thy gladdened eye may see. A morrow comes when they are not for thee and grieve what may above thy senseless beer. Nor earth, nor sky shall yield a single tear. Nor cloud shall gather more, nor leaf shall fall. Nor gale breathe forth one sigh for thee, for all. But creeping things shall revel in their spoil. And fit thy clay to fertilize the soil. We entered through the hover passage, named from its egg-shaped island, and striking soundings, pretty soon afterward, ran up by our chart and lead line, there being no pilot boat in sight. We anchored off the port of Spain a little after midday, an English merchant brig paying us the compliment of a salute. I dispatched a lieutenant to call on the governor. The orders of neutrality of the English government had already been received, and His Excellency informed me that, in accordance therewith, he would extend to me the same hospitality that he would show, in similar circumstances to the enemy, which was nothing more, of course, than I had a right to expect. The paymaster was dispatched to the shore, to see about getting a supply of coal, and send off some fresh provisions and fruit for the crew, and such of the officers as desired went on liberty. The first thing to be thought of was the discharge of our prisoners, for, with the exception of the captain, whom I had permitted to land in Puerto Cabello, with his wife, I had the crew of the Joseph Maxwell, prize ship, still on board. I had given these men, eight in number, to understand that they were hostages, and that their discharge, their close confinement, or their execution, as the case might be, depended upon the action of their own government, in the case of the Savannah prisoners. The reader will probably recollect the case to which I allude. President Lincoln, of the Federal States in issuing his proclamation of the 15th of April, 1861, calling out 75,000 troops to revenge the disaster of Fort Sumter, inserted the following paragraph. And I hereby proclaim, and declare, that, if any person, under the pretended authority of said states, or under any other pretense, 
shall molest a vessel of the United States, or the persons, or cargo on board of her, such persons will be held amenable to the laws of the United States, for the prevention, and punishment of piracy. On the 6th of May following, the Congress of the Confederate States, passed the following act, in reply, as it were, to this manifesto of Mr. Lincoln. Whereas, the earnest efforts made by this government, to establish friendly relations between the government of the United States, and the Confederate States, and to settle all questions of disagreement between the two governments, upon principles of right, equity, justice, and good faith, have proved unavailing, by reason of the refusal of the government of the United States to hold any intercourse with the commissioners appointed by this government, for the purposes aforesaid, or to listen to any proposal they had to make, for the peaceful solution of all causes of difficulty between the two governments, and whereas, the President of the United States of America has issued his proclamation, making requisition upon the States of the American Union, for 75,000 men, for the purpose, as therein indicated, of capturing forts, and other strongholds within the jurisdiction of, and belonging to the Confederate States of America, and raised, organized, and equipped a large military force, to execute the purpose aforesaid, and has issued his other proclamation, announcing his purpose to set on foot a blockade of the ports of the Confederate States, and whereas, the state of Virginia has seceded from the Federal Union, and entered into a convention of alliance, offensive and defensive, with the Confederate States, and has adopted the provisional constitution of said states, and the states of Maryland, North Carolina, Tennessee, Kentucky, Arkansas and Missouri have refused, and it is believed, that the state of Delaware, and the inhabitants of the territories of Arizona, and New Mexico, and the Indian Territory, south of Kansas will refuse to cooperate with the government of the United States, in these acts of hostility, and wanton aggression, which are plainly intended to overawe, oppress, and finally subjugate the people of the Confederate States, and whereas, by the acts, and means aforesaid, war exists between the Confederate States, and the government of the United States, and the states and territories thereof, excepting the states of Maryland, North Carolina, Tennessee, Kentucky, Arkansas, Missouri, and Delaware, and the territories of Arizona, and New Mexico, and the Indian Territory south of Kansas, therefore. Sec. 1. The Congress of the Confederate States of America do enact, that the President of the Confederate States is hereby authorized to use the whole land, and naval force of the Confederate States, to meet the war thus commenced, and to issue to private armed vessels, commissions, or letters of mark, and general reprisal, in such form, as he shall think proper, under the seal of the Confederate States, against the vessels, goods, and effects of the government of the United States, and of the citizens, or inhabitants of the states, and territories thereof, except the states and territories herein before named. Provided, however, that the property of the enemy, unless it be contraband of war, laden on board a neutral vessel, shall not be subject to seizure, under this act, and provided further, that the vessels of the citizens, or inhabitants of the United States, now in the ports of the Confederate States, except such as have been since the 15th of April last, or may hereafter be, in the service of the government of the United States, shall be allowed thirty days, after the publication of this act, to leave said port, and reach their destination, and such vessels, and their cargoes, excepting articles contraband of war, shall not be subject to capture, under this act, during said period, unless they shall previously have reached the destination for which they were bound, on leaving said ports. Among the private armed vessels which took out commissions under this act, was the schooner Savannah, formerly a pilot boat out of Charleston. She carried one small gun, and about twenty men. During the month of June, this adventurous little cruiser was captured by the U.S. Brig Bainbridge, and her crew were hurried off to New York, confined in cells, like convicted felons, and afterward brought to trial, and convicted of piracy, under Mr. Lincoln's proclamation.
I had informed myself of these proceedings from newspapers captured on board the enemy's ships, and hence the announcement I had made to the prisoners of the Joseph Maxwell. The reader may imagine the delight of those men, and my own satisfaction, as well, when my lieutenant brought back with him, from the shore, after his visit to the governor, an American newspaper, of late date, stating that the Savannah prisoners had been released from close confinement, and were to be treated as prisoners of war. I was stretching a point, in undertaking retaliation of this serious character without instructions from my government, but the case was pressing, and we of the Sumter were vitally interested in the issue. The commission of the Savannah, though she was only a privateer, was as lawful as our own, and, judging by the abuse that had already been heaped upon us, by the northern newspapers, we had no reason to expect any better treatment, at the hands of well-paid New York district attorneys, and well-packed New York juries. I was gratified to learn, as I did soon afterward, that my government had taken a proper stand on this question. President Davis, as soon as he heard of the treatment to which the Savannah prisoners had been subjected, wrote a letter of remonstrance to President Lincoln, threatening retaliation, if he dared execute his threat of treating them as pirates. In that letter so worthy of the Christian statesman, and so opposite to the coarse fulminations of the enemy, Mr. Davis used the following expressions, it is the desire of this government so to conduct the war, now existing, as to mitigate its horrors, as far as may be possible, and with this intent, its treatment of the prisoners captured by its forces has been marked, by the greatest humanity, and leniency, consistent with public obligation. Some have been permitted to return home, on parole, others to remain at large, under similar conditions, within the Confederacy, and all have been furnished with rations for their subsistence, such as are allowed to our own troops. It is only since the news has been received, of the treatment of the prisoners taken on the Savannah, that I have been compelled to withdraw those indulgences, and to hold the prisoners taken by us, in strict confinement. A just regard to humanity, and to the honor of this government, now requires me to state, explicitly, that, painful as will be the necessity, this government will deal out to the prisoners held by it, the same treatment, and the same fate, as shall be experienced by those captured on the savannah, and if driven to the terrible necessity of retaliation, by your execution of any of the officers, or crew of the savannah, that retaliation will be extended so far, as shall be requisite to secure the abandonment of a practice, unknown to the warfare of civilized men, and so barbarous, as to disgrace the nation which shall be guilty of inaugurating it. Shortly before the conviction of the Savannah prisoners, a seaman named Smith, captured on board the privateer Jefferson Davis, was tried, and convicted of piracy, in Philadelphia. There were fourteen of these men, in all, and the following order from Mr. Benjamin, the acting Secretary of War of the Confederate States, to General Winder, in charge of federal prisoners, in Richmond, will show how much in earnest President Davis was, when he wrote the above letter to President Lincoln. Sir Colon you are hereby instructed to choose, by lot, from among the prisoners of war, of highest rank, one who is to be confined in a cell appropriated to convicted felons, and who is to be treated, in all respects, as if such convict, and to be held for execution, in the same manner as may be adopted by the enemy for the execution of the prisoner of war, Smith, recently condemned to death in Philadelphia. You will, also, select thirteen other prisoners of war, the highest in rank of those captured by our forces, to be confined in cells, reserved for prisoners accused of infamous crimes and will treat them as such, so long as the enemy shall continue so to treat the like number of prisoners of war, captured by them at sea, and now held for trial in New York as pirates. As these measures are intended to repress the infamous attempt now made by the enemy, to commit judicial murder on prisoners of war, you will execute them, strictly, as the mode best calculated to prevent the commission of so heinous a crime. The list of hostages, as returned by General Winder, was as follows, Colonels Corcoran, Lee, Cogswell, Wilcox, Woodruff, and Wood, 
Lieutenant Colonels Bowman, and Neff, Majors Potter, Revere, and Vogts, and Captains Ricketts, McQuaid, and Rockwood. These measures had the desired effect, the necessity, that the federal government was under of conciliating the Irish interest, contributing powerfully thereto, Colonel Corcoran, the first hostage named, being an Irishman of some note and influence, in New York. President Lincoln was accordingly obliged to take back his proclamation, and the Savannah prisoners, and Smith, were put on the footing of prisoners of war. But this recantation of an attempted barbarism had not been honestly made. It was not the generous taking back of a wrong principle, by a high-minded people. The tiger, which had come out of his jungle, in quest of blood, had only been driven back by fear. His feline, and bloodthirsty disposition would, of course, crop out again, as soon as he ceased to dread the huntsman's rifle. Whilst we were strong, but little more was heard of pirates, and piracy, except through Mr. Seward's long-winded and frantic dispatches to the British government, on the subject of the Alabama, but when we became weak, the slogan was taken up again, and rung, in all its changes, by an infuriated people. To return now to the Sumter. Our decks were crowded with visitors, on the afternoon of our arrival, some of these coming off to shake us warmly by the hand out of genuine sympathy, whilst others had no higher motive than that of mere curiosity. The officers of the garrison were very civil to us, but we were amused at their diplomatic precaution, in coming to visit us in citizens' dress. There are no people in the world, perhaps, who attach so much importance to matters of mere form and ceremony, bluff and hearty as John Bull is, as the English people. Lord Russell had dubbed us a so-called government and this expression had become a law to all his subordinates, no official visits could be exchanged, no salutes reciprocated, and none other of the thousand and one courtesies of red tapedom observed toward us, and, strange to say, whilst all this nonsense of form was being practiced, the substance of nationality, that is to say, the acknowledgement that we possessed belligerent rights, had been frankly and freely accorded to us. It was like saying to a man, I should like, above all things, to have you come and dine with me, but as you haven't got the right sort of a dining dress, you can't come, you know. Some ridiculous consequences resulted from this etiquette of nations. Important matters of business frequently remained unattended to, because the parties could not address each other officially. An informal note would take the place of an official dispatch. The advent of the Sumter invariably caused more, or less commotion, in official circles, the small colonial officials fearing lest she might complicate them with their governments. There was now another important council to be held. The opinion of the law officers of the Crown was to be taken by His Excellency, upon the question, whether the Sumter was entitled to be cold in Her Majesty's dominions. The paymaster had found a lot of indifferent coal, on shore, which could be purchased at about double its value, but nothing could be done until the council moved, and it is proverbial that large bodies, like provincial councils, move slowly. The Attorney General of the colony, and other big wigs got together, however, after due ceremony, and, thanks to the fact, that the steamer is an infernal machine of modern invention, they were not very long in coming to a decision. If there had been anything about a steamer, in coke upon Littleton, Bacon, or Brockton, or any other of those old fellows who deal in black letter, I am afraid the Sumter would have been blockaded by the enemy, before she could have gotten to sea. The pros and cons being discussed, I had too much respect for the caliber of certain guns on shore, to throw any shells across the windows of the council chamber, it was decided that coal was not contraband of war, and that the Sumter might purchase the necessary article in the market. But though she might purchase it, it was not so easy to get it on board. It was hard to move the good people on shore. The climate was relaxing, the rainy season had set in, and there was only negra labor to be had, about the wharves and keys. We were for tedious days in filling our coal bunkers. It had rained, off and on, the whole time. I did not visit the shore, 
but I amused myself frequently by inspecting the magnificent scenery by which I was surrounded, through an excellent telescope. The vegetation of Trinidad is varied, and luxuriant beyond description. As the clouds would break away, and the sun light up the wilderness of waving palms, and other tropical trees and plants of strange and rich foliage, amid which the little town lay embowered, the imagination was enchanted with the picture. The emancipation of the slave ruined this, as it did the other West India islands. As a predial laborer, the freedman was nearly worthless, and the sugar crop, which is the staple, went down to zero. In despair, the planters resorted to the introduction of the coolie, large numbers of them have been imported, and under their skillful and industrious cultivation, the island is regaining a share of its lost prosperity. A day or two after my arrival, I had a visit from the master of a Baltimore brig, lying in the port. He was ready for sea, he said, and had come on board, to learn whether I would capture him. I told him to make himself easy, that I should not molest him, and referred him to the act of the Confederate Congress, declaring that a state of war existed, to show him that, as yet, we regarded Maryland as a friend. He went away rejoicing, and sailed the next day. We had, as usual, some little refitting of the ship to do. Off Puerto Cabello, we had carried away our main yard, by coming in contact with the Abbey Bradford and the first lieutenant having ordered another on our arrival, it was now towed off, and gotten on board, fitted, and sent aloft. Sunday, August 40h. Morning calm and clear. The chimes of the church bells fall pleasantly and suggestively on the ear. An American schooner came in from some point, up the bay, and anchored well and sure, some distance from us, as though distrustful of our good faith, and of our respect for British neutrality. Being all ready for sea, at half past ten a.m., I gave the order to get up steam, but the paymaster reporting to me that his vouchers were not all complete, the order was countermanded, and we remained another day. Her Majesty's steam frigate Cadmus having come in, from one of the neighboring islands, I sent a lieutenant on board to call on her captain. This was the first foreign ship of war to which I had extended the courtesy of a visit, and, in a few hours afterward, my visit was returned. I had, from this time onward, much agreeable intercourse with the naval officers of the several nations, with whom I came in contact. I found them much more independent, than the civil, and military officers. They did not seem to care a straw, about de facto's, auditors, and had a sailor's contempt for red tape and unmeaning forms. They invariably received my officers, and myself, when we visited their ships, with the honors of the side, appropriate to our rank, without stopping to ask, in the jargon of Lord Russell, whether we were so called, or Simon Pure. After the usual courtesies had passed between the lieutenant of the Cadmus and myself, I invited him into my cabin, when, upon being seated, he said his captain had desired him to say to me, that, as the Sumter was the first ship of the Confederate States he had fallen in with, he would take it, as a favor, if I would show him my commission. I replied, certainly, but there is a little ceremony to be complied with, on your part, first. What is that? said he. How do I know, I rejoined, that you have any authority to demand a sight of my commission, the flag at your peak may be a cheat, and you may be no better than you take me for, a ship of war of some hitherto unknown government, you must show me your commission first. This was said, pleasantly, on my part, for the idea was quite ludicrous, that a large, and stately steam frigate, bearing the proud cross of St. George, could be such as I had hypothetically described her. But I was right as to the point I had made, to wit, that one ship of war has no right to demand a sight of the commission of another, without first showing her own. Indeed, this principle is so well known among naval men, that the lieutenant had come prepared for my demand, having brought his commission with him. Smiling, himself, now, in return, he said, Certainly, your request is but reasonable, here is Her Majesty's commission, 
unrolling, at the same time, a large square parchment, beautifully engraved with nautical devices, and with sundry seals, pendant therefrom. In return, I handed him a small piece of coarse, and rather dingy confederate paper, at the bottom of which was inscribed the name of Jefferson Davis. He read the commission carefully, and when he had done, remarked, as he handed it back to me, Mr. Davis's is a smooth, bold signature. I replied you are an observer of signatures, and you have hit it exactly, in the present instance. I could not describe his character to you more correctly, if I were to try, our president has all the smoothness, and polish of the ripe scholar and refined gentleman, with the boldness of man, who dares strike for the right, against odds. Monday, August 5 th. Weather clear, and fine. Flocks of parrots are flying overhead, and all nature is rejoicing in the sunshine, after their long, drenching rains. Far as the eye can reach, there is but one sea of verdure, giving evidence, at once, of the fruitfulness of the soil, and the ardor of the sun. At 11 a. m., Captain Hillier, of the Cadmus, came on board, to visit me and we had a long and pleasant conversation on American affairs. He considerately brought me a New York newspaper, of as late a date, as the 12th of July. I must confess, said he, as he handed me this paper, that your American war puzzles me, it cannot possibly last long. You are probably mistaken, as to its duration, I replied, I fear it will be long and bloody. As to its being a puzzle, it should puzzle every honest man. If our late co-partners had practiced toward us the most common rules of honesty, we should not have quarreled with them. But we are only defending ourselves against robbers, with knives at our throats. You surprise me, rejoined the captain, how is that? Simply, that the machinery of the federal government, under which we have lived, and which was designed for the common benefit, has been made the means of despoiling the South, to enrich the North and I explained to him the workings of the iniquitous tariffs, under the operation of which the South had, in effect, been reduced to a dependent colonial condition, almost as abject, as that of the Roman provinces, under their proconsuls, the only difference being, that smooth-faced hypocrisy had been added to robbery, inasmuch as we had been plundered under the forms of law. All this is new to me, I assure you, replied the captain, I thought that your war had arisen out of the slavery question. That is a common mistake of foreigners. The enemy has taken pains to impress foreign nations with this false view of the case. With the exception of a few honest zealots, the canting, hypocritical Yankee cares as little for our slaves, as he does for our draft animals. The war which he has been making upon slavery, for the last forty years, is only an interlude, or by play to help on the main action of the drama, which is empire, and it is a curious coincidence, that it was commenced about the time the North began to rob the South, by means of its tariffs. When a burglar designs to enter a dwelling, for the purpose of robbery, he provides himself with the necessary implements. The slavery question was one of the implements employed, to help on the robbery of the South. It strengthened the Northern Party, and enable them to get their tariffs through Congress, and when, at length, the South, driven to the wall, turned, as even the crushed worm will turn, it was cunningly perceived by the Northern men, that no slavery would be a popular war cry, and hence they used it. It is true, we are defending our slave property, but we are defending it no more than any other species of our property, it is all endangered, under a general system of robbery. We are in fact, fighting for independence. Our forefathers made a great mistake, when they warmed the Puritan serpent in their bosom, and we, their descendants, are endeavoring to remedy it. The captain now rose to depart. I accompanied him on deck, and when he had shoved off, I ordered the ship to be gotten under way. The fires having been started some time before, the steam was already up. The Sumter, as she moved out of the harbour of the port of Spain, looked more like a comfortable passenger steamer, bound on a voyage, than a ship of war, her stern nettings, 
and stern and quarter boats being filled with oranges, and bananas, and all the other luscious fruits that are produced so abundantly in this rich tropical island. Other luxuries were added, for Jack had brought, on board, one or two more sad looking old monkeys, and a score more of squalling parrots. Chapter 17 On the way to Miranam, the weather and the winds, the sumter runs short of coal, and is obliged to bear up Cayenne and Paramaribo, in French and Dutch Guiana, sails again, and arrives in Miranam, Brazil. We passed out of the Gulf of Paria, through the eastern, or Mona Passage, a deep strait, not more than a third of a mile in width, with the land rising, on both sides, to a great height, almost perpendicularly. The water of the Orinoco here begins to mix with the sea water, and the two waters, as they come into unwilling contact, carry on a perpetual struggle, whirling about in small circles, and writhing and twisting like a serpent in pain. We met the first heave of the sea at about two o'clock in the afternoon, and turning our head again to the eastward, we continued to run along the mountainous and picturesque coast of Trinidad, until an hour or two after nightfall. The coast is quite precipitous, but, steep as it is, a number of negro cabins had climbed the hillsides, and now revealed their presence to us by the twinkle of their lights, as the shades of evening fell over the scene. These cabins were quite invisible, by daylight, so dense was the foliage of the trees amid which they nestled. This must, indeed, be the very paradise of the negro. The climate is so genial that he requires little or no clothing, and bountiful nature supplies him with food, all the year round, almost unasked. In this land of the sun, a constant succession of fruits is pendant from the trees, and the dwellers in the huts beneath their sheltering arms, have only to reach out their hands when hunger presses. I was reminded, by this scene, of a visit I had once made to the island of Street Domingo and of the indolence in which the negro lives in that soft and voluptuous climate. I landed at the Bay of Samana, from the ship of water which I was attached, and taking a stroll, one evening, I came upon the hut of an American negress. Some years before, Boyer, the president of the island, had invited the immigration of free negroes, from the United States. A colony from the city of Baltimore had accepted his invitation and settled at Samana. In the course of a very few years, all the men of the colony had run off, and found their way back, in various capacities, on board of trading vessels, to the land of their birth, leaving their wives and daughters behind to shift for themselves. The negro woman, whose hut I had stumbled upon, was one of these grass widows. She had become quite old, but was living without apparent effort. The coconut waved its feathery branches over her humble domicile, and the juicy mango and fragrant banana hung within tempting reach. A little plot of ground had been picketed in with crooked sticks, and in this primitive garden were growing some squashes and watermelons, barely visible under the rank weeds. I said to her, My good woman, you don't seem to have much use for the plow or the hoe in your garden. La. Master, said she, no need of much work in this country, we have only to put in the seed, and the Lord, he gives the increase. In time, no doubt, all the West India Islands will lapse into just such luxuriant wildernesses, as we were now coasting along, in the Sumter. Amalgamation, by slow, but sure processes, will corrupt what little of European blood remains in them, until every trace of the white man shall disappear. The first process will be the mulatto, but the mulatto, as the name imports, is a mule, and must finally die out, and the mass of the population will become pure African. This is the fate which England has prepared, for some of her own blood, in her colonies. I will not stop here to moralize on it. If we are beaten in this war, what will be our fate in the southern states? Shall we, too, become mongrelized? and disappear from the face of the earth? Can this be the ultimate design of the Yankee? The night was quite light, and taking a fresh departure, at about 10 p.m., from the east end of Trinidad, we passed through the strait between it and the island of Tobago, 
and soon afterward emerged from the Caribbean Sea, upon the broad bosom of the South Atlantic. Judging by the tide rips, that were quite visible in the moonlight there must have been considerable current setting through this strait, to the westward. The next day the weather was still fine, and the wind light from about e. n. e., and the Sumter made good speed through the smooth sea. At about 10 a. m., a sail was descried, some 12 or 14 miles distant. She was away off on our port beam, running before the trade wind, and I forbore to chase. As before remarked, I was not now cruising, but anxious to make a passage, and could not afford the fuel to chase, away from the track I was pursuing, the few straggling sail I might discover in this lonely sea. Once in the track of commerce, where the sails would come fast and thick, I could make up for lost time. At noon, we observed in latitude 9 degrees 14 semicolon the longitude, by chronometer, being 59 degrees 10 dot. Wednesday, August 7 th dot weather clear, and delightful, and the sea smooth. Nothing but the broad expanse of the ocean visible, except, indeed, numerous flocks of flying fish, which we are flushing, now and then like so many flocks of partridges, as we disturb the still waters. These little creatures have about the flight of the partridge, and it is a pretty sight to see them skim away over the billows with their transparent finny wings glistening in the sun, until they drop again into their cover, as suddenly as they rose. Our crew having been somewhat broken in upon, by the sending away of so many prize crews, the first lieutenant is rearranging his watch and quarter bills, and the men are being exercised at the guns to accustom them to the changes which have become necessary, in their stations. Officers and men are enjoying, alike, the fine weather. With the forecastle, and quarter deck awnings spread, we do not feel the heat, though the sun is nearly perpendicular at noon. Jack is overhauling his clothes bag, and busy with his needle and thread, stopping, now and then, to have a lark with his monkey, or to listen to the prattle of his parrot. The boys of the ship are taking lessons, in knotting, and splicing, and listening to the yarn of some old salt, as he indoctrinates them in these mysteries. The midshipmen have their books of navigation spread out before them, and slate in hand, are discussing sine and tangent, base, and hypotenuse. The only place in which a lounger is not seen is the quarter deck. This precinct is always sacred to duty, and etiquette. No one ever presumes to seat himself upon it, not even the commander. Here the officer of the deck is pacing to and fro, swinging his trumpet idly about, for the want of something to do. But hold a moment. He has at last found a job. It is seven bells, half past eleven, and the ship's cook has come to the mast, to report dinner. The cook is a darky, and see how he grins, as the officer of the deck, having tasted of the fat pork, in his tin pan, and mashed some of his beans, with a spoon, to see if they are done, tells him, that will do. The commander now comes on deck, with his sextant, having been informed that it is time to look out for the sun. See, he gathers the midshipmen around him, each also with his instrument, and, from time to time, asks them what altitude they have on, and compares the altitude which they give him with his own to see if they are making satisfactory progress as observers. The latitude being obtained, and reported to the officer of the deck, that officer now comes up to the commander, and touching his hat, reports twelve o'clock, as though the commander didn't know it already. The commander says to him, sententiously, make it so, as though the sun could not make it so, without the commander's leave. See, now what a stir there is about the hitherto silent decks. Since we last cast a glance at them, Jack has put up his clothes bag, and the sweepers have swept down, fore and aft, and the boatswain having piped to dinner, the cooks of the different messes are spreading their mess cloths on the deck, and arranging their viands. The drum has rolled, to grog, and the master's mate of the spirit room, master book in hand, is calling over the names of the crew, each man as his name is called, waddling up to the tub and taking the tot that is handed to him, 
by the Jack of the Dust, who is the master mate's assistant. Dinner now proceeds with somewhat noisy jest and joke, and the hands are not turned to, that is, set to work again, until one o'clock. We have averaged, in the last twenty-four hours, eight knots and a half, and have not, as yet, experienced any adverse current, though we are daily on the lookout for this enemy, latitude 8 degrees 31 semicolon longitude 56 degrees 12 dot in the course of the afternoon, a brigantine passing near us, we hove her to, with a blank cartridge, when she showed us the Dutch colours. She was from Dutch Suriname, bound for Europe. Toward nightfall, it became quite calm, and naught was heard but the thumping of the ship's propeller, as she urged her ceaseless way through the vast expanse of waters. August 8 th. Weather still beautifully clear, with an occasional rain squall enclosing us as in a gauze veil, and shutting out from view for a few minutes, at a time, the distant horizon. The wind is light, and variable, but always from the eastern board, following the sun as the chariot follows the steed. We are making good speed through the water, but we have at length encountered our dreaded enemy, the great equatorial current, which sets, with such regularity, along this coast. Its set is about W. N. W., and its drift about one knot per hour. Nothing has been seen today. The water has changed its deep blue color, to green, indicating that we are on soundings. We are about 90 miles from the coast of Guiana. The sun went down behind banks, or rather cumuli of pink and lilac clouds. We are fast sinking the North Polar Star, and new constellations arise, nightly, above the southern horizon. Amid other starry wonders, we had a fine view this evening, of the Southern Cross. Latitude 7 degrees 19 semicolon longitude 53 degrees 04 dot. The next day was cloudy, and the direction of the current was somewhat changed, for its set was now N. W. Half N. This current is proving a serious drawback, and I begin to fear, that I shall not be able to make the run to Maranum, as I had hoped. Not only are the elements adverse, but my engineer tells me, that we were badly cheated, in our coal measure, at Trinidad, the sharp coal dealer having failed to put on board of us as many tons as he had been paid for, for which the said engineer got a rowing. We observed, today, in latitude 6 degrees 01 and longitude 50 degrees 48 dot. August 10 th dot weather clear, with a deep blue sea, and a fresh breeze, from the southeast. The southeast trade winds have thus crossed the equator, and reached us in latitude 5 degrees north, which is our latitude today. I was apprehensive of this, for we are in the middle of August, and in this month these winds frequently drive back the northeast trades, and usurp their place, to a considerable extent, until the sun crosses back into the southern hemisphere. We thus have both wind, and current ahead the current alone has retarded us 50 miles, or a fraction over 2 knots an hour, which is about equal to the drift of the Gulf Stream off Cape Hatteras. Things were beginning now to look decidedly serious. I had but three days of fuel on board, and, upon consulting my chart, I found that I was still 550 miles from my port, current taken into account. It was not possible for the dull little Sumter to make this distance, in the given time, if the wind, and current should continue of the same strength. I resolved to try her, however, another night, hoping that some change for the better might take place. My journal tells the tale of that night as follows. August 11th, the morning has dawned with a fresh breeze, and rather rough sea, into which we have been plunging all night, making but little headway. The genius of the east wind refuses to permit even steam to invade his domain, and drives us back, with disdain. His ally, the current, has retarded us sixty miles in the last twenty-four hours. I now no longer hesitated, but directing the engineer to let his fires go down, turned my ship's head, to the westward, and made sail, it being my intention to run down the coast to Cayenne in French Guiana with the hope of obtaining a fresh supply of fuel at that place. 
We soon had the studding sails on the ship, and were rolling along to the northward and westward, with more grace than speed, our rate of sailing being only four knots. The afternoon proved to be remarkably fine, and we should have enjoyed this farnenty change, but for our disappointment. Our chief regret was that we were losing so much valuable time, in the midst of the stirring events of the war. Hauling in for the coast, in the vicinity of Cape Orange, we struck soundings about nightfall. The sea now became quite smooth, and the wind fell very light during the night, the current, however, is hurrying us on, though its set is not exactly in the right direction. Its tendency is to drive us too far from the coast. The next day, it became perfectly calm, and so continued all day. We were in twenty-three fathoms of water, and could see by the lead line that we were drifting over the bottom at the rate of about two knots an hour. We got out our fishing lines, and caught some deep sea fish, of the group of species. The sea was alive with the nautilus, and the curious sea nettle, with its warps and hawsers thrown out, and its semi-transparent, gelatinous disc contracting and expanding, as the little animal extracted its food from the water. Schools of fish, large and small, were playing about in every direction, and flocks of seagulls, and other marine birds of prey, were hovering over them, and making occasional forays in their midst. During the day, a sail was descried, far inshore, but we were unable to make it out, indeed sails were of the least importance to us now, as we were unable to chase. Just before sunset, we had a fine view of the Silver Mountains, some forty or fifty miles distant, in the southwest. August 15 th. During the past night, we made the Great Constable, a small island, off the coast and one of the landmarks for K.N. The night was fine, and moonlit, and we ran in, and anchored about midnight, in fourteen fathoms of water. At daylight, the next morning, after waiting for the passage of the rain squall, we got under way, and proceeding along the coast, came up with the Remise Islands, in the course of the afternoon, where we found the French pilot La lying to, waiting for us. We were off K.N., and the la had come out to show us the way into the anchorage. A pilot jumping on board, we ran in, and anchored to the northwest of the child a small island, in three and a quarter fathoms of water. I could scarcely realize, that this was the famous penal settlement of K.N., painted in French history, as the very abode of death, and fraught with all other human horrors, so beautiful, and picturesque did it appear. The outlying islands are high rising, generally, in a conical form, and are densely wooded, to their very summits. Sweet little nooks and coves, overhung by the waving foliage of strange-looking tropical trees, indent their shores, and invite the fisherman, or pleasure-seeker to explore their recesses. The mainland is equally rich in vegetation, and though the sea coast is low, distant ranges of mountains, inland, break in, agreeably upon the monotony. A perennial summer prevails, and storms, and hurricanes are unknown. It was here that some of the most desperate and bloodthirsty of the French revolutionists of 1790, were banished. Many of them died of yellow fever, others escaped, and wandered off to find inhospitable graves, in other countries, few of them ever returned to France. Shortly after we came to anchor, the batteries of the town, and some small French steamers of war, that lay in the harbour, fired salutes in honour of the birthday of Louis Napoleon, this being the 15th of August. The next morning, at daylight, I dispatched Lieutenant Evans, and Paymaster Myers, to the town, the former to call on the governor, and the latter to see if any coal could be had. Their errand was fruitless. Not only was there no coal to be purchased, but my officers thought that they had been received rather ungraciously. The fact is, we found here, as in Curaçao, that the enemy was in possession of the neutral territory. There was a federal consul resident in the place, who was the principal contractor, for supplying the French garrison with fresh beef. And there were three, or four Yankee schooners in the harbour, whose skippers had a monopoly of the trade in flour and notions. 
what could the Sumter effect against such odds? In the course of an hour after my boat returned, we were again underway, running down the coast, in the direction of Suriname, to see if the Dutchman would prove more propitious, than the Frenchman had done. About 6 p.m., we passed the Salat Islands, three in number, on the summit of one of which shone the white walls of a French military hospital, contrasting prettily with the deep green foliage of the shade trees around it. It was surrounded by low walls, on which were mounted some small guns and barbet. Hither are sent all the sick sailors, and soldiers from K.N. August 17 th. Morning clear, and beautiful, as usual, in this delightful climate, with a fresh breeze from the southeast. We are now in latitude 6 degrees north, and still the southeast trade wind is following us, the calm belt having been pushed farther and farther to the northward. We are running along in 10 fathoms of water, at an average distance of 7, or 8 miles, from the land, with the soundings surprisingly regular. Past the mouth of the small river Moroni, at noon. At 4 p.m., ran across a bank, in very muddy water, some 15 miles to the northward and eastward, of the entrance of this river, with only 3 fathoms of water on it rather close shaving on a strange coast, having but six feet of water under our keel. Becoming a little nervous, we hauled out, and soon deepened into five fathoms. There is little danger of shipwreck, on this coast, however, owing to the regularity of the soundings, and the almost perpetual smoothness of the sea. The bars off the mouths of the rivers, too, are, for the most part, of mud, where a ship sticks rather than thumps. Hence, the temerity with which we ran into shallow waters. Sunday, August 18 th. The southeast wind came to us, as softly, and almost as sweetly, this morning, as if it were breathing or a bed of violets, but it freshened as the day advanced, in obedience to the mandate of its master, the sun, and we had a fresh breeze, toward nightfall. After passing post orange, we ran over another three fathom bank, the water deepening beyond, and enabling us to haul in toward the coast, as we approached Bram's Point, at the mouth of the Suriname River, off which we anchored, near the buoy on the bar, at twenty minutes past five p.m., in four fathoms of water. This being Sunday, as we were running along the coast, we had mustered and inspected the crew and caused the clerk to read the articles for the better government of the navy to them, the same old articles, though not to read under the same old flag, as formerly. This was my invariable practice on the Sabbath. It broke in, pleasantly, and agreeably, upon the routine duties of the week, pretty much as church-going does, on shore, and had a capital effect, besides, upon discipline, reminding the sailor of his responsibility to the laws and that there were such merciless tribunals, as courts martial, for their enforcement. The very shaving, and washing, and dressing, of a Sunday morning, contributed to the sailor's self-respect. The muster gratified, too, one of his passions, as it gave him the opportunity of displaying all those anchors, and stars, which he had so industriously embroidered, in floss silk, on his ample shirt collar, and on the sleeve of his jacket. We had some dandies on board the Sumter, and it was amusing to witness the self-complacent air, with which these gentlemen would move around the capstan, with the blackest, and most carefully polished of pumps, and the whitest, and finest of sinnet hats, from which would be streaming yards enough of ribbon, to make the ship a pennant. I had had considerable difficulty in identifying the mouth of the Suriname River solo and uniform in appearance was the coast, as seen from the distance at which we had been compelled to run along it, by the shallowness of the water. There is great similarity between these shelving banks, running off to a great distance, at sea, and the banks on the coast of West Florida. The rule of soundings, on some parts of the latter coast, is a foot to the mile, so that, when the navigator is in ten feet of water, he is ten miles from the land. This is not quite the case, on the coast of Guiana, but on some parts of it, 
a large ship can scarcely come within sight of the land. A small craft, drawing but a few feet of water, has no need of making a harbor, on either coast, for the whole coast is a harbor, the sea, in bad weather, breaking in from three to five fathoms of water, miles outside of her, leaving all smooth and calm within. There is a difference, however, between the two coasts, the Florida coast is scourged by the hurricane, whilst the Guiana coast is entirely free from storms. Soon after we came to anchor, as related, we descried a steamer in the west, steering for the mouth of the river. Nothing was more likely than that, by this time, the enemy should have sent some of his fast gunboats in pursuit of us, and the smoke of a steamer on the horizon, therefore, caused me some uneasiness. I knew that I had not a chivalrous enemy to deal with, who would be likely to give me a fair fight. The captures made by the Sumter had not only touched the Yankee in a very tender spot, his pocket, they had administered, also, a well-merited rebuke to his ridiculous self-conceit. It was monstrous, indeed, in his estimation, that anyone should have the audacity, in the face of Mr. Lincoln's proclamation of prompt vengeance, to molest one of his ships. A malignant press, from Maine to Maryland, had denounced the Sumter as a pirate and no quarter was to be shown her. The steamer, now approaching, having been descried, at a great distance, by the curling of her black smoke high into the still air, night set in before she was near enough to be made out. We could see her form indistinctly, in the darkness, but no certain conclusion could be arrived at as to her size or nationality. I, at once, caused my fires to be lighted, and, beating to quarters, prepared my ship for action. We stood at our guns for some time, but seeing, about 10 p.m., that the strange steamer came to anchor, some three or four miles outside of us, I permitted the men to leave their quarters, cautioning the officer of the watch, however, to keep a bright lookout, during the night, for the approach of boats, and to call me if there should be any cause for alarm. As I turned in, I thought things looked a little squally. If the strange vessel were a mail steamer, she would, of course, be familiar with the waters in which she plied, and, instead of anchoring outside, would have run boldly into the river without waiting for daylight. Besides, she had no lights about her, as she approached, and packet steamers always go well lighted up. That she was a steamer of war, therefore, appeared quite certain, but, of course, it was of no use to speculate upon the chances of her being an enemy, daylight only could reveal that. In the meantime, the best thing we could do would be to get a good night's rest, so as to rise refreshed for the morning's work, if work there should be. At daylight, all hands were again summoned to their quarters, and pretty soon the strange steamer was observed to be under way, and standing toward us. We got up our own anchor in a trice the men running around the capstan in double quick, and putting the ship under steam, started to meet her. Neither of us had, as yet, any colors hoisted. We soon perceived that the stranger was no heavier than ourselves. This greatly encouraged me, and I could see a corresponding lighting up of the faces of my crew, all standing silently at their guns. Desiring to make the stranger reveal her nationality to me first, I now hoisted the French colors, a fine new flag, that I had made in New Orleans. To my astonishment, and no little perplexity, up went the same colors, on board the stranger. I was alongside of a French ship of war, pretending to be a Frenchman myself. Of course, there was but one thing to be done, and that was, to haul down the French flag and hoist my own, which was done in an instant, when we mutually hailed. A colloquy ensued, when the names of the two ships were interchanged, and we ascertained that the stranger was bound into the Suriname, like ourselves. We now both ran in for the light ship, and the Frenchman receiving a pilot on board from her, I permitted him to take the lead, and we followed him up the long and narrow channel, having sometimes scarcely a foot of water to spare under our keel. After we had passed inside of Bram's Point, the tide being out, both ships anchored to wait for the returning flood. I took advantage of the opportunity, 
and sent a lieutenant to visit the French ship. The Vulture, for such was her name, was one of the old-fashioned, side-wheel steamers, mounting only carronades, and was last from Martinique, with convicts on board, for K.N. Running short of coal, she was putting into Paramaribo, for a supply. Getting underway again, soon after midday, we continued our course up the river. We were much reminded, by the scenery of the Suriname, of that of some of our southern rivers, the Mississippi, for instance, after the voyager from the Gulf has left the marshes behind him, and is approaching New Orleans. The bottom lands, near the river, are cleared, and occupied by sugar, and other plantations, the background of the picture presenting a dense, and unbroken forest. As we passed the well-known sugar house, with its tall chimney, emitting volumes of black smoke, and saw gangs of slaves, cutting, and hauling in the cane, the illusion was quite perfect. Nothing can exceed the fertility of these alluvial lands. They are absolutely inexhaustible, yielding crop after crop, in continual succession, without rest or interval, there being no frosts to interfere with vegetation, in this genial climate. Some of the planters' dwellings were tasteful, and even elegant, surrounded by galleries whose green Venetian blinds gave promise of coolness within, and sheltered besides by the umbrageous arms of giant forest trees. Cattle wandered over the pasture lands, the negroes were well clothed, and there was a general air of abundance, and contentment. Slavery is held by a very precarious tenure, here, and will doubtless soon disappear. The being a strong party, in Holland, in favor of its abolition. Our consort, the Vulture, and ourselves anchored almost at the same moment, off the town of Paramaribo, in the middle of the afternoon. There were two, or three American brigandines in the harbor, and a couple of Dutch ships of war. I sent a lieutenant to call on the governor, and to request permission to coal, and refit, both of which requests were granted, with the usual conditions, viz., that I should not increase my crew or armament, or receive ammunition on board. The captain of the vulture now came on board, to return the visit I had made him, through my lieutenant, and the commanding Dutch naval officer also called. But, what was more important, several coal merchants came off to negotiate with my paymaster, about supplying the ship with the very necessary article in which they dealt. The successful bidder for our contract was a gentleman of color, that is to say, a quadroon, who talked freely about whites, and blacks, always putting himself, of course, in the former category, by the use of the pronoun we, and seemed to have no sort of objection to our flag, or the cause it was supposed to represent. I wind this gentleman, along with my other visitors, and though I paid him a remunerative price for his coal, I am under many obligations to him, for his kindness, and assistance to us, during our stay. I take great pleasure in contrasting the conduct and bearing of this person, with those of the federal consul, at Paramaribo. This latter gentleman was a Connecticut man, who had probably worn white cravats, and delivered quarter dollar lectures, in his native village, against slavery, as a means of obtaining an honest living. Coming to Paramaribo, he had married a mulatto wife, and through her, become a slaveholder. This virtuous representative of great moral ideas, at once threw himself into the breach, between the Sumter, and the coal market, and did all he could to prevent her from coaling. He was one of Mr. Seward's men, and taking up the refrain about piracy, went first to the governor, to see what could be effected, in that quarter. Being told that Holland had followed the lead of the great powers, and recognized the Confederates as belligerents, he next went to our quadroon contractor, and endeavored to bluff him off, by threatening him with the loss of any Yankee trade, that he might possess. Being equally unsuccessful here, he next tried to seduce the lightermen, to prevent them from delivering the coal to us. All would not do, however, the Sumter, or what is more likely, the Sumter's gold, that talisman that works so many miracles in this virtuous world of ours, was too strong for him, and, pretty soon, the black diamonds, the most precious of jewels to men in our condition, 
came tumbling into our coal bunkers. Failing to prevent us from coaling, the little Connecticut official next tampered with the pilot, and endeavored to prevail on him, to refuse to take us to sea. But the pilot was a sailor, with all the generous instincts that belonged to his class, and he not only refused to be seduced, but presented me with some local charts of the coast, which I found very useful. The consul had his triumph at last, however. When I was fitting out the Sumter in New Orleans, a friend, and relative resident in that city, had kindly permitted me to take with me, as my steward, a valuable slave of his who had been brought up as a dining room servant. Ned was as black as the ace of spades, and being a good tempered, docile lad, had become my right hand man, taking the best of care of my cabin, and keeping my table supplied with all the delicacies of the different markets, to which we had had access. He was as happy as the days were long, a great favorite with the crew, and when there was any fun going on, on the forecastle, he was sure to be in the midst of it. But the tempter came along. The Connecticut misogynist, and slaveholder, at the same time, had seen Ned's shining and happy face going to market, of mornings, and, like the serpent of old, whispered in his ear. One morning Ned was missing, but the market basket came off, piled up as usual with luxuries for dinner. The lad had been bred in an honest household, and though his poor brain had been bewildered, he was still above theft. His market basket fully balanced his account. Poor Ned. His after fate was a sad one. He was taken to the country, by his Mephistophiles, and set at work, with the slaves of that pious Puritan, on a small plantation that belonged to his negro wife. Ned's head was rather too woolly, to enable him to understand much about the abstractions of freedom and slavery, but he had sense enough to see, ere long, that he had been beguiled, and cheated, by the smooth Yankee, and when, in course of time, he saw himself reduced to yam diet, and ragged clothing, he began, like the prodigal child, to remember the abundance of his master's house, and to long to return to it. Accordingly, he was missing, again, one fine morning, and was heard of no more in Paramaribo. He had embarked on board a vessel bound to Europe and next turned up in Southampton. The poor negro had wandered off at a hazard in quest of the Sumter, but hearing nothing of her, and learning that the Confederate States steamer Nashville, Commander Pegram, was at Southampton, he made his way on board of that ship, and told his tale to the officers. He afterward found his way to the United States, and died miserably, of cholera, in some of the negro suburbs of Washington City. August 23 D. Weather clear, during the day, but we had some heavy showers of rain, with thunder, and lightning during the night. We are receiving coal rather slowly, a small light a load at a time. We are making some changes in the internal arrangements of the ship. Finding, by experience, that we have more tank room, for water, than is requisite, we are landing a couple of our larger tanks and extending the bulkheads of the coal bunkers. By this means, we shall be enabled to increase our coal carrying capacity by at least a third, carrying twelve days of fuel, instead of eight. Still the Sumter remains fundamentally defective, as a cruiser, in her inability to lift her screw. August 24 th. Weather clear, and pleasant, with some passing clouds, and light showers of rain. The Dutch mail steamer, from Demerara, arrived, today. We are looking anxiously for news from home, as, at last accounts, July 20th from New York, a battle near Manassas Junction, seemed imminent. Demerara papers of the 19th of August contain nothing, except that some skirmishing had taken place, between the two armies. The French steamer of Warable arrived, and anchored near us. Sunday. August 25 th. Morning cloudy. At half past eight I went on shore to church. The good old mother has her churches, and clergymen, even in this remote Dutch colony. The music of her choirs is like the drumbeat of England, it encircles the earth, with its never-ending melody. As the sun, keeping company with the hours, lights up, with his newly risen beams, 
one degree of longitude after another, he awakens the priest to the performance of the never-ending mass. The church was a neat, well-arranged wooden building, of large dimensions, and filled to overflowing with devout worshippers. All the shades of color, from snowy white to sooty weather, and there did not seem to be any order in the seating of the congregation, the shades being promiscuously mixed. The preacher was fluent, and earnest in action, but his sermon, which seemed to impress the congregation, being in that beautiful and harmonious language, which we call Low Dutch, was entirely unintelligible to me. The Latin Mass, and ceremonies, which are the same all over the world, were, of course, quite familiar, and awoke many tender reminiscences. I had heard, and seen them, in my own country, under the domes of grand cathedrals, and in the quiet retreat of the country house, where the good wife herself had improvised the altar. A detachment of the government troops was present. Some Dutch naval lieutenants visited the ship today. We learn, by late papers from Barbados, politely brought us by these gentlemen, that the enemy's steamer, Keystone State, was in that island, in search of us, on the 21st of July. She probably heard, there, of my intention to go back to cruise off the island of Cuba, which, as the reader has seen, I confidentially communicated to my friends at Curaçao, and has turned back herself. If she were on the right track she should be here before this. There was great commotion, too, as we learn by these papers, at Key West, on the 8th of July, when the news reached there of our being at Chienfuegos. Consul Schufelt, at Havana, had been prompt, as I had foreseen. We entered Chienfuegos on the 6th, and on the 8th, he had two heavy and fast steamers, the Niagara and the Crusader, in pursuit of us. They, too, seem to have lost the trail. August 28 th. Bright, elastic morning, with a gentle breeze from the southeast. There was a grand fandango, on shore, last night, at which some of my officers were present. The fun grew fast and furious, as the night waned, and what with the popping of champagne corks, and the flashing of the bright eyes of the waltzers, as they were whirled in the giddy dance, my young fellows have come off looking a little red about the eyes, and inclined to be poetical. Rumors have been rife, for some days past, of a confederate victory at Manassas. There seems now to be no longer any doubt about the fact. Private letters have been received, from Demerara, which state that the enemy was not only beaten, but shamefully rooted, flying in confusion and dismay from the battlefield, and seeking refuge. Bell Mel, in the federal capital. With the exception of the federal consul, and Yankee skippers in the port, and a small knot of shopkeepers, interested in the American trade, all countenances are beaming with joy at this intelligence. This splendid victory was won by General Bregard. McDowell was the commander of the enemy's forces, assisted, as it would seem, by the poor old superannuated Winfield Scott. This renegade soldier lending his now feeble intellect to the northern vandal, to assist in stabbing to the heart his mother state, Virginia. Alas! What an ignoble end of a once proud and honored soldier! August 29th. We have, at length, finished coaling, after a tedious delay of ten days. A rumor prevailed in the town, yesterday, that there were two enemies' ships of war off the bar keeping themselves cunningly out of sight, to waylay the sumter. The rumor comes with circumstance, for it is said that the fisherman, who brought the news, supplied one of the ships with fish, and said that the other ship was getting water on board from one of the coast plantations. Today, the rumor dwindles, but one ship, it seems, has been seen, and she a merchant ship. The story is probably like that of the three white crows, August 30 th. The pilot having come on board, we got under way, at 2 p.m., and steamed down to the mouth of the river, where we came to anchor. A ship, going to sea, is like a woman going on a journey, many last things remaining to be attended to, at the moment of departure. I have always found it best, to shove off shore boats, expel all visitors, 
drop down out of the influences of the port, and send an officer or two back, to arrange these last things. A boat was now accordingly dispatched back to the town, for this purpose, and as she would not return until late in the night, inviting the surgeon and paymaster, and my clerk to accompany me, I pulled on shore, in my gig, to make a visit to an adjoining sugar plantation, that lay close by, tempting us to a stroll under its fine avenues of coconut and acacia trees. We were received very hospitably at the planter's mansion, where we found some agreeable ladies, and with whom we stayed late enough, to take tea, at their pressing solicitation. It was a Hollandese household, but all the inmates spoke excellent English. Whilst tea was being prepared, we wandered over the premises, the sugar house included, where we witnessed all the processes of sugar making, from the expression of the juice from the cane, to the crystallization of the syrup. There were crowds of negroes on the place, old and young, male and female, some at work, and some at play, the players being rather the more numerous of the two classes. The grounds around the dwelling were tastefully laid out, in serpentine walks, winding through a wilderness of rare tropical shrubbery, redolent of the most exquisite of perfumes. True to the Dutch instinct for the water, the river, or rather the bay, for the river has now disembogged into an arm of the sea, washed the very walls of the flower garden, and the plash, or rather the monotonous fretting of the tiny waves, at their base, formed no unmusical accompaniment to the hum of conversation, as the evening wore away. Among other plants, we noticed the giant Maggie, and a great variety of the cactus, that favorite child of the sun. Our visit being over, we took a warm leave of our hospitable entertainers, and pulled on board the Sumter, by moonlight, deeply impressed, and softened as well by the harmonies of nature, and feeling as little like pirates, as possible. The next morning, having run up our boats, and taken a final leave of the waters of the Suriname, we steamed out to sea, crossing the bar about Meridian, the weather being fine, and the wind fresh from the northeast. Having given it out that we were bound to Barbados, to look for the Keystone State, we stood north, until we had run the land out of sight, to give color to this idea, when we changed our course to E, half S. We ran along, for the next two or three days, on soundings, with a view to break the force of the current, doubling Cape Orange, on the 2D of September, and hauling more to the southward, with the trending of the coast. On the next day, we had regained the position from which we had been compelled to bear up, and my journal remarks, we have thus lost three days and a half of steaming, or about fifty tons of coal, but what is worse, we have lost twenty-three days of valuable time, comma, but this time can scarcely be said to have been wholly lost, either, since the display of the flag of our young republic, in Cayenne and Paramaribo, has had a most excellent effect. September 4 th. Weather fine, with a fresh breeze, from about E. By S. During most of the day, we have carried fore and aft sails, and have made an excellent run, for a dull ship, 175 miles. We have experienced no current. We passed the mouths of the great Amazon, today, bearing on its bosom the waters of a continent. We were running along in the deepest and bluest of sea water, whilst at no great distance from us, we could plainly perceive, through our telescopes, the turbid waters of the great stream, mixing and mingling, by slow degrees, with the ocean. Numerous tide drips marked the uncongenial meeting of the waters, and the seagull and penguin were busy diving in them, as though this neutral ground, or rather I should say, battleground was a favorite resort for the small fish, on which they prey. A drift log with sedate waterfowl seated upon it, would now and then come along, and schools of porpoises were disporting themselves, now in the blue, now in the muddy waters. Unlike the mouths of the Mississippi, there were no white sails of commerce dotting the waters, in the offing, and no giant towboats throwing their volumes of black smoke into the air, and, with their huge side wheels, beating time to the pulsations of the steam engine. All was nature. The giant stream ran through a wilderness, 
scarcely yet open to civilization. It disembogs a little south of the equator, and runs from west to east, nearly entirely across the continent. We crossed the equator in the Sumter, on the meridian of 46 degrees 40 comma and sounded in 20 fathoms of water, bringing up from the bottom of the sea, for the first time, some of the sand, and shells of the southern hemisphere. We hoisted the Confederate flag, though there were no eyes to look upon it outside of our ship, to vindicate, symbolically, our right to enter this new domain of Neptune, in spite of Abraham Lincoln, and the Federal gunboats. September 5 th. Wind fresh from E. S. E. Doubled Cape Garupi, during the early morning, and sounded, at meridian, in eight fathoms of water, without any land in sight, though the day was clear. Hauled out from the coast a little. At half past three, p. m., made the island of San Juan, for which we had been running, a little on the starboard bow. We now hauled in close with this island, and running along its white sand beach, which reminded us much of the Florida coast, about Pensacola, we doubled its northeastern end, in six, and seven fathoms of water. Night now set in, and, shaping our course s. e. by s, we ran into some very broken ground, the soundings frequently changing, in a single cast of the lead, from seven to four fathoms four fathoms being rather uncomfortably shoal, on an open coast, we again hauled out, until we deepened our water to eight fathoms, in which we ran along, still in very equal soundings, until we made the light on Mount de Colomai, nearly ahead. In half an hour afterward, we anchored in six and a half fathoms of water, to wait for daylight. When I afterward told some Brazilian officers, who came on board, to visit me, in Maranam, of this eventful night's run, they held up their hands in astonishment, telling me that the chances were a hundred to one, that I had been wrecked, for, many parts of the broken ground over which I had run, were almost dry, at low water. Their steamers never attempt it, they said, with the best pilots on board. It is a pity this coast is not better surveyed, for the charts by which I was running represented it free from danger. The Brazilian is a coral coast, and, as before remarked, all coral coasts are dangerous. The inequality of soundings was due to the greater industry of the little stone mason, of which we read some pages back, in some spots than in others. This little worker of the sea will sometimes pierce a ship's bottom, with a cone, which it has brought near the surface, from surrounding deep waters. As it is constantly at work, the bottom of the sea is constantly changing, and hence, on coral coasts, surveying steamers should be almost always at work. Having anchored in the open sea, and the sea being a little rough, we found, when we came to heave up our anchor, the next morning, that we brought up only the ring, and a small piece of the shank. It had probably been caught in the rocky bottom, and broken by the force of the windlass, aided by the pitching of the ship. There was, much to my regret, no pilot boat in sight. The entrance to Maranum is quite difficult, but difficult as it was, I was forced to attempt it. We rounded safely, the shoals of Mount Ite Kalomai, and passed the middle ground of the Mayo, and I was already congratulating myself that the danger was past, when the ship ran plump upon a sandbank, and stopped. She went on, at full speed, and the shock to those standing on deck, was almost sufficient to throw them off their feet. We had a skillful leadsman in the chains, and at his last cast, he had found no bottom, with eight fathoms of line, all that the speed of the ship would allow him to sink. Here was a catastrophe. Were the bones of the Sumter to be laid to rest, on the coast of Brazil, and her commander, and crew to return to the Confederate States, and report to the government? that they had lost its only ship of war. This idea flashed through my mind for an instant, but only for an instant, for the work of the moment pressed. The engineer on duty had stopped his engine, without waiting for orders, as soon as he felt the ship strike, and I now ordered it reversed. In a moment more the screw was revolving in the opposite direction, and the strong tide, which was running out, 
catching the ship, on the port bow, at the same time, she swung round to starboard, and slid off the almost perpendicular ridge of the bank into deep water, pretty much as a turtle will drop off a log. The first thing I did was to draw a long breath, and the second was to put on an air of indifference, as if nothing had happened, and tell the officer of the deck, in the coolest manner possible, to let her go ahead. We now proceeded more cautiously, under low steam, giving the leadsman plenty of time to get his soundings, accurately. These soon proving very irregular, and there being some fishermen on the coast, half a mile distant, throwing up their arms, and gesticulating to us, as though to warn us of danger, we anchored, and sending a boat on shore, brought one of them off, who volunteered to pilot us up to the town. Upon sounding the pumps, we found that the ship had suffered no damage from the concussion. We anchored in the port of Maranum, in three or four hours afterward, and the Confederate States flag waved in the Empire of Brazil. The port admiral sent a lieutenant to call on us, soon after anchoring, and I dispatched one of my own lieutenants, to call on the governor, returning the admiral's visit, myself, in the course of the afternoon, at his place of business on shore. Chapter 18 The Sumter at Maranum, More Diplomacy Necessary The Hotel Porto and ITS Proprietor a week on shore, ship coals and sails again. The day after our arrival in Maranum, was a day of feasting and rejoicing by the town's people, all business being suspended. It was the 7th of September, the anniversary of the day on which Brazil had severed her political connection with Portugal, in other words, it was her independence day. The forts and ships of war fired salutes, and the latter were gaily draped in flags and signals presenting a very pretty appearance. It is customary, on such occasions, for the ships of war of other nations, in the port, to participate in the ceremonies and merry-making. We abstained from all participation, on board the Sumter, our flag being, as yet, unrecognized, for the purposes of form and ceremony. In the evening, a grand ball was given, at the government house, by the president of the province, to which all the world, except the Sumter, was invited, the etiquette of nations, before referred to, requiring that she should be ruled out. The only feeling excited in us, by this official slight, was one of contempt for the silliness of the proceeding, a contempt heightened by the reflection that we were a race of Anglo-Saxons, proud of our lineage, and proud of our strength, frowned upon by a set of half-breeds. The government house being situated on the river bank, Near our anchorage, the lights of the brilliantly illuminated halls and chambers, shone full upon our decks, and the music of the bands, and even the confused hum of the voices of the merrymakers, and the muffled shuffling of the dancers' feet, came to us, very distinctly, to a late hour. The sumter lay dark, and motionless, and silent, amid this scene of merriment, the only answer which she sent back to the revellers, being the sonorous and startling cry, every half hour, of her marine sentinels on post, of all's well. Having suffered, somewhat, in health, from the fatigue and excitement of the last few weeks, I removed on shore the next day, and took up my quarters at the Hotel Porto, kept by one of those nondescripts one sometimes meets with in the larger South American cities, whose nationality it is impossible to guess at, except that he belongs to the Latin race. My landlord had followed the sea, among his thousand and one occupations, spoke half a dozen languages, and was running to use a slang Americanism, a theatre and one or two fashionable restaurants, in beautifully laid out pleasure grounds in the suburbs, in addition to his hotel. He drove a pair of fast horses, was on capital terms with all the pretty women in the town, smashed champagne bottles, right and left and smoked the best of Havana cigars. The reader will thus see, that being an invalid, and requiring a little nursing, I had fallen into capital hands. Whether it was that Senhor Porto, for he had given his own name to his hotel, had chased and captured merchant ships, in former days, himself, or from some other motive, I could never tell, but he took quite a fancy to me at once, and I rode with him daily, during my stay behind his fast ponies, 
and visited all the places of amusement, of which he was the padron. The consequence was, that I visibly improved in health, and at the end of the week which I spent with him, returned on board the Sumter, quite set up again, in requital whereof, I have permitted the gallant captain to sit for his portrait in these pages. My first duty, after being installed in my new apartments on shore, was, of course, to call on the president of the department, the town of Maranam being the seat of government of the province of the same name. The president declined to see me then, but appointed noon, the next day, to receive me. Soon after I had returned to my hotel, Senhor Porto entered my room, to inform me that Captain Pinto, of the Brazilian Navy, the commanding naval officer on the station, accompanied by the chief of police, had called to see me. What does this mean? said I. The chief of police, in our cities, is a very questionable sort of gentleman, and is usually supposed to be on the scent of malefactors. Oh! He is a very respectable gentleman, I assure you, replied Porto, and, as you see, he has called with the port admiral, so that he is in good company, at least. Indeed he is reputed to be the confidential friend of the president. Thus reassured, and making a virtue of necessity, I desired Porto, very complacently, to admit the visitors. The port admiral had done me the honor to visit me, immediately upon my arrival, and I had returned his visit, so that we were not strangers. He introduced the chief of police to me, who proved to be, as Porto had represented him, an agreeable gentleman, holding military rank, and, after the two had been seated, they opened their business to me. They had come, they said on behalf of the president, to present me with a copy of a paper, which had been handed him, by the United States Consul, protesting against my being permitted to coal, or receive any other supplies in the port of Maranam. Oh ho! thought I, here is another of Mr. Seward's small fry turned up. I read the paper, and found it full of ignorance and falsehoods, ignorance of the most common principles of international law and barefaced misrepresentations with regard to my ship, the whole composed in such execrable English, as to be highly creditable to Mr. Seward's department. I characterized the paper, as it deserved, and said to the gentleman, that as I had made an appointment to call on the President, on the morrow, I would take that opportunity of replying to the slanderous document. The conversation then turned on general topics, and my visitors soon after withdrew. As I rode out, that afternoon, with Porto, he said, never mind. I know all that is going on, at the palace, and you will get all the coal, and everything else you want. The pay of the federal consul at Maranam, was, I believe, at the time I visited the town, about twelve hundred dollars, per annum. As was to be expected, a small man filled the small place. He was quite young and with commendable Yankee thrift, was exercising, in the consular dwelling, the occupation of a dentist, the old flag flying over his files, false teeth, and spittoons. He probably wrote the dispatch, a copy of which had been handed me, in the intervals between the entrance, and exit of his customers. It was not wonderful, therefore, that this semi-diplomat, charged with the affairs of the great republic, and with the decayed teeth of the young ladies of Maranam, at one and the same time, should be a little confused, as to points of international law, and the rules of Lindley Murray. That he should misrepresent me was both natural, and federal. At the appointed hour, the next day, I called to see His Excellency, the President, and being ushered, by an orderly in waiting, into a suite of spacious, and elegantly furnished apartments. I found Captain Pinto, and His Excellency, both prepared to receive me. We proceeded, at once, to business. I exhibited to His Excellency the same little piece of brownish paper, with Mr. Jefferson Davis's signature at the bottom of it, that I had shown to Captain Hillier of the Cadmus, unasked, however, as no doubts had been raised as to the verity of the character of my ship. I then read to His Excellency an extract or two from the letter of instructions, which had been sent me by the Secretary of the Navy, 
directing me to pay all proper respect to the territory, and property of neutrals. I next read the proclamations of England and France, acknowledging us to be in the possession of belligerent rights, and said to His Excellency, that although I had not seen the proclamation of Brazil, I presumed she had followed the lead of the European powers, to which he assented. I then rested my case, as the lawyers say, seeing, by the expression of His Excellency's countenance, that every lick had told, and that I had nothing now to fear. But, what about coal being contraband of war, said His Excellency, at this stage of the proceeding? The United States Consul, in the protest addressed to me, a copy of which I sent you, yesterday, by Captain Pinto, and the Chief of Police, states that you had not been permitted to coal, in any of the ports, which you have hitherto visited. The reader will recollect, that, at the British island of Trinidad, the question of my being permitted to coal had been submitted to the law officers of the Crown. The newspaper, at that place, had published a copy of the opinion of these officers, and also a copy of the decision of the Governor, thereupon. Having brought a copy of this paper, in my pocket, for the occasion, I now rejoin to His Excellency, the United States Consul has made you a false statement. I have coaled, already, in the colonies of no less than three powers, Spain, Holland, and England and drawing from my pocket the newspaper, and handing it to him, I continued, and Your Excellency will find, in this paper, the decision of the English authorities upon the point in question, that is to say, that coal is not contraband of war, and may be supplied by neutrals to belligerents. Captain Pinto, to whom His Excellency handed the paper, read aloud the decision, putting it into very good Portuguese, as he went along, and when he had finished the reading, His Excellency turned again to me, and said, I have no longer any doubts on the question. You can have free access to the markets and purchase whatsoever you may desire, munitions of war alone excepted. I have been thus particular in describing these proceedings to the reader, to show him with what sleuth-hound perseverance I was followed up, by these small consuls, taken from the political kennel in the northern states, who never hesitated to use the most unblushing falsehoods, if they thought these would serve their purposes better than the truth. The official portion of my interview with the President being ended, I ventured upon some general remarks with regard to the unnatural, and wicked war which was being waged upon us, and soon afterward took my leave. In an hour after I had left the President's quarters, my paymaster had contracted for a supply of coal, and lighters were being prepared to take it on board. The sailors were now permitted to visit the shore, in detachments, on liberty and the officers wandered about, in twos and threes, wherever inclination prompted. We soon found that wherever we moved, we were objects of much curiosity, the people frequently turning to stare at us, but we were always treated with respect. Nothing was thought, or talked of, during our stay, but the American War. The Provincial Congress was in session, and several of its members boarded at the Hotel Porto. I found them intelligent, well-informed men. There were political parties here, as elsewhere, of course, among others as might be expected, in a slaveholding country, there was an abolition party, and this party sympathized with the North. It was very small, however, for it was quite evident, from the popular demonstrations, that the great mass of the people were with us. This state of the public feeling not only rendered our stay, very pleasant, but facilitated us in getting off our supplies. Invitations to the houses of the citizens were frequent, and we had free access to all the clubs, and other places of public resort. I must not omit to mention here, a very agreeable fellow countryman, whom we met in Maranham, Mr. J. Wetson, from Texas. He had been several years in Brazil. His profession was that of a steam engineer, and millwright. This worthy young mechanic, full of love, and enthusiasm for his section, loaned the paymaster two thousand dollars, on the bill against the Secretary of the Navy, and during the whole of us day, his rooms were the headquarters of my younger officers, where he dispensed to them true southern hospitality. 
we were gratified to find him a great favorite with the town's people, and we took leave of him with regret. Moranam lies in latitude 2 degrees s. And we visited it, during the dry season, the sun having carried the equatorial cloud ring, which gives it rain, farther north. We had perpetual sunshine, during our stay, but the heat was tempered by the trade wind, which blew sometimes half or gale, so that we did not feel it oppressive. Toward night the sea breeze would moderate, and the most heavenly of bright skies, and most balmy of atmospheres would envelop the land escape. At this witching hour, the beauties of Marana made their appearance, at the street doors, and at open windows, and the tinkle of the guitar and the gentle hum of conversation would be heard. Later in the night, there would arise from different parts of the town, somewhat removed from the haunts of the upper tendum, the rumbling, and jingling of the tambourine, and the merry notes of the violin, as the national fandango was danced, with a vigor, and at the same time with a poetry of motion unknown to colder climes. The wine flowed freely on these occasions, and not unfrequently the red knife of the assassin found the heart's blood of a rival in love, for there are other climes besides those of which the poet sang, where the rage of the vulture, the love of the turtle, now melt into sorrow, now madden to crime. The trade of Miranum is mostly monopolized by Portugal, France, and Spain, though there is some little carried on with the United States, an occasional ship from New York, or Boston, bringing a cargo of flour, cheap but gaudy furniture, clocks, and domestic cottons, and other Yankee staples, and notions. The shopkeepers are mostly French and Germans. An excellent staple of cotton is produced in the province of Miranum. On the 15th of September, the Sumter was ready for sea, having been refitted, and repainted, besides being cold, and provisioned, and the being, as usual, according to rumor, a couple of enemy's ships waiting for her outside, we received a pilot on board, and getting up steam, took leave of Miranum, carrying with us many kindly recollections of the hospitality of the people. We swept the sea horizon, with our glasses, as we approached the bar, but the enemy's cruisers were nowhere to be seen, and at 3 p.m., we were again in blue water, our little craft rising, and falling gently, to the undulations of the sea, as she ploughed her way through it. The question now was, in what direction should we steer? I was within striking distance of the cruising ground, for which I had set out. Cape Street Roke, but we had been so long delayed, that we should reach it, if we proceeded thither at all, at a most unpropitious season, the sailing, and steaming qualities of the Sumter considered. The trade winds were sweeping round the Cape, blowing half or gale, on the wings of which the dullest ship would be able to run away from us, if we trusted to sail, alone, and steam, in the present state of my exchequer, was out of the question. I had paid $17.50 per ton for the coal I had taken in, at Moranum, and but for the timely loan of Mr. Wetson, should have exhausted my treasury entirely. The trade winds would continue to blow, with equal force, until some time in December, they were then moderate, and from that time, onward, until March, we might expect more gentle weather. This, then, was the only season, in which the Sumter could operate off the Cape, to advantage. On the other hand, the calm belt of the equator lay before me, its southern edge, at this season of the year, being in latitude of about 5 degrees n. All the homeward bound trade of the enemy passed through this calm belt, or used to pass through it before the war, at a well-known crossing. At that crossing, there would be a calm sea, light, and variable winds, and rain. In such weather, I could lie in wait for my prey, under sail, and, if surprise, and stratagem did not effect my purpose, I could, when a sail appeared, get up steam and chase and capture, without the expenditure of much fuel. In this way, with the coal I had on board, I could prolong my cruise, probably, for a couple of months. I did not hesitate long, therefore, between the two schemes. I turned my ship's head to the northward, and eastward, for the calm belt, and before sunset, 
we had run the coast of Brazil out of sight. We recrossed the equator, the next day. In five days more, the sun would have reached the equator, when we should have had the grand spectacle, at noon, of being able to sweep him, with our instruments, entirely around the horizon, with his lower limb just touching it, at all points. We could nearly do this, as it was, and so rapidly did he dip, at noon, that we were obliged to watch him, with constant vigilance, to ascertain the precise moment of twelve o'clock. September 17 th. The sea is of a deep, indigo blue, and we have a bright, and exceedingly transparent atmosphere, with a fresh breeze from the southeast. At half past eleven a. m., we let the steam go down, uncoupled the propeller, and put the ship under sail. Observed at noon, in latitude 2 degrees 19 n, longitude, 41 degrees 29 dot. For the next few days, we encountered a remarkable easterly current, the current, in this part of the ocean, being almost constantly to the westward. This current, which we were now stemming, for we were sailing toward the northwest, retarded us, as much as fifty miles, in a single day. So remarkable did the phenomenon appear, that if I had noticed it, for but a single day, I should have been inclined to think that I had made some mistake in my observations, or that there was some error in my instrument, but we noticed it, day after day, for four or five days. Contemporaneously with this phenomenon, another, and even more wonderful one appeared. This was a succession of tie drips, so remarkable, that they deserve special description. The Sumter lay nearly stationary. During the whole of these phenomena, the easterly current setting her back, nearly as much as she gained under sail. She was in the average latitude of 5 degrees n, and average longitude of 42 degrees w. For the first three days, the rips appeared with wonderful regularity, there being an interval of just twelve hours between them. They approached us from the south, and travelled toward the north. At first, only a line of foam would be seen, on the distant horizon, approaching the ship very rapidly. As it came nearer, an almost perpendicular wall of water, extending east and west, as far as the eye could reach, would be seen, the top of the wall boiling and foaming, like a breaker rolling over a rocky bottom. As the ridge approached nearer and nearer, it assumed the form of a series of rough billows, jostling against, and struggling with each other, producing a scene of the utmost confusion, the noise resembling that of a distant cataract. Reaching the ship, these billows would strike her with such force, as to send their spray to the deck, and cause her to roll and pitch, as though she were amid breakers. The phenomenon was, indeed, that of breakers, only the cause was not apparent, there being no shoal water to account for it. The Sumter sometimes rolled so violently in these breakers, when broadside to, that we were obliged to keep her off her course, several points, to bring the sea on her quarter, and thus mitigate the effect. The belt of rips would not be broad, and as it travelled very rapidly, fifteen or twenty miles the hour, the ship would not be long within its influence. In the course of three quarters of an hour, it would disappear, entirely, on the distant northern horizon. So curious was the whole phenomenon, that the sailors, as well as the officers, assembled, as if by common consent, to witness it. The come the tide drips. Some would exclaim, and, in a moment there would be a demand for the telescopes, and a rush to the ship's side, to witness the curious spectacle. These rips have frequently been noticed by navigators, and discussed by philosophers, but, hitherto, no satisfactory explanation has been given of them. They are like the bores, at the mouths of great rivers, as at the mouth of the Amazon, in the western hemisphere, and of the Ganges, in the eastern, great breathings, or convulsions of the sea, the causes of which elude our research. These bores sometimes come in, in great perpendicular walls, sweeping everything before them, and causing immense destruction of life, and property. I was, at first, inclined to attribute these tide rips to the lunar influence, as they appeared twice in twenty-four hours, like the tides, and each time near the passing of the meridian, 
by the moon, but, in a few days, they varied their times of appearance, and came on quite irregularly, sometimes with an interval of five or six hours, only. And then the tidal wave, for it is evidently this, and not a current, should be from east to west, if it were due to lunar influence, and we have seen that it travelled from south to north. Nor could I connect it with the easterly current that was prevailing, for it travelled at right angles to the current, and not with, or against it. It was, evidently, due to some pretty uniform law, as it always travelled in the same direction. We reached the calm belt, on the 24th of September, for, on this day, having lost the southeast trade, we had lightened baffling winds from the southwest, and rain clouds began to muster overhead. On the next day, the weather being in its normal condition of cloud, the welcome cry of sail ho! came resounding from the masthead, with a more prolonged, and musical cadence than usual, the lookout, with the rest of the crew, having become tired of the inactivity of the last few days. All was bustle, immediately, about the decks, and in half an hour, with the sails snugly furled, and the ship under steam, we were in hot pursuit. The stranger was a brigantine, and was standing to the northwest, pursuing the usual crossing of the calm belt, as best he might, in the light winds, that were blowing, sometimes this way, sometimes that. We came up with him quite rapidly, there being scarcely a ripple on the surface of the smooth sea, to impede our progress, and when we had come sufficiently near to enable him to make it out, distinctly, we showed him the enemy's flag. He was evidently prepared with his own flag, for, in less than a minute, the lazy breeze was toying and playing with it, and presently blew it out sufficiently, to enable us to make out the well-known and welcome stars and stripes. We hove him to, by hail, and hauling down the false colours, and hoisting our own, we sent a boat on board of him, and captured him. He proved to be the Joseph Park, of Boston, last from Pernambuco and six days out, in ballast. The park had been unable to procure a return cargo, the merchants of Pernambuco having heard of the arrival of the Sumter, at Maranum, in rather uncomfortable proximity. We transferred the crew of the captured vessel to the Sumter, replacing it with a prize crew, and got on board from her such articles of provisions, cordage, and sails as we required, but instead of burning her, we transformed her, for the present, into a scout vessel, to assist us in discovering other prizes. I sent Lieutenant Evans on board to command her, and gave him a couple of midshipmen, as watch officers. The following was his commission. Sir Colon you will take charge of the prize brig Joseph Park, and cruise in company with this vessel, until further orders. During the day, you will keep from seven to eight miles, to the westward, and to windward, and keep a bright lookout, from your top gallant yard, for sails, signalling to us, such as you may descry. Toward evening, every day, you will draw in toward this vessel, so as to be within three, or four miles of her, at dark, and, during the night you will keep close company with her, to guard against the possibility of separation. Should you, however, be separated from her, by any accident, you will make the best of your way to latitude 8 degrees n, and longitude 45 degrees w, where you will await her a reasonable time. Should you not join her again, you will make the best of your way to some port in the Confederate States. In obedience to these instructions, the park drew off to her station, and letting our fires go down on board the Sumter, we put her under sail, again. Long before night. The excitement of the chase and capture had died away, and things had resumed their wonted course. The two ships hovered about the crossing, for several days, keeping a bright lookout, but nothing more appeared, and on the 29th of September, the park having been called alongside, by signal, her prize crew was taken out, and the ship burned, after having been made a target, for a few hours, for the practice of the crew. It was evidently no longer of any use to bother ourselves about the crossing of the calm belt, for, instead of falling in with a constant stream of the enemy's ships, returning home, 
from different parts of the world, we had been cruising in it, some ten days, and had sighted but a single sail. We had kept ourselves between the parallels of 2 degrees 30 n, and 9 degrees 30 n, and between the meridians of 41 degrees 30 w, and 47 degrees 30 w, and if the reader have any curiosity on the subject, by referring to the map, he will perceive, that the northwestern diagonal of the quadrilateral figure, formed by these parallels, and meridians, is the direct course between Cape Street Stroke, and New York. But the wary seabirds had, evidently, all taken the alarm, and winged their way, home, by other routes. I was the more convinced of this, by an intercepted letter which I captured in the letter bag of the park, which was written by the master of the ship, Asteroid, to his owner, and which ran as follows. The asteroid arrived off this port, Pernambuco, last evening, seventy-five days from Baker's Island, and came to anchor in the outer roads, this morning. I found yours of August 9th, and noted the contents, which, I must say, have made me rather blue. I think you had better insure, even at the extra premium, as the asteroid is not a clipper, and will be a bond price for the southerners. I shall sail this evening, September 16th, three days before the Joseph Park, and take a new route, for Hampton Roads. The asteroid escaped us, as no doubt many more had done, by avoiding the beaten track, and taking a new road home, thus verifying, in a very pointed manner, the old adage, that the longest way round is the shortest way home. We now made sail for the West India Islands, designing, after a short cruise among them, to run into the French island of Martinique, and coal. We still kept along on the beaten track of homeward bound ships, but with little expectation of making any prizes, and for some days overhauled none but neutral ships. Many of these had cargoes for the United States, but not having the same motive to avoid me, that the enemy's ships had, they were content to travel the usual highway. Although many of them had enemy's property, on board, they were perfectly safe from molestation, the Confederate States government having adopted, as the reader has seen, in its act declaring, that, by the conduct of the enemy, a state of war existed, the liberal principle, that free ships make free goods. Among the neutrals overhauled by us, was an English brig called the Spartan, from Rio Janeiro, for St. Thomas, in the West Indies. We had an exciting chase after this fellow. We pursued him, under United States colors, and as the wind was blowing fresh, and the chase was a stern chase, it proved, as usual, to be a long one, although the Sumter was doing her best, under both steam and sail. John Bull evidently mistook us for the Yankee we pretended to be, and seemed determined to prevent us from overhauling him, if possible. His brig, as we soon discovered, had light heels, and he made the best possible use of them, by giving her every inch of canvas he could spread. Still, we gained on him, and as we came sufficiently near, we gave him a blank cartridge, to make him show his colors, and heave to. He showed his colors, the English read, but refused to heave to. The unprofessional reader may be informed, that when a merchant ship is under full sail, and especially when she is running before a fresh breeze, as the Spartan was, it puts her to no little inconvenience, to come to the wind. She has to take in her sails, one by one, owing to her being short-handed, and the clewing up, and hauling down occupy some minutes. The captain of the Spartan was loath to subject himself to this inconvenience, especially at the command of the hated Yankee. Coming up a little nearer, we now fired a shotted gun at him, taking care not to strike him, but throwing the shot so near as to give him the benefit of its rather ominous music, as it whistled past. As soon as the smoke from the gun, which obscured him for a moment, rolled away before the breeze, we could see him starting his sheet, and halyards, and pretty soon the saucy little Spartan rounded to, with her main top sail to the mast. The reader may be curious to know, why I had been so persistent in heaving to a neutral. The answer is, that I was not sure she was neutral. 
the jaunty little brig looked rather more American, than English, in all but the flag that was flying at her peak. She had not only the grace and beauty of hull that characterize our American-built ships, but their long, tapering spars on which American shipmasters especially pride themselves. She did, indeed, prove to be American, in a certain sense, as we found her to hail from Halifax, in Nova Scotia. The master of the Spartan was in an ill humor when my boarding officer jumped on board of him. It was difficult to extract a civil answer from him. What is the news? said the boarding officer. Capital news! replied the master, you Yankees are getting whipped like H, LL, you beat the Derby boys at the Manassas races. But what's the news from Rio? now inquired the supposed Yankee boarding officer. Well, there's good news from that quarter too, all the Yankee ships are laid up, for want of freights. You are rather hard upon us, my friend, now rejoined the boarding officer, why should you take such an interest in the Confederate cause? Simply, because there is a little man fighting against an overgrown bully, and I like Block. The Spartan being bound to St. Thomas, and we ourselves intending to go, soon, into the West Indies, it was highly important that we should preserve our incognito, to which end, I had charged the boarding officer, to represent his ship as a federal cruiser, in search of the Sumter. The boarding officer having done this, found the master of the Spartan complimentary to the last, for as he was stepping over the brig's side, into his boat, the master said, I hope you will find the Sumter, but I rather think you will hunt for her, as the man did for the tax collector, hoping all the time he mightn't find him. The weather now, again, became calm, and we had cat's paws from all the points of the compass. The breeze, with which we had chased the Spartan, was a mere spasmodic effort of nature, for we were still in the calm belt, or, as the sailors expressively call it, the doldrums. For the next few days, it rained almost incessantly, the heavily charged clouds sometimes settling so low, as scarcely to sweep clear of our mastheads. It did not simply rain. The water fell in torrents, and the lightning flashed, and the thunder rolled, with a magnificence and grandeur that were truly wonderful to witness. In the intervals of these drenching rains, the clouds, like so many half-wrung sponges, would lift themselves and move about with great rapidity, in every direction, now toward, and now from, each other, convolving, in the most curious disorder, as though they were so many huge, black serpents, writhing and twisting in the powerful grasp of some invisible hand. And on, a water spout would appear upon the scene, with its inverted cone, sometimes travelling rapidly, but more frequently at rest. At times, so ominous, and threatening would be the aspect of the heavens, with its armies of black clouds in battle array, its forked lightning, and crashing thunder, the perfect stillness of the atmosphere, and the rapid flight of scared waterfowl, that a hurricane would seem imminent, until we would cast our eyes upon the barometer, standing unmoved, at near the marking of thirty inches, amid all the signs, and portents around it. In half an hour, sometimes, all this paraphernalia of clouds would break in twain, and retreat, in opposite directions, to the horizon, and the sun would throw down a flood of golden light, and scalding heat upon our decks, on which would be paddling about the half-drowned sailors. The first lieutenant took advantage of these rains, to fill, and knew, his water tanks, tenting his awnings, during the heaviest of the showers, and catching more water than he needed and the sailors had another such jubilee of washing, as they had had, when we were running along the Venezuelan coast. Sunday, September 29 th. Beautiful, clear morning, with a gentle breeze from the southeast, and a smooth sea. At 11 a. m. mustered the crew, and inspected the ship. Latitude, 6 degrees 55 n, longitude, 45 degrees 08 w. Evening set in, squally, and rainy. Running along to the northwest, under top sails. October 2d. This morning, when I took my seat, at the breakfast table, 
I was surprised to find a very tempting looking dish of fried fish set out before me, and upon inquiring of my faithful steward, John, a Malayan, who had taken the place of Ned, to what good fortune he was indebted, for the prize, his little black eyes twinkled, as he said, him jump aboard, last night. Upon further inquiry, I found that it was a small sword fish, that had honored us with a visit. The active little creature having leapt no less than fifteen feet, to reach the deck of the Sumter. It was lucky that its keen spear did not come in contact with any of the crew during the leap, a loss of life might have been the consequence. The full grown swordfish has been known to pierce a ship's bottom, floor timber and all, with its most formidable weapon. October 40h. Weather clear, and beautiful, with trade clouds, white and fleecy and a light breeze from the eastward. The bosom of the gently heaving sea is scarcely ruffled. Schools of fish are playing around us, and the sailors have just hauled, on board, a large shark, which they have caught with hook and line. The sailor has a great antipathy to the shark, regarding him as his hereditary enemy. Accordingly, the monster receives no mercy when he falls into Jack's hands. See how Jack is tormenting him now and how fiercely the monster is snapping, and grinding his teeth together, and beating the deck with his powerful tail, as though he would crush in the planks. He is tenacious of life, and will be a long time in dying, and, during all this time, Jack will be cutting, and slashing him, without mercy, with his long sheath knife. The comparatively calm sea is covered, in every direction, for miles, with a golden or straw-colored dust. Whence comes it? We are four hundred miles from any land. It has, doubtless, been dropped by the trade winds, as they have been neutralized over our heads, in this calm belt of the equator, and, in a future page, we shall have further occasion to refer to it. We have observed, today, in latitude eight degrees, the longitude being forty-six degrees fifty-eight dot. October 11th. Morning clear and calm, after a couple of days of tempestuous weather, during which the barometer settled a little. Towards noon it clouded up again, and there were squally appearances in the southeast. The phenomenon of the tide rips has reappeared. Malay John was in luck, again, this morning, a covey of flying fish having fallen on the deck, last night, during the storm. He has served me a plate full of them for breakfast. The largest of them are about the size of a half grown Potomac herring, and they are somewhat similar in taste, being a delicate, but not highly flavored fish. October 14th. At noon, today, we plotted precisely upon the diagonal between Streetrook and New York, our latitude being 8 degrees 31, comma and longitude 45 degrees 56. Dot we now made more sail and on the 17th of October we had reached the latitude of 11 degrees 37 dot from this time, until the 22 d, we had a constant series of bad weather, the barometer settling to 29.80, and the wind blowing half or gale, most of the time. Sometimes the wind would go all around the compass, and the weather would change half a dozen times, in 24 hours. On the last mentioned day, the weather became again settled and being now in latitude 14 degrees, we had passed out of the calm belt, and began to receive the first breathings of the northeast trade wind. On the 24th, we chased and hove to a French brig, called La Mouche Noire, from Nantes, bound for Martinique. She had been out 42 days, had no newspapers on board, and had no news to communicate. We boarded her under the United States flag, and when the boarding officer apologized to the master for the trouble we had given him, in heaving him to, in the exercise of our belligerent right of search, he said, with an admirable naivete, he had heard the United States were at war, but he did not recollect with whom. Admirable Frenchman! Wonderful simplicity, to care nothing about newspapers, and to know nothing about wars. On the 25th, we overhauled that Rara Avis in Mare a Prussian ship. The 27th was Sunday, we had a gentle breeze from the northeast, with a smooth sea, 
and were enjoying the fine morning, with our awnings spread, scarcely expecting to be disturbed, when the cry of sail ho! again rang from the masthead. We had been making preparations for Sunday muster, Jack having already taken down from its hiding place his Sunday hat, and adjusted its ribbons, and now being in the act of overhauling his bag, for the mustering shirt and trousers. All these preparations were at once suspended, the firemen were ordered below, there was a passing to and fro of engineers, and in a few minutes more the welcome black smoke came pouring out of the sumter's chimney. Bounding away over the sea, we soon began to raise the strange sail from the deck. She was a fore and aft schooner of that peculiar model and rig already described as belonging to the New Englander, and nobody else, and we felt certain, at once, that we had flushed the enemy. The little craft was close hauled, or, maybe, she had the wind a point free, which was her best point of sailing, had the whitest kind of cotton canvas, and carried very taunt gaff top sails. We found her exceedingly fast, and came up with her very slowly. The chase commenced at 9 a.m., and it was 3 p.m. Before we were near enough to heave her to with the accustomed blank cartridge. At the report of our gun, the Confederate States flag being at our peak, the little craft, which had probably been in an agony of apprehension, for some hours past, saw that her fate was sealed, and without further ado, put her helm down, lowered her for sail, hauled down her flying jib, drew her jib sheet over to windward, and was hove to the stars and stripes streaming out from her main topmast head. Upon being boarded, she proved to be the Daniel Drobridge, of New Haven, Connecticut, last from New York, and bound to Demerara, in British Guiana. This was a most opportune capture for us, for the little craft was laden with an assorted cargo of provisions, and our own provisions had been nearly exhausted. With true Yankee thrift, she had economized even the available space on her deck, and had a number of sheep, geese, and pigs, on board, for the Demerara market. Another sail being discovered, almost at the moment of this capture, we hastily threw a prize crew on board the Trowbridge, and directing her to follow us, sped off in pursuit of the newly discovered sail. It was dark before we came up with this second chase. She proved to be an English brigantine from Nova Scotia, for Demerara. We now stood back to rejoin our prize, and banking our fires, and hoisting a light at the peak, the better to enable the prize to keep sight of us, during the night, we lay to, until daylight. The next day, and the day after, were busy days, on board the Sumter, for we devoted both of them, to getting on board provisions, from the prize. The weather proved propitious, the breeze being gentle, and the sea smooth. We hoisted out the Talapooza, our launch, and employed her, and the quarter boats, the gig included, for war admits of little ceremony, in transporting barrels, bales, boxes, and every other conceivable kind of package, to the Sumter. The paymaster was in ecstasy, for, upon examination, he found the Trowbridge's cargo to be all that he could desire, the beef, pork, canvased hams, ship bread, fancy crackers, cheese, flour, everything being of the very best quality. We were, indeed, under many obligations to our Connecticut friends. To get at the cargo, we were obliged to throw overboard many articles, that we had no use for, and treated Old Ocean to a gaily painted fleet of Connecticut woodenware, buckets, foot tubs, bath tubs, wash tubs, churns. We found the sheep, pigs, and poultry in excellent condition, and sending the butcher on board each evening, we caused those innocents to be slaughtered, in sufficient numbers to supply all hands. Jack was in his glory. He had passed suddenly, from mouldy and worm-eaten bread, and the toughest and leanest of old horse, to the enjoyment of all these luxuries. My Malayan steward's eyes fairly danced, as he stowed away in the cabin lockers, sundry cans of preserved meats, lobster, milk, and fruits. John was a real artist, in his line, and knew the value of such things, and as he busied himself, arranging his luxuries, 
on the different shelves, I could hear him muttering to himself, Dem Connecticut man's, very good man's, me wish we find him often. We laid in, from the Trowbridge, full five months provisions, and getting on board, from her, besides, as much of the livestock, as we could manage to take care of, we delivered her to the flames, on the morning of the 30th of October. On the same day, we chased, and boarded the Danish brig, Una, from Copenhagen, bound to Santa Cruz. Being sixty-six days out, she had no news to communicate. We showed her the United States colors, and when she arrived, at Santa Cruz, she reported that she had fallen in with a federal cruiser. The brig Spartan, which we boarded, a few pages back, made the same report, at St. Thomas, so that the enemy's cruisers, that were in pursuit of us, had not, as yet, the least idea that we had returned to the West Indies. For the next few days, we chased and overhauled a number of ships, but they were all neutral. The enemy's West India trade seemed to have disappeared almost entirely. Many of his ships had been laid up, in alarm, in his own ports, and a number of others had found it more to their advantage, to enter the public service, as transports. The federal government had already entered upon that career of corrupt, and reckless expenditure which has resulted in the most gigantic national debt of modern times. The entire value of a ship was often paid to her owners, for a charter party, of a few months only, the quartermasters, commissaries, and other public swindlers frequently dividing the spoils, with the lucky ship owners. Many indifferent vessels were sold to the Federal Navy Department, at double, and treble their value, and agencies to purchase such ships were conferred, by the Secretary, upon relatives, and other inexperienced favorites. The corruptions of the war, soon made the war popular, with the great mass of the people. As has been remarked, in a former page, many of these Novorish men, whose love of country, and hatred of rebels boiled over, in proportion as their pockets became filled, had offered to sell themselves, and all they possessed, to the writer, when he was in the New England States, as a Confederate States agent. Powder mills, manufactories of arms and accoutrements, foundries for the casting and boring of cannon, machines for rifling cannon, all were put at his disposal, by patriotic Yankees, on the very eve of the war, for a consideration. November 2d. Morning, heavy clouds, with rain, breaking away partially, toward noon, and giving us some fitful sunshine. Sail ho! At early dawn. Got up steam, and chased, and at 7 a.m. came up with, and sent a boat on board of the English brigantine, Falcon, from Halifax, for Barbados. Banked fires. Latitude 16 degrees 32 semicolon longitude 56 degrees 55 dot warship to the northward, at Meridian. Received some newspapers, by the Falcon, from which we learn, that the enemy's cruiser Keystone State, which, when last heard from, was at Barbados, had gone to Trinidad, in pursuit of us. At Trinidad, she lost the trail, and, instead of pursuing us to Paramaribo, and Maranam, turned back to the westward. We learn from the same papers, that the enemy's steam frigate, Powhatan, Lieutenant Porter, with more sagacity, pursued us to Maranam, arriving just one week after our departure. At a subsequent date, Lieutenant, now Admiral, Porter's official report fell into my hands, and, plotting his track, I found that, on one occasion, we had been within forty miles of each other, almost near enough, on a still day, to see each other's smoke. November 3d. Weather fine, with a smooth sea, and a light breeze from the northeast. A sail being reported from the masthead, we got up steam, and chased, and upon coming near enough to make out the chase, found her to be a large steamer. We approached her, very warily, of course until it was discovered that she was English, when we altered our course, and banked fires. Our live stock still gives us fresh provisions, and the abundant supply of Irish potatoes, 
that we received on board, at the same time, is beginning to have a very beneficial effect, upon the health of the crew, some scorbutic symptoms having previously appeared. November 5 th. Weather fine, with the wind light from the eastward, and a smooth sea. At daylight, a sail was descried in the northeast, to which we immediately gave chase. Coming up with her, about 9 a.m., we sent a boat on board of her. She proved to be the English brigantine, Roths, from Berbice, on the coast of Guiana, bound for Liverpool. Whilst we had been pursuing the Roths, a second sail had been reported. We now pursue this second sail, and, coming up with her, found her to be a French brigantine, called Le Pauvre Orphelin, from Street Pierre, in France, bound for Martinique. We had scarcely turned away from the Orphelin, before a third sail was announced. This latter sail was a large ship, standing, close hauled, to the N. N. W and we chased her rather reluctantly, as she led us away from our intended course. She, too, proved to be neutral, being the plover, from Barbados, for London. The sumter being, by this time out of breath, and no more sails being reported, we let the steam go down, and gave her a little rest. We observed, today, in latitude 17 degrees 10 n, the longitude being 59 degrees 06 w. We had shown the United States colors to all these ships to preserve our incognito, as long as possible. We found them all impatient, at being hove to, and no doubt many curses escaped, sotto voce, against the D, D Yankee, as our boats shoved off, from their sides. We observed that none of them saluted the venerable old flag, which was flying at our peak, whereas, whenever we had shown the confederate flag to neutrals, down went, at once, the neutral flag, in compliment, showing the estimate, which generous seamen, the world over, put upon this ruthless war, which the strong were waging against the weak. The 6th of November passed without incident. On the 7th, we overhauled three more neutral ships, the English schooner Weymouth, from Weymouth, in Nova Scotia, for Martinique, an English bark, which we refrained from boarding, as there was no mistaking her bluff English bows, and stump top gallant masts, and a French brig, called the Fleur de Bois, last from Martinique, and bound for Bordeaux. In the afternoon of the same day, we made the islands, first of Marie Galante, and then of Guadeloupe, and the Saints. At 10 p. m., we doubled the north end of the island of Dominica, and, banking our fires, ran off some thirty or forty miles to the southwest, to throw ourselves in the track of the enemy's vessels, homeward bound from the Windward Islands. The next day, after overhauling an English brigantine, from Demerara, for Yarmouth, we got up steam, and ran for the island of Martinique approaching the town of Street Pierre near enough, by 8 p. M. to hear the evening gunfire. A number of small schooners and sail boats were plying along the coast, and as night threw her mantle over the scene, the twinkling lights of the town appeared, one by one, until there was quite an illumination, relieved by the somber background of the mountain. The Sumter, as was usual with her, when she had no work in hand, lay off, and on, under sail, all night. The next morning at daylight, we again got up steam, and drawing in with the coast, ran along down it, near enough to enjoy its beautiful scenery, with its waving palms, fields of sugar cane, and picturesque country houses, until we reached the quiet little town of Fort de France, where we anchored. Chapter 19 The Sumter at Martinique, proceeds from Fort de France to Street Pierre, is an object of much curiosity with the islanders. News of the arrest of Messrs. Mason and Slidell, on board the British mail steamer, the Trent, Mr. Seward's extraordinary course on the occasion. The Sumter having sailed from Maranham, on the 15th of September, and arrived at Martinique, on the 9th of November, had been nearly two months at sea, during all of which time, she had been actively cruising in the track of the enemy's commerce. 
she had overhauled a great many vessels, but, for reasons already explained, most of these were neutral. But the damage which she did the enemy's commerce, must not be estimated by the amount of property actually destroyed. She had caused consternation, and alarm among the enemy's shipmasters, and they were making, as we have seen, long and circuitous voyages, to avoid her. Insurance had risen to a high rate, and, for want of freights, the enemy's ships, such of them, at least, as could not purchase those lucrative contracts from the government, of which I have spoken in a former page, were beginning to be tied up, at his wharves, where they must rot, unless they could be sold, at a sacrifice, to neutrals. As a consequence, the little Sumter was denounced, without stint, by the Yankee press. She was called a pirate, and other hard names, and the most summary vengeance was denounced against her commander, and all who served under him. Venal scribblers asserted all kinds of falsehoods concerning him, and the elegant pages of journals of civilization pandered to the taste of the boys, in the workshops, by publishing malicious caricatures of him. Even the federal government denounced him, in grave state papers, Mr. Wells. The Federal Secretary of the Navy, forgetting his international law, if he ever knew any, and the courtesies, and proprieties of official speech, and taking up in his annual report, the refrain of pirate. This was all very natural, however. Men will cry aloud, when they are in pain, and, on such occasions, above all others, they will be very apt to use the language that is most natural to them, be it gentle, or ungentle. Unfortunately for the great republic, political power has descended so low, that the public officer, however high his station, must, of necessity, be little better than the boy, from whom he receives his power of attorney. When mobs rule, gentlemen must retire to private life. Accordingly, the commander of the Sumter, who had witnessed the facile dissensus of which he has spoken, was not at all surprised when he received a batch of late northern newspapers, at seeing himself called hard names, whether by the mob or officials. Knowing his late fellow citizens well, he knew that it was of no use for them to strive to expel strong nature, tis in vain. With redoubled force, she will return again. Immediately after anchoring, in Fort de France, I sent a lieutenant on shore, to call on the governor, report our arrival, and ask for the usual hospitalities of the port, comma, these hospitalities being, as the reader is aware, such as Goldsmith described as welcoming him at his inn, the more cheerfully rendered, for being paid for. I directed my lieutenant to use rather the language of demand, courteously, of course, than of petition, for I had seen the French proclamation of neutrality, and knew that I was entitled, under the orders of the emperor, to the same treatment that a federal cruiser might receive. I called, the next day, on the governor myself. I found him a very affable, and agreeable gentleman. He was a rear admiral, in the French navy, and bore the aristocratic name of Kind. Having observed a large supply of excellent coal in the government dockyard, as I pulled into the landing, I proposed to his excellency that he should supply me from that source, upon my paying cost and expenses. He declined doing this, but said that I might have free access to the market, for this and other supplies. Mentioning that I had a number of prisoners on board, he at once gave me permission to land them, provided the United States Consul, who lived at Street Pierre, the commercial metropolis of the island, would consent to become responsible for their maintenance during their stay in the island. There being no difference of opinion between the governor and myself, as to our respective rights and duties, our business matters were soon arranged, and an agreeable chat of half an hour ensued, on general topics, when I withdrew, much pleased with my visit. Returning on board the Sumter, I dispatched the paymaster to Street Pierre, there was a small passenger steam applying between the two ports, to contract for coal and some articles of clothing for the crew. Of provisions we had plenty, as the reader has seen. Lieutenant Chapman accompanied him, and I sent up, also, the masters of the two captured ships, that were on board, 
that they might see their consul and arrange for their release. The next day was Sunday, and I went on shore, with Mr. Guerin, a French gentleman, who had been educated in the United States, and who had called on board to see me, to the governor's mass. In this burning climate the church hours are early, and we found ourselves comfortably seated in our pews as early as eight o'clock. The building was spacious and well ventilated. The governor and his staff entered punctually at the hour, as did, also, a detachment of troops, the latter taking their stations, in double lines, in the main aisle. A military band gave us excellent sacred music from the choir. The whole service was concluded in three quarters of an hour. The whites and blacks occupied pews promiscuously, as at Paramaribo, though there was no social admixture of races visible. I mean to say that the pews were mixed, though the people were not, each pew was all white or all black, the mulattoes, and others of mixed blood, being counted as blacks. I returned on board for muster, which took place at the usual hour of eleven o'clock. Already the ship was full of visitors, and I was struck with the absorbed attention with which they witnessed the calling of the names of the crew, and the reading of the articles of war by the clerk. They were evidently not prepared for so interesting a spectacle. The officers were all dressed in bright and new uniforms of navy blue, we had not yet been put in grey along with the army, the gorgeous epaulets of the lieutenants flashing in the sun, and the midshipmen rejoicing in their golden broidered anchors and stars. The men attracted no less attention than the officers, with their lithe and active forms and bronzed countenances, heavy, well-kept beards and whitest of duck frocks and drowsers. One of my visitors, turning to me, after the muster was over, said, pleasantly, in allusion to the denunciations of us by the Yankee newspapers, which he had been reading, sees Hom Sunday Pirates Bian Polis, Monsieur Capit. In the afternoon, one watch of the crew was permitted to visit the shore, on liberty. To each seaman was given a sovereign, for pocket money. They waked up the echoes of the quaint old town, drank dry all the grog shops, fagged out the fiddlers, with the constant music that was demanded of them, and turned up Jack generally, coming off, the next morning, looking rather solemn and seedy, and not quite so polis as when the Frenchman had seen them the day before. The United States consul having come down from Street Pierre to receive his imprisoned countrymen, himself, I caused them all, except three of them, who had signed articles for service on board the Sumter, to be paroled and sent on shore to him. Before landing them, I caused them to be mustered on the quarter deck, and questioned them, in person, as to the treatment they had received on board, addressing myself, especially, to the two masters. They replied, without exception, that they had been well treated, and thanked me for my kindness. From the next batch of northern newspapers I captured, I learned that some of these fellows had been telling wonderful stories, about the hardships they had endured on board the pirate Sumter. It will not be very difficult for the reader, if he have any knowledge of the sailor character, to imagine how these falsehoods had been wheedled out of them. The whole country of the enemy was on the qui vive for excitement. The Yankee was more greedy for news than the old Athenian. The war had been a godsend for newspaperdom. The more extraordinary were the stories that were told by the venal and corrupt newspapers, the more greedily were they devoured by the craving and prurient multitude. The consequence was, a race between the newspaper reporters after the sensational, without the least regard to the truth. The moment a sailor landed, who had been a prisoner on board the Sumter, he was surrounded by these vampires of the press who drank him and greenbacked him until parturition was comparatively easy. The next morning, the cry of news from the pirate Sumter rang sharp and clear upon the streets, from the throats of the newsboys, and Jack found himself a hero and in print. He had actually been on board the pirate, and escaped to tell the tale. More drinks, and more greenbacks now followed from his admiring countrymen. Your old salt has a night of fun as well as drinks, and when it was noised about, among the sailors, that some cock and a bull story or other, about the Sumter, was as good as fractional for drinks, the thing ran like wildfire, 
and every sailor who landed, thereafter, from that famous craft, made his way straight to a newspaper office, in quest of a reporter, drinks, and greenbacks. Such is the stuff out of which a good deal of the Yankee histories of the late war will be made. My paymaster, and lieutenant returned, in good time, from Street Pierre, and reported that they had found an abundance of excellent coal, at reasonable rates, in the market, but that the collector of the customs had interposed, to prevent it from being sold to them. Knowing that this officer had acted without authority, I addressed a note to the governor, reminding him of the conversation we had had the day before, and asking him for the necessary order to overrule the action of his subordinate. My messenger brought back with him the following reply. Fort de France, November 12, 1861. To the captain. I have the honor to send you the enclosed letter, which I ask you to hand to the collector of customs, at Street Pierre in which I request him to permit you to embark freely, as much coal as you wish to purchase, in the market. With the expression of my highest regard for the captain. Marchandacund. I remained a few days longer, at Fort de France, for the convenience of watering ship, from the public reservoir, and to enable the rest of my crew to have their run on shore. Unless Jack has his periodical frolic, he is very apt to become moody and discontented, and my sailors had now been cooped up, in their ship, a couple of months. This giving of liberty to them is a little troublesome, to be sure, as some of them will come off drunk, and noisy, and others, overstaying their time, have to be hunted up, in the grog shops, and other sailor haunts, and brought off by force. My men behaved tolerably well, on the present occasion. No complaint came to me from the shore, though a good many bills, for night's lodgings, and drinks, followed them on board. Poor Jack! How strong upon him is the thirst for drink! We had an illustration of this, whilst we were lying at Fort de France. It was about 9 p.m., and I was below in my cabin, making preparations to retire. Presently, I heard a plunge into the water, a hail and almost simultaneously, a shot fired from one of the sentinel's rifles. The boatswain's mate's whistle now sounded, as a boat was called away, and a rapid shuffling of feet was heard overhead, as the boat was being lowered. Upon reaching the deck, I found that one of the firemen, who had come off from liberty, a little tight, had jumped overboard, and, in defiance of the hail, and shot of the sentinel, struck out, lustily, for the shore. The moon was shining brightly, and an amusing scene now occurred. The boat was in hot pursuit, and soon came upon the swimmer, but the latter, who dived like a duck, had no notion of being taken. As the boat would come up with him, and back all, for the purpose of picking him up, he would dive under her bottom, and presently would be seen, either a beam, or a stern, striking out, like a good fellow, again. By the time the boat could turn, and get headway once more, the swimmer would have some yards the start of her, and when she again came up with him, the same tactics would follow. The crew, hearing what was going on, had all turned out of their hammocks, and come on deck to witness the fun, and fun it really was for some minutes, as the doubling, and diving, and twisting, and turning went on, the boat now being sure she had him, and now sure she hadn't. The fellow finally escaped, and probably a more chop-fallen boat's crew never returned alongside of the ship, than was the Sumters that night. An officer was now sent on shore in pursuit of the fugitive. He had no difficulty in finding him. In half an hour after the performance of his clever feat, the fireman was lying, dead drunk, in one of the cabarets, in the sailor quarter of the town. He had had no intention of deserting, but had braved the sentinel's bullet, the shark, which abounds in these waters, and discipline, all for the sake of a glass of grog. Our time was made remarkably pleasant, during our stay, the inhabitants showing us every mark of respect and politeness, and the officers of the garrison, and of a couple of small French vessels of war, in the port, extending to us the courtesies of their clubs, and mess rooms. I declined all invitations myself, 
but my officers frequently dined on shore, and on the evening before our departure, they returned the hospitalities of their friends, by an elegant supper in the wardroom, at which the festivities were kept up to a late hour. Riding, and breakfast parties, in the country, were frequent, and bright eyes, peeping out of pretty French bonnets, shone benignantly upon my young pirates. The war was frequently the topic of conversation, when such expressions as lay barbares do nord, would escape, not unmusically, from the prettiest of pouting lips. I passed several agreeable evenings, at the hospitable mansion of my friend, Mr. Gurin, the ladies of whose family were accomplished musicians. The sailor is, above all others of his sex, susceptible of female influences. The difference arises, naturally, out of his mode of life, which removes him so often, and so long, from the affections, and refinements of home. After roughing it, for months, upon the deep, in contact only with coarse male creatures, how delightful I found it to sink into a luxurious seat, by the side of a pretty woman, and listen to the sweet notes of her guitar, accompanied by the sweeter notes, still, of her voice, as she warbled, rather than sang some lay of the sea. In these delightful tropical climates, night is turned into day. The sun, beating down his fierce rays upon heated walls and streets, drives all but the busy merchant and the laborer indoors during the day. Windows are raised, blinds closed and all the members of the household, not compelled to exertion, betake themselves to their fort wills and luxurious hammocks. Dinner is partaken of at five or six o'clock, in the afternoon. When the sun goes down, and the shades of evening begin to fall, and the first gentle stirring of the trees and shrubbery, by the land breeze begins to awaken the katydid, and the myriads of other insects, which have been dozing in the heat, the human world is also awakened. The lazy beauty now rises from her couch and seeking her bathroom, and tire woman, begins to prepare for the duties of the day. She is quaffed, and arranged for conquest, and sallies forth to the placed arm, to listen to the music of the military bands, if there be no other special entertainment on hand. The placed arm of Fort de France is charmingly situated, on the very margin of the bay, where, in the intervals of the music, or of the hum of conversation, the ripple of the tide beats time, as it breaks upon the smooth, pebbly beach. Ships are anchored in front, and far away to the left, rises a range of blue, and misty hills, which are pointed out to the stranger, as the birthplace of the Empress Josephine. The statue of the Empress also adorns the grounds, and the inhabitants are fond of referring to her history. I was quite surprised at the throng that the quiet little town of Fort de France was capable of turning out, upon the placed arm, and even more at the quality, than the quantity of the throng. What with military and naval officers, in their gay uniforms, the multitudes of well-dressed men and women, the ecclesiastics in the habits of their several orders, the flower girls, the vendors of fruits, sherbets, and ice creams, for the universal Yankee has invaded the colony with his ice ships, and the delightful music of the bands, it would be difficult to find a more delightful place, in which to while away an hour. Whilst we were still at Fort de France, a rather startling piece of intelligence reached us. A vessel came in, from St. Thomas, and brought the news, that the English mail steamer, Trent, had arrived there from Havana, and reported that Messrs. Mason and Slidell had been forcibly taken out of her, by the United States steamer, San Jacinto, Captain Wilkes. A few days afterward, I received a French newspaper, giving a detailed account of the affair. It was indeed a very extraordinary proceeding, and could not fail to attract much attention. I had known friend Wilkes, in former years, and gave him credit for more sagacity, than this act of his seemed to indicate. A little learning is a dangerous thing, and the federal captain had read, it would seem, just enough of international law to get himself into trouble, instead of keeping himself out of it. He had read of contraband persons, and of enemies' dispatches, and how it was prohibited to neutrals, to carry either, 
but he had failed to take notice of a very important distinction, to wit, that the neutral vessel, on the present occasion, was bound from one neutral port to another, and that, as between neutral ports, there is no such thing as contraband of war, for the simple reason that contraband of war is a person, or thing, going to, or from an enemy's country. I was glad to hear this news, of course. The great republic would have to stand up to its work, and Great Britain would be no less bound to demand a retraxit. If things came to a deadlock, we might have an ally, in the war, sooner than we expected. It would be a curious revolution of the wheel of fortune I thought, to have John Bull helping us to beat the Yankee, on a point, to wit, the right of self-government, on which we had helped the Yankee to beat Bull, less than a century before. I will ask the reader's permission, to dispose of this little quarrel between Bull and the Yankee, to avoid the necessity of again recurring to it, although at the expense of a slight anachronism. When the news of Wilkes' exploit reached the United States, the boys went into ecstasies. Such a shouting, and throwing up of caps had never been heard of before. The multitude, who were, of course, incapable of reasoning upon the act, only knew that England had been bearded and insulted, but that was enough. Their national antipathies, and their ridiculous self-conceit had both been pandered to. The newspapers were filled with laudatory editorials, and plate, and resolutions, were showered upon unfortunate friend Wilkes, without mercy. If he had been an American Nelson, returning from an American Nile, or Trafalgar, he could not have been received with more honor. State legislatures bowed down before him, and even the American Congress, the House of Representatives, the Senate had not quite lost its wits gave him a vote of thanks. It was not, perhaps, so much to be wondered at, that the multitude should go mad, with joy, for multitudes, everywhere, are composed of unreasoning animals, but men, who should have known better, permitted themselves to be carried away by the popular hallucination. The executive government approved of Captain Wilkes' conduct, the Secretary of the Navy, whose insane hatred of England was quite remarkable making haste to write the captain a congratulatory letter. But an awful collapse was at hand. Mr. Seward, as though he already heard the ominous rumbling of the distant English thunder, which was, anon, to break over his head, in tones that would startle him, on the 30th of November, the outrage had been committed on the 7th comma wrote, as follows, to his faithful sentinel, at the court of London, Mr. Charles Francis Adams. We have done nothing, on the subject, to anticipate the discussion, and we have not furnished you with any explanation. We adhere to that course now, because we think it more prudent, that the ground taken by the British government should be first made known to us, here. It is proper, however, that you should know one fact, in the case, without indicating that we attach much importance to it, namely, that in the capture of Messrs. Mason and Slidell, on board a British vessel, Captain Wilkes having acted without any instructions from the government, the subject is therefore free from the embarrassment, which might have resulted, if the act had been especially directed by us. If no explanation had been thought of by Mr. Seward, up to this time, it was high time that he was getting one ready, for, on the same day, on which the above dispatch was written, Lord John Russell, then charged with the duties of the Foreign Office, in England, under the administration of Lord Palmerston, wrote as follows, to Lord Leon, his minister at Washington. Her Majesty's Government, bearing in mind the friendly relations which have long subsisted between Great Britain, and the United States, are willing to believe, that the United States naval officer who committed the aggression, was not acting in compliance with any authority from his government, or that, if he conceived himself to be so authorized, he greatly misunderstood the instructions, which he had received. For the government of the United States must be fully aware, that the British government could not allow such an affront to the national honor, to pass without full reparation, and Her Majesty's government are unwilling to believe that it could be the deliberate intention of the government of the United States, unnecessarily to force into discussion, between the two governments, 
a question of so grave a character, and with regard to which, the whole British nation would be sure to entertain such unanimity of feeling. Her Majesty's government, therefore, trust that, when this matter shall have been brought under the consideration of the government of the United States, that government will, of its own accord, offer to the British government such redress as alone, could satisfy the British nation, namely, the liberation, of the four gentlemen, the two secretaries of legation were also captured, and their delivery to your lordship, in order that they may again be placed under British protection, and a suitable apology for the aggression, which has been committed. Should these terms not be offered, by Mr. Seward, you will propose them to him. Mr. Seward had no notion of proposing any terms to Lord Leon. The shouts of the boys had scarcely yet ceased to ring in his ears, and it would be an awkward step to take. Besides, he could have no terms to offer, for the government had, in fact, approved of Captain Wilkes' act, through its Secretary of the Navy. The back door, which Mr. Seward intimated to Mr. Adams was open for a treat, when he told him, that Captain Wilkes' act had not been authorized by the government, was not honorably open, for the act had afterward been approved by the government, and this amounted to the same thing. Later on the same day on which Earl Russell wrote his dispatch to Lord Leon he added a postscript to it, as follows. In my previous dispatch of this date, I have instructed you, by command of Her Majesty, to make certain demands of the government of the United States. Should Mr. Seward ask for delay, in order that this grave and painful matter should be deliberately considered, you will consent to a delay, not exceeding seven days. If, at the end of that time, no answer is given, or if any other answer is given, except that of a compliance with the demands of Her Majesty's government, your lordship is instructed to leave Washington, with all the members of your legation, bringing with you the archives of the legation and to repair immediately to London. If, however, you should be of opinion that the requirements of Her Majesty's government are substantially complied with, you may report the facts to Her Majesty's government, for their consideration, and remain at your post, until you receive further orders. This was indeed bringing matters to a focus. Mr. Seward was required to liberate the prisoners, and make an apology, and that within seven days. This was putting it rather offensively. It is bad enough to make a man apologize, especially, if he has been blowing a short while before. But to tell him that he must do it at once, that was, indeed, rubbing the humiliation in. And then, where was the Congress, and the Massachusetts legislature, and Mr. Secretary Wells, and all the plate, and all the resolutions? Posterity will wonder, when it comes to read the elaborate, and lengthy dispatch, which Mr. Seward prepared on this occasion, how it was possible for him to prepare it in seven days. But it will wonder still more, after having patiently waded through it, to find how little it contains. I cannot deny myself the pleasure of giving a few of its choicest paragraphs to the reader. Do not start. Gentle reader, the paragraphs will be short, but short as they are, you shall have the gist of this seven days' labor of the American diplomatist. David wrote seven penitential psalms. I wonder if Lord John Russell had a little fun in his eye, when he gave Mr. Seward just seven days for his penitential performance. But to the paragraphs. Mr. Seward is addressing himself, the reader will observe, to Lord Leon. After stating the case, he proceeds. Your Lordship will now perceive, that the case before us, instead of presenting a merely flagrant act of violence, on the part of Captain Wilkes, as might well be inferred, from the incomplete statement of it, that went up to the British government, was undertaken as a simple, legal, and customary belligerent proceeding, by Captain Wilkes, to arrest and capture a neutral vessel, engaged in carrying contraband of war, for the uses and benefit of the insurgents. This point was so utterly untenable that it is astonishing that Mr. Seward should have thought of defending it. If it were defensible, he ought not to have given up the prisoners, or made an apology, for the law is clear, that contraband of war may be seized, and taken out of a neutral vessel, on the high seas. 
It was not because contraband of war had been taken out of one of their vessels, that Great Britain demanded an apology, but because persons, and things, not contraband of war, under the circumstances under which they were found, had been taken out. If the Trent had been overhauled in the act of sailing from one of the Confederate ports, blockaded or not blockaded, with Messrs. Mason and Slidell, and their dispatches on board, and the San Jacinto had taken them out of her, permitting the ship to proceed on her voyage, Great Britain would never have thought of complaining, waiving, for the sake of the present argument, the diplomatic character of the passengers. And why would she not have complained? Simply, because one of her ships had been found with contraband of war, on board, and the least penalty, namely, the seizure of the contraband, that the laws of war imposed upon her, had been exacted. But her ship the Trent, neither having sailed from, or being bound for a confederate port, it matters not whom, or what she might have on board, the question of contraband could not arise, at all, for, as we have seen, it is of the essence of contraband, that the person, or thing should be going to, or from an enemy's port. Wilkes Act being utterly and entirely indefensible, the federal government should have saved its honor, the moment the affair came to its notice, by a frank disavowal of it. But, as we have seen, the boys had shouted, Mr. Wells had spoken approvingly, Congress had resolved that their officer was deserving of thanks, and even Mr. Seward, himself, had gloried over the capture of rebels, and traitors, the said rebels, and traitors having frequently, in former years, snubbed, and humbled him in the Senate of the United States. Hence the indecent language, in which he now spoke of them. The reader, having seen that Mr. Seward justified Captain Wilkes' conduct, as a simple, legal, and customary belligerent proceeding, to arrest and capture a neutral vessel engaged in carrying contraband of war, for the use and benefit of the insurgents, he will be curious to know on what ground it was, that Mr. Seward based his apology. This ground was curious enough. It was, not that Captain Wilkes had gone too far, but that he had not gone far enough. If, said he, Captain Wilkes had taken the Trent into port, for adjudication, instead of letting her go, his justification would be complete, and there would be no apology to make. Adjudication presupposes something to adjudicate, but if there was no contraband of war, on board the Trent, what was that to adjudicate? The British government did not complain, that the question had not been presented for adjudication to the proper prized tribunals, but that their vessel had been boarded, and outraged, without there being any grounds for adjudication, at all. If the Trent had been taken into port, a prize court must have liberated the prisoners. It would then, if not before, have been apparent that there was no ground for the seizure. The act still remaining to be atoned for, what was there to be gained, by sending the vessel in? It is not denied that, as a rule, neutrals are entitled to have their vessels, when captured, sent in for adjudication, but Mr. Seward knew, very well, that no question of this nature had arisen, between the British government and himself, and he was only trifling with the common sense of mankind when he endeavoured to turn the issue in this direction. One cannot help sympathising with a diplomatist, who being required to eat a certain amount of dirt, gags at it, so painfully, and yet pretends, all the while, that he really likes it, as Mr. Seward does in the following paragraph. I have not been unaware that, in examining this question, I have fallen into an argument, for what seems to be the British side of it, against my own country, what a deal of humiliation it would have saved his country, if he had fallen into this train of argument, before the dirt pie had been presented to him. But I am relieved from all embarrassment, on that subject. I had hardly fallen into that line of argument, when I discovered, that I was really defending and maintaining, not an exclusively British interest, but an old, honoured, and cherished American cause, not upon British authorities but upon principles that constitute a large portion of the distinctive policy, by which the United States have developed the resources of a continent, and thus becoming a considerable maritime power, have won the respect and confidence of many nations.
like an adroit circus man, the venerable Federal Secretary of State has now gotten upon the backs of two ponies. He continues. These principles were laid down, for us, by James Madison, in 1804, when Secretary of State, in the administration of Thomas Jefferson, in instructions given to James Monroe, our minister to England. These instructions had relation to the old dispute, between the two governments, about the impressment of seamen from American ships, and were as follows. Whenever property found in a neutral vessel is supposed to be liable, on any ground, to capture and condemnation, the rule in all cases, is, that the question shall not be decided by the captor, but be carried before a legal tribunal, where a regular trial may be had, and where the captor himself is liable for damages, for an abuse of his power. Can it be reasonable then, or just, that a belligerent commander, who is thus restricted, and thus responsible, in a case of mere property, of trivial amount, should be permitted, without recurring to any tribunal, whatever, to examine the crew of a neutral vessel, to decide the important question of their respective allegiances, and to carry that decision into execution, by forcing every individual, he may choose, into a service abhorrent to his feelings, cutting him off from his most tender connections, exposing his mind and person to the most humiliating discipline, and his life, itself, to the greatest danger. Reason, justice, and humanity unite in protesting against so extravagant a proceeding. Mr. Seward after thus quoting, continues. If I decide this case in favor of my own government, I must disavow its most cherished principles, and reverse, and forever abandon its essential policy. The country cannot afford the sacrifice. If I maintain these principles, and adhere to that policy, I must surrender the case itself. It will be seen, therefore, that this government could not deny the justice of the claim presented to us, in this respect, upon its merits. We are asked to do to the British nation, just what we have always insisted, all nations ought to do to us. That is coming down with the corn, now, handsomely, but in view of the antecedents of the question, and of the seven days pressure under which Mr. Seward's dispatch was written, one cannot help pitying Mr. Seward. We not only pity him, but he absolutely surprises us by the fertility of his imagination, in discovering any resemblance between the Madison precedent, and the case he had in hand. The British government was not insisting that Mr. Seward should send the Trent in for adjudication. It did not mean that there should be any adjudication about the matter, except such as it had itself already passed upon the case. Had it not said to its minister, at Washington, if, at the end of that time, no answer is given, or, if any other answer is given, except that of a compliance with the demands of Her Majesty's government, your lordship is instructed to leave Washington, and see? To be logical, Mr. Seward should have said, our officer having made a mistake, by doing a right thing, in a wrong way, namely, by seizing contraband of war, on board a neutral ship, without sending the ship in, for adjudication, we will send the prisoners back to the Trent, if you will send the Trent into one of our ports for adjudication. But Mr. Seward knew better than to say any such thing, for the simple reason, that this was not the thing which was demanded of him, although he had written a lengthy dispatch to prove that it was. I was in Europe when Mr. Seward's dispatch arrived there. Everyone was astonished, both at the paper, and the act of humiliation performed by it. The act needed not to be humiliating. A great wrong had been done a neutral. It could be neither justified, nor palliated. A statesman, at the head of the Federal State Department, would have made haste to atone for it, before any demand for reparation could be made. To pander to a vitiated public taste, and gain a little temporary éclat, by appearing to beard the British lion, hoping that the lion would submit, in silence to the indignity, Mr. Seward committed one of those blunders which was equivalent to a great crime, since it humiliated an entire people, and put on record against them one of those damaging pages that historians cannot, if they would, forget. The following were the closing lines of this famous dispatch. 
the four persons in question are now held in military custody, at Fort Warren, in the state of Massachusetts. They will be cheerfully liberated. Your Lordship will please indicate a time, and place, for receiving them. When I read this paragraph, I experienced two sensations, one, of disappointment at the loss of an ally, with whose aid we would be sure to gain the independence for which we were struggling, and one, of mortification, that an American nation had been so greatly humbled, before an European power, for though the federal states were my enemies, as between them and foreign nations, I could not but feel something like family attachment. Whilst I would humble them, and whip them into a sense of justice and decent behavior, myself, I was loath to see strangers kick them, and themselves submit to the kicking. So very one-sided was the question, which Mr. Seward had permitted himself to argue, with so much zeal, and so little discrimination, that all the principal nations of Europe rallied, as if by common consent, to the side of Great Britain. Russia, France, Spain, and other powers, all took the same view of the case that Earl Russell had done, and made haste, through their respective ministers at Washington, so to express themselves. I will let France speak for them all. The reasons which influenced the action of the French government are thus assigned. The desire to contribute to prevent a conflict, perhaps imminent, between two powers, for which the French government is animated with sentiments equally friendly, and the duty to uphold, for the purpose of placing the right of its own flag under shelter from any attack, certain principles essential to the security of neutrals, have, after mature reflection, convinced it, that it could not, under the circumstances, remain entirely silent. The French Minister for Foreign Affairs then goes on to examine the arguments which could be set up in defense of the federal captain, concluding as follows. There remains, therefore, to invoke, in explanation of their capture, only the pretext that they were the bearers of official dispatches from the enemy, but this is the moment to recall a circumstance, that governs all this affair, and which renders the conduct of the American cruiser unjustifiable. The Trent was not destined to a point belonging to one of the belligerents. She was carrying to a neutral country her cargo and her passengers, and moreover, it was in a neutral port that they were taken. The cabinet at Washington could not, without striking a blow at principles, which all neutral nations are alike interested in holding in respect, nor without taking the attitude of contradiction to its own course, up to this time, give its approbation to the proceedings of the commander of the San Jacinto. In this state of things, it evidently should not, according to our views, hesitate about the determination to be taken. The excuse which I have to offer to the reader, for permitting so much of my space to be occupied with this affair, is, that it deeply interested every Confederate States naval officer, afloat at the time. I, myself, made several passages, in neutral vessels, between neutral ports, and might have been captured with as much propriety, even when passing from Dover to Calais, as Messrs. Mason and Slidell had been. On the 13th of November, my water tanks being full, and my crew having all returned from a liberty none of them having shown any disposition to desert, we got up steam, and proceeded to the town of Street Pierre, for the purpose of coaling, arriving at the early hour of 8 a.m., and anchoring at the Man of War Anchorage, south of the town. I immediately dispatched a lieutenant to call on the military commandant, accompanied by the paymaster, to make the necessary arrangements for coaling. Street Pierre was quite a different place, from the quiet old town we had left. A number of merchant ships were anchored in the harbor, and there was quite an air of stir, and thrift, about the quays. Busy commerce was carrying on her exchanges, and with commerce there is always life. There were not so many idle people here, to be awakened from their noontide slumbers, by the catedid, as in Fort de France. A number of visitors came off, at once, to see us, rumor having preceded us, and blown the trumpet of our fame, much more than we deserved. Among the rest, there were several custom-house officers, 
but if these had any office of espionage to perform, they performed it, so delicately, as not to give offence. Indeed they took pains to explain to us, that they had only come on board out of civility, and as a mere matter of curiosity. I never permit myself to be outdone in politeness, and treated them with all consideration. The collector of the customs gave prompt obedience to the governor's dispatch, commanding him not to throw any obstacle in the way of our coaling, by withdrawing the interdict of sale which he had put upon the coal merchants, and the paymaster returning, after a short absence, with news that he had made satisfactory arrangements with the said merchants, the ship was warped up to the coal depot, and some thirty tons of coal received, on board, the same afternoon. This was very satisfactory progress. We sent down the foreyard, for repairs, and the engineer finding some good machinists on shore, with more facilities in the way of shop, and tools, than he had expected, took some of his own jobs, of which there are always more or less, in a steamer, on shore. As the sun dipped his broad red disc into the sea, I landed with my clerk, and we took a delightful evening stroll, along one of the country roads, leading to the northern end of the island, and winding, occasionally, within a stone's throw of the beach. The air was soft, and filled with perfume, and we were much interested in inspecting the low-roofed and red-tiled country houses, and their half-naked inmates, of all colours, that presented themselves, from time to time, as we strolled on. We were here, as we had been in Maranam, objects of much curiosity, and the curiosity was evinced in the same way, respectfully. Wherever we stopped for water, for walking in this sultry climate produces constant thirst, the coolest monkeys a sort of porous jug, or jar, and calabashes, were handed us often accompanied by fruits and an invitation to be seated. Fields of sugar cane stretched away on either hand, and an elaborate cultivation seemed everywhere to prevail. The island of Martinique is mountainous, and all mountainous countries are beautiful, where vegetation abounds. Within the tropics, when the soil is good, vegetation runs riot in very wantonness, and so it did here. The eye was constantly charmed with a great variety of shade and forest trees, of new and beautiful foliage, and with shrubs, and flowers, without number, ever forming new combinations, and new groups, as the road meandered now through a plain, and now through a rocky ravine, up whose precipitous sides a goat could scarcely clamber. As the shades of eve came slowly down, the hills were clothed with deeper brown, and the twinkle of the lantern at the Sumter's peak denoting that her captain was out of the ship, caught my eye, at one of the turnings of the road, and reminded me, that we had wandered far enough. We retraced our steps just in time to escape a shower, and sat down, upon our arrival on board, to the evening's repast, which John had prepared for us, with appetites much invigorated by the exercise. We found the marketplace, situated near the ship both upon landing and returning, filled with a curious throng, gazing eagerly upon the sumter. This throng seemed never to abate during our stay, it was the first thing seen in the morning, and the last thing at night. The next morning, John brought me off a French newspaper, for Street Pierre is sufficiently large, and prosperous, to indulge in a tri-weekly. With Drew Island Marvel, a column was devoted to the sumter, predicating of her many curious exploits, and cunning devices by means of which she had escaped from the enemy, of which the little craft had never heard, and affirming, as a fact beyond dispute, that her commander was a Frenchman, he having served, in former years, as a lieutenant on board of the French brig of war Mercure. I felt duly grateful for the compliment, for a compliment indeed it was, to be claimed as a Frenchman, by a Frenchman the little foible of Gallic vanity considered. Chapter 20 Arrival at Street Pierre of the Enemy's Steam Sloop Iroquois, How S.H.E. Violates the Neutrality of the Port, Arrival of the French Steamer of War A. Caron, The Iroquois Blockades the Sumter, Correspondence with the Governor, Escape of the Sumter. Many rumors were now afloat as to the prospective presence, at Martinique, 
of the enemy's ships of war. It was known that the enemy's steam sloop, Iroquois, Captain James S. Palmer, had been at the island of Trinidad, on the second of the then current month of November, whence she had returned to St. Thomas, this neutral island being unscrupulously used by the enemy, as a regular naval station, at which there was always at anchor one or more of his ships of war, and where he had a coal depot. St. Thomas was a free port, and an important centre of trade, both for the West India Islands and the Spanish Main, and had the advantage, besides, of being a general rendezvous of the mail steamers that plied in those seas. One of these steamers, bound to St. Thomas, had touched at Martinique, soon after the Sumter's arrival there, and, as a matter of course, we might expect the presence of the enemy very soon. I used every possible diligence to avoid being blockaded by the enemy, and twenty-four hours more would have enabled me to accomplish my purpose. But the fates would have it otherwise, for at about 2 p.m., on the very next day after the delightful evening's stroll described in the last chapter, the Iroquois appeared off the north end of the island. She had purposely approached the island on the side opposite to that on which the town of Street Pierre lies, the better to keep herself out of sight, until the last moment, and when she did come in sight, it was ludicrous to witness her appearance. Her commander's idea seemingly was, that the moment the Sumter caught sight of him, she would, if he were recognized, immediately attempt to escape. Hence it was necessary to surprise her, and to this end, he had made some most ludicrous attempts to disguise his ship. The Danish colors were flying from his peak, his yards were hanging, some this way, some that, and his guns had all been run in, and his ports closed. But the finely proportioned, taunt, saucy looking Iroquois, looked no more like a merchant ship, for this disguise, than a Galath Ario would look like a saint, by donning a cassock. The very disguise only made the cheat more apparent. We caught sight of the enemy first. He was crawling slowly from behind the land, which had hidden him from view, and we could see a number of curious human forms, above his rail, bending eagerly in our direction. The quarter deck, in particular, was filled with officers, and we were near enough to see that some of these had telescopes in their hands, with which they were scanning the shipping in the harbor. We had a small Confederate States flag flying, and it was amusing to witness the movements on board the Iroquois. The moment this was discovered, a rapid passing to and fro of officers was observable, as if orders were being carried, in a great hurry, and the steamer, which had been hitherto cautiously creeping along, as a stealthy tiger might be supposed to skirt a jungle, in which he had scented, but not yet seen a human victim, sprang forward under a full head of steam. At the same moment, down came the Danish and up went the United States flag. The she comes, with a bone in her mouth, said the old quartermaster on the lookout, and, no doubt, Captain Palmer thought to see, every moment, the little Sumter flying from her anchors. But the Sumter went on coaling, and receiving on board some rum and sugar, as though no enemy were in sight, and at 9 p.m. was ready for sea. The men were given their hammocks, as usual, and I turned in, myself, at my usual hour, not dreaming that the Iroquois would cut up such antics during the night as she did. During the afternoon, she had run into the harbor comma without anchoring, however comma and sent a boat on shore to communicate, probably, with her consul, and receive any intelligence he might have to communicate. She then steamed off, seaward, a mile, or two, and moved to and fro, in front of the port until dark. At half past one o'clock, the officer of the deck came down in great haste, to say, that the Iroquois had again entered the harbor, and was steaming directly for us. I ordered him to get the men immediately to their quarters, and followed him on deck, as soon as I could throw on a necessary garment or two. In a very few minutes, the battery had been cast loose, the decks lighted, and the other preparations usual for battle made. It was moonlight, and the movements of the enemy could be distinctly seen. He came along, under low steam, but, so steadily, and aiming so directly for us, 
that I could not doubt it was his intention to board us. The men were called to repel boarders, and for a moment or two, a pin might have been heard to drop, on the Sumter's deck, so silent was the harbor, and so still was the scene on board both ships. Presently, however, a couple of strokes on the enemy's steam gong were heard, and, in a moment more, he sheared a little, and lay off our quarter, motionless. It was as though a great sea monster had crawled in under cover of the night, and was eating its prey, and licking its chops, in anticipation of a delicious repast. After a few minutes of apparent hesitation, and doubt, the gong was again struck, and the leviathan, for such the Iroquois appeared alongside the little Sumter, moving in a slow, and graceful curve, turned, and went back whence it came. This operation, much to my astonishment, was repeated several times during the night. Captain Palmer was evidently in great tribulation. He had found the hated pirate at last, so called by his own Secretary of the Navy, and by his own Secretary of State. Captain Wilkes had just set him a glorious example of a disregard of neutral rights, and the seven days penitential sums had not yet been ordered to be written. If a ship might be violated, why not territory? Besides, the press, the press. A rabid, and infuriate press was thundering in the ears of the luckless federal captain. Honors were before him, terrors behind him. But the loomed up, high above the Sumter, the mountains of the French island of Martinique. Nations, like individuals, sometimes know whom to kick, though they have occasionally to take the kicking back, as we have just seen. It might do. Doubtless, thought Captain Palmer, to kick some small power, but France. There was the rub. If the Sumter were only in Bahia, where the Florida afterward was, how easily and securely the kicking might be done. A gallant captain, with a heavy ship, might run into her, cut her down to the water's edge, fire into her crew, struggling in the water, killing, and wounding, and drowning a great many of them, and bear off his prize in triumph. And then, Mr. Seward, if he should be called upon, not by Brazil alone, but by the sentiment of all mankind, to make restitution of the ship, could he not have her run into, by accident, in Hampton Roads, and sunk, and would not this be another feather in his diplomatic cap, Yankee feather though it might be? What is a diplomat fit for, unless he can be a little cunning, upon occasion? The boys will shout for him, if history does not. The reader need no longer wonder at the backing and filling of the Iroquois, around the little Sumter, or at the sleepless night passed by Captain Palmer. The next morning, the governor having heard of what had been done, how the neutral waters of France had been violated by maneuver and by menace, though the actual attack had been withheld, sent up from Fort de France the steamer of war Caron, Captain Duchatel, with orders to Captain Palmer, either to anchor, if he desired to enter the harbor, or to withdraw beyond the Marine League, if it was his object to blockade the Sumter, annexing to his anchoring, if he should choose this alternative, the condition imposed by the laws of nations, of giving the Sumter twenty-four hours the start, in case she should desire to proceed to sea. Soon after the Acheron came to anchor, the Iroquois herself ran in and anchored, the French boat then communicated with her, when she immediately hove up her anchor again, 